for an insane one here. Marine Lord versus Puppy Paul. You heard that stat I gave on the entrance. Puppy Paul has never beat Marine Lord in competitive play. Can we change that today? Is this a new breed of Puppy Paul? It's kind of scary when you think about it, but at the end of the day, there's not many people who can say they've beaten Marine Lord in competitive play. Like Louis, Louis has only just beaten him in this event, but mm. it's still going to be a, it's going to be tough, right? Like I guess when you think about you know back to N4C, the very first big event there was after Genesis, no one had beaten Marine Lord. I guess at that stage, uh, anyway, the, the point was uh, there was a, a young Korean man by the name of Lee Nock who rose up to the occasion. Will Puppy Paul be the one that rises up today? We'd hope so, right, Lytical? I mean, Puppy Paul, I, I said it at the start of the day, I think it would be fair to say, and he'd agree, this is his best showing uh, we've seen in a very long time. And, you know, here's a kind of little cheeky thought for you. Marine Lord, the reigning champion on LAN, right? Red Bull Wallalo. Uh, he only lost to a single person that event, Magic. Magic's been screaming with Puppy Paul, and from what I've been hearing through the vines, Puppy Paul has been absolutely slaying his fellow Canadian. It's a tricky matchup, right? You look at all these metrics, um, you look at the numbers, and then you're trying to draw conclusions, only to realize that sometimes life works differently from the numbers, and this could very well be the case over here. If you just look at those previous statistics, no one in this world would say that Marine Lord can be taken out by Puppy Paw. At the same time, we go back to the semifinals yesterday, Puppy Paw versus Beastie. You ask people in the chat, people across the AOA4 scene, Nine out of ten people will probably say, oh yeah, that's a beastie set. Puppy Paw comes in guns blazing, takes out beastie four to one. So it's definitely an uphill battle for him going into the set. But as you kind of touched on it, he has played his best AoE so far. We've seen signs of uh, drastic improvement even going back to the end of last year into the EGC finals. Um, but really... He became a lot more complete of a player heading into Elite Classic 2. This is going to be his big test, whether he can really rise up to the occasion, though. And this draft is already getting spicy, Drongo. We see the Chinese bands at different stages on each side. Byzantines get let through again. They've been having a rough time, actually, since the update in the playoffs. Iobids will not be seen. That's probably a sensible choice. Marine Lord is, I believe it's seven or eight wins with Iobids. No losses whatsoever. But it does mean the Roos has also snuck through. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, the decision-making process that's gone in. like the, the way that Puppy Paul has gone ahead and grabbed the Byzantines before even the Chinese, which has been pretty much a permaban like these, these, last, couple of, uh, these last couple of days. Uh, so it takes the Byzantines, makes sure that uh, it's going to be okay. And we also see double HRE bans coming out on both sides, which is a little bit wild considering most people weren't calling them the, uh, the sharpest tools in the shed uh, recently. But um, that, that excites me greatly. That we get to see some Byzantines out from Puppy Paw. He's been very exciting on them. Uh, and uh, I'm confident he'll do well today. But the Rus saddens me. You know, I, I never liked the Rus. <laughs> yeah, it feels like this is still the number one dominant sieve. But to that HRE point, Lytical, on the rise, you mentioned, you know, not sharpest tools in the sheds, but they've got some brand new sandals. Marching drills, buff, even in Dark Age, seems to be a very powerful tool. Um, Especially with some of the maps in rotation. One surprising thing, we don't see um, Golden Heights here. That got completely blocked out, right? But we have got Holy Island. Maybe maybe HRE was a threat there. But then again, I think at this point, we have to be wondering what's Poppy Paw's solution going to be for that map. We've been seeing a lot of Zhuji at the moment, and Marine Lord already has the Japanese as a safety net for Holy Island. I think one key thing to look at here is that, as you will see, players will go all the way up to six civilization selections, but this is the best of nine folks. So as much as we see these civilizations come out and we're kind of theory crafting about what Civ gets picked where, we shouldn't forget the fact that a lot comes down to the order at which these maps are being played. So um, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we might not even see the civilization solution for a specific map. And I think that's particularly applicable um, for your own home maps. Because every time you lose, you get to pick um, home maps. You can either pick the opponent's home map or you can pick your own. but when it comes to being able to drop a game plan for this, the thing that you can expect is, if I lose a game, I get to pick a map. What is the order at which I want to play my home maps? Because that's going to have a significant influence on how I pick my civilizations. It's a very interesting point that Lytical is making there, right, Drongo? But there's a flip side to it, where, for example, if you don't prep for a robust draft, and you grab a game against your opponent, like Marine Lord in this situation, 
if he loses the game to Puppy Paw and he looks at his draft and says, oh, you've got nothing for Holy Island, mm -hmm. that's now a strategic advice from Marine Lord. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that you've got to be very careful with. So I, I suspect that early on in this first draft, they're probably going to be very, very safe. Whereas for the second draft, where there's going to be a lot more limited maps, you're going to see more maybe risky civilizations that could be picked up there. Uh, but uh, interesting things to see, though. Juicy Legacy going to be picked up here for Marine Lord. Uh, no Order of the Dragon coming through. So unfortunately going to be sitting out today. Who's the last civilization that we don't see picked up? Because the French did get picked up last um there's one civilization that's missing but i'll be honest i can't um right now in this draft i think we are missing well ibid's obviously got banned out uh is it the yeah i'm trying to find i it think myself. it's just the dented like the dented is the one that we are definitely missing another one there should be it's one chinese more, yeah. right like yeah chinese ibid's well, dented, chinese are double all missing yeah 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 so I think it that that should actually. Oh, we're add missing up. the order of the dragon, folks. Yeah, yeah, that's what we say. Yeah, yeah, or the dragon. We've said that already. I think I think everything is accounted for, like between the bands and that, except for the dragons. Dragons that are uh, one win, one loss. But I think like it's interesting with the HRA being banned out, maybe less of a priority here. Uh, we haven't seen many people desiring it, but we have to look forward to Dry Arabian. And this is interesting to think about. Actually, um, Marine Lord got the Delhi, which would seem like a shoe in, but the other side of it, Litical, Jean Dark has been looking mighty tasty up against that sieve. So. I wonder if Marine Lord has to go for something a little bit more creative to open this series. I feel like Marine Lord doesn't need to get creative here. He's got the upper hand, and I think he is very confident going into this set based on his 4-0 outing against Louis MT, based on him taking out Puppy Paw 2-0 in the group stage. I think Marine Lord can play his own game over here, and I think for him, there is actually a bigger danger in overcomplicating things and trying to be, quote-unquote, too smart. I think if he just plays his own game, he's going to have a really good setup here. I think if there is anyone that needs to get creative, it, got, it, it has to be Puppy Paw. And how are we kind of viewing this from a, a heads up, up in the sky kind of perspective, Drongo? When we're looking at like the way this plays, we said the Louis MT BC, we were anticipating a lot of late games, funnily enough, didn't get many of them. Uh, does this feel like the first 20 minutes matters a lot? Because we know Marine Lord is all about these small advantages he scales. And Puppy Paw, in fairness to him, has been, I'd say, one of the most aggressive players consistently in this tournament so far. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Puppy Paw go for Byzantines and just come out swinging hard. Uh, this civilization is, is incredible in the early game now with the, their recent buff. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, no matter the civilization, he's just going to go absolutely ham. But uh, it isn't going to be the case. He's going to be the Mongols uh, that he, he's opting for here. And it's going to be the Ottomans on the other side. So a bit of an interesting matchup. Not yeah, sure how I feel about this one. Both of them performing poorly, right? Like, you know, Louis win with the Mongols earlier side. Mongols were seeing a 20% win rate. Uh, funny thing about the Opermans might be the Uppermans now, underpowered Ottomans, because they're down to a 25% win rate in the playoffs, Lidico. It's crazy, to th it's crazy to say that, KP. When we started this tournament, Ottomans were the automatic ban in every single match. People said it's too powerful. I don't want to deal with this. We're just going to remove the Ottomans. Um, and now that we are here in the playoffs, it's something that gets very frequently picked. It is a monster civilization when you consider that it's difficult uh, for opponents to punish them. Um, the core principle of this game is that you build workers, you gather resources, you turn that into army, and then win. But the Ottomans with the military schools, they kind of just leapfrog this step. They say, okay, once I have my military schools, I can make army even if I lose villagers. And that's something that makes Ottomans very unique and often very difficult to deal with. Even if you kill a lot of their eco, they have that comeback potential based purely on that military school production. Now, something we have to keep in mind, Drongo, obviously it's not a, a, a water hybrid map here. We're not going to see a prolonged Dark Age. But the Feudal Age was the thing hit hard for the Ottomans. And I'd say for Mongols, that stone generation hurts at any phase, but the Dark Age was their biggest crippling factor. So we have to look at that feudal point in the game and ask the question, you know, do the Mongols have enough swing to take the Ottomans out at that stage? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point because, yeah, we will see that nerf coming through, in fact, for both of these civilizations. The one thing I'm curious about is whether we're going to see Marine Lord look for that Dark Age barracks. We've seen players do that before. Typically, it's the military school that the Ottomans are running in the Dark Age, but the barracks, because it is cheaper for the Ottomans, uh, will... I gotta, I gotta double check myself right here. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, we'll, 100 uh, wood for the Ottomans, yeah. Okay, I, I was just making sure. I was like, hold on a minute. It's, it's too early. It's 4.20 in the morning right now, which is a great time to be awake. Uh, but it's also a, a tired <laughs> time for me. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where if you cut to the barracks instead of waiting for the barracks after the military school, you can get a lot more units out sooner. So I'm going to be keeping an eye out for that. And I, I might be suspecting Puppy Paw could be on the defensive at least a little bit early here, but... We'll have to wait and see. We've only got 30 seconds to go. This is going to be an absolute insane game. Yeah. KP, have you got any predictions? What What are you feeling oh. here? Uh, like overall for this game? No, for this series. What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? 5-4 puppy ball. There we go. I said, it. you know, I, like you make these statements. They seem bold, but if they come true, people remember. If not, people totally forget. You know, if, if it's a 5-0 if it's a for Marine Lord, like can you predict that? No one's going to remember that crap. Come on, get predictive. I'm seeing it right now in the channel point predictions. I know that 1.1 mil is on Marine Lord. Let's actually balance that out. Put some credence on the NA name. Poppy Paw is here to sprinkle a bit of Canadian magic into your Mongol realm because it's time to kick off our grand finals, the final series of the Elite Classic 2 to decide who will be our champion. EU versus NA, game number one, Marine Lord with the Ottomans, Puppy Paw to the Mongols. Lads, take your stations. Oh boy, oh boy, Lidicor, we're here, baby. We finally made it, it is it. This is a best of nine series. So if you haven't already, go get yourself something to drink, put your legs up. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to get into it. The very first game in a long series. It's going to be drawn out. It's going to be painful. Let's introduce our players for the day. Spawning in over on the west side of the map in the color pink. Playing as the Ottomans, representing gentle mates. It's going to be Marine Lord. And on the other side, a player who finally made it into a grand final was over there, representing Canada, Poppy Paw, with the color blue as the Mongols. And Ozzy, this is one hell of a storyline going into this set. Marine Lord, of course, just picked up by Gentlemates this week. He had an impressive debut in the semifinals uh, for his new team against Louis MT. And Poppy Paw, Someone that hasn't won a single competitive set against Marine Lord back in the past. But here he is in the Grand Finals, and he can really show that massive improvement that we have seen from him in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, coming into this this game right here, or this match right here, there have been a lot of upsets, right? If, if you were to ask the Age of Empires 4 audience, you know, the educated viewers on Twitch or the educated commenters over on Reddit, uh, who they thought was going to win the semifinals? that happened just a day, day before, I reckon you would have had close to 90% saying Beastie's going to take out Puppy Paw. And after Louis MT took out Marine Lord in the group stage, surely he would be victorious yesterday. Well, both of those those outcomes did not uh, did not happen. Instead, what we see is uh, well, the opposite. Uh, we've got Marine Lord here now taking on Puppy Paw. Now, as you mentioned before, Marine Lord's taken out Puppy Paw every single time these guys have met before. Not once has Puppy Paw ever been able to strike down Marine Lord, but there's a first time for everything. Will it be today? I think one important thing to touch on is that these two have met in the group stage, and that was a 2-0 win for Marine Lord. However, again, you go back to just yesterday's sets, Puppy Paw won 4-1 against Beastie. It wasn't just a win, it was a decisive win. And he's out here for blood. He's opening with double Spearman. Spearman will be sent out by Marine Lord to meet this advance. He kind of needs to fight this because his gold mine is very much to the front. He needs to stop this tower from being completed. Oh, but he deletes the mining camp before the bounty can get collected. The Khan didn't fire off an arrow. And neither did the spears throw anything towards that mining camp. Let's take a look inside the base of Marine Lord as the Twin Mineret Madressa is going to be coming up. Looks like it's going to be towards the north side of the town center, which is not considered to be the best side, but uh, it will be a military school opening as well for him. So looking to invest a little bit more with that military school rather than going into the early barracks and look to defend. One thing I'm looking at here, Ozzy, is that Marine Lord's gold mines, they are very punishing. He's got no safe gold to work with. It's not a major hassle for the time being for uh, for the Ottomans, but it's definitely something to keep an eye out on, and this initial tower from Puppy Paw is going to be pretty valuable. Obviously, that aggression means that he's going to be a little delayed going into Feudal Age, so he's just now going to start his age up. But I feel like one thing that Puppy Paw could do is kind of play this aggressive Feudal Age game, because as long as he postures in front of the base of Marine Lord, Marine Lord isn't really going to have the gold he needs to get up to Castle Age, and boy, 
we talked about this in the pregame, Aussie. Um, if there is anyone in this set that needs to play a little unconventional and change things up, that's got to be Poppy Paul, and he's going to open with the Silver Tree. Yeah, so Silver Tree going to be coming down. We will be seeing trade this game from Puppy Paw. That's exciting. I love a good trade game because the trade game basically... Oh, he's, <laughs> he's pushing the deer away from Marine Lord's base. How rude is this? Can you believe this guy? The I, I thought Canadians were meant to be the most polite people on the earth. I remember reading reports about it in the news that said the Canadians are the most polite people on earth. And yet we see this. We see this, Puppy Paw. Fun little fact here. The um, different units have different sizes of hitboxes when it comes to pushing these animals. And Spearmen have fairly big ones. So it's actually a lot easier to push those deer with Spearmen compared to pushing them with a scout. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it, it seems very easy to push with Spears, but he, he does manage to take them all out. Did he put them up over on the boar as well? Out of all the places he decided to pick, it was on the boar, uh, which... I guess that, that's actually quite functional. Hey, thanks, man. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's actually not a bad spot. But uh, let's let's talk a little bit about how this game's unfolding. We'll take a look inside Marine Lord's base. Is it is going to be archers that are coming up for him as well as the Sapahi in queue. So I think we've got the archery range down as well as the military school that's going to be switched over onto Sapahi and already some pressure is now going to be put out. He's going to be ignoring the outpost towards the front of the base and we'll just be focusing on bypassing that. I think one key thing here is that by opening with spears, Poppy Paw forces Marine Lord to open with a range. Sure enough, Sipahi are coming, but they come from the military school, and this is critical for Poppy. Military school building of uh, Sipahis means that it takes quite some time to build up your numbers, and this buys a lot of precious time for Poppy to establish the trade. If uh, Marine Lord went into stables, if he went aggressive with the Sipahi, this trade could be doomed right from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% on the money with that. So definitely makes sense to, to get your opponent into archers sooner rather than later. Gives you a little bit more time to build up. But we also note, uh, not only did Anatolian Hills come through from Marine Lord over in our west corner, but on the east side, Puppy Paws actually moved his uh, landmark onto the Uvu, which means he does have the opportunity to go for double production. We'll quickly check in with him and see whether he's gone for a single trader or a double, because the first one is out. We'll also get an idea on how that trade is going. There we go. The first one or second one now coming out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what kind of number he's picking up. Only 23 gold, not the best. Yeah, that's the trade-off that you're having, although he is just now moving his silver tree. I think for a moment he contemplated using double training, but it's a balancing act. You do that, it means that you're sacrificing military production. And he opted to just double down the archer count. And he's got a serviceable army. In fact, he's actually the aggressor in this case. Uh, Marine Lord was on the stone has to move away for the time being. Um, small reminder, Marine Lord doesn't have access to gold, so he simply cannot get any of the technologies. Not a single ecotech in for him, no blacksmith upgrades, of course. Um, Castle Age, nowhere close, as you would expect at this stage of the game. But I think these towers, and just in general, um, Poppy Paw's posturing in, in front of Marine Lord's base is definitely having an impact on Marine Lord's early build. Yeah, and one of the things to note is that with Puppy Paw, he, he's on a timer right now. Well, not he's on a timer, but well, he's got a timer uh, that's ticking, and that is going to be this trade. So as long as Puppy Paw is able to continue that military production and make sure Marine Lord's army doesn't get too big, too hefty at this early stage of the game, his trade will build up, and he'll be able to get some decent Keshik numbers towards mid to late feudal because of all that extra gold that's coming through. Remember, you've got to spend that gold on something. And it's not going to be always aging up, especially up against the Ottomans, who are notoriously aggressive. I'm actually seeing some interesting parallels over here when it comes to the relations of trade to 2TC builds compared to this game. When you play trade against a 2TC build, the concept is that your eco buildup is much faster, so you will get your return of investment a lot quicker. And you can actually draw some parallels between this game and a game like that, because with Marine Lord and the Ottomans, they get their power over time from the military schools. Their buildup is a little slow. And that's something that you could exploit with a aggressive eco-based opening like trade and just try to build up your numbers leveraging that trade a little quicker than the Ottomans can using the military schools. Yeah, yeah. I think you're 100% on the money with that. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye out on Marine Law though and see how strongly he looks to invest into the Feudal Age because we've got some walls that are starting to come up now. So... I guess just fearful of maybe Kashyyyk's roaming in onto that bottom side towards the wood line, wants to avoid any of that 
any of those sorts of shenanigans happening, but it doesn't look like there's any real plan to do much else other than just commit to feudal. No vills on gold, no vills on stone. So definitely no second town centers, no castle age is going to be coming through. But remember with no vills on gold, that means no upgrades coming through either. So we don't have any double broad axe, no wheelbarrow. We've already got double broad axe through on the other side for puppy paw. Just remember he's kicking through gold with each of these traders. Yeah, it, it kind of adds up. Now, this is a critical wall coming up here for Marine Lord. That's going to secure that gold mine to the left. Um, Puppy Paw saw those villagers walking out the wall, and this is where things could get a little concerning for Puppy Paw. Up until this point, as you kind of touched on that, the lack of upgrades actually hindered Marine Lord a lot. Now, with access to gold, things will get a lot more interesting. Blacksmith upgrades could become a reality. I'm actually wondering if Puppy Paw is contemplating a dive here, though, because he's got a sizable force of archers. He does lose the condo, so he's going to lose that ability to buff these units. One of the things I'd love to see Marine Lord do is just wall this back little gold segment completely in and just chuck a gate on that bottom side just to make mm -hmm. sure he's safe from any potential run by because you know how it is playing up against the Mongols. You know, one second you're there and then one second later, all your villagers are dead. So maybe just avoid that happening. Get that wall in. It, uh, it just keeps you safe. But we do see a raid coming through. Kashik's going to be hitting the bottom side. No villagers down just yet. Manages to keep them alive. Pretty low health on this. So we've got ourselves uh, an unsuccessful raid coming through from Puppy Paw at this stage. So how do you feel so far that this game's gone? Do you feel like it's in favor of Marine Lord? Do you feel like it's in favor of Puppy Paw? Do you still think it's pretty even? I think it's slowly starting to swing in the favor of Marine Lord. Um, Poppy Paw does have a reasonable trade, but he's also very vulnerable. You see, he's actually taking both batches of hunt that he has. His trade doesn't have a lot of towers in there. In general, he doesn't have a lot of traders, and his army is very one-dimensional. Um, he's facing a lot of archers, but those archers will be buffed by a meter on the other side. He's slowly mixing in Kashyyyk, but he's facing an increasing amount of Sipahi. But I guess the most worrisome detail for him is that we are reaching this point where Marine Lord is going to be maxed out on military schools, and that's where the Ottoman snowball begins. Yeah, second Vizier point about to come through right now. There it is. Probably going to be military campus. Indeed it is. No real surprise right there, considered pretty much to be your S tier selection when it comes in for that second point. Other options may be like the Imams we occasionally see players go for if they really want to stick it in feudal uh, for a bit, and, and, it's, and it's getting quite hectic, but... Uh, yeah, for the most part, that's what it's going to be. So no real surprise seeing that one come through. He's going to be looking to drop down that third military school soon. And then he'll be really online. But I guess the one thing to note is that Puppy Paw, his lead's not particularly big at this stage. He's only up by seven workers, which isn't that crazy when you consider that realistically, the trading landmark that he's got can produce workers or traders very, very fast. And let's not forget, Marine Lord is getting a lot of units for free. So there is probably not even an actual eco lead here for uh, for Puppy Paw. You could argue that Marine Lord is ahead at this point. Army numbers are neck and neck. Puppy Paw, two minutes ago, actually had a pretty sizable army lead. And now Marine Lord is looking to punish this area. There's a lot here for Puppy Paw to defend the hunters, the trade. It's got one defensive tower with arrow slits, quite a few archers. Archer count looking fairly even, but there's no con here to buff this army for Puppy. Yeah, not at the moment. The meta on the backside. You can see how far back Marine Lord is keeping it. Look at that positioning from the meta. Beautifully positioned, just making sure it does not have... There's no risk of it going down whatsoever. Khan's going to come out. It needs to be careful. It get, avoids getting too close to that archer pack. We'll get focused down. One volley. There's the second volley. It's going to be going down, but he gets the arrow off right before. A little bit of attack speed to help out here. Now on the front side, he's brought the meta through. It looks like it's going to get focused down, and both players making micro mistakes here in this grand final. Not something you typically see at this level, but I tell you what, they must be feeling the nerves right now, Lidacore, because these two are really starting to clash. And a Kashyyyk are coming in clutch here. Archers don't do a lot of damage against them, and as the Kashyyyk fight, they do regain their HP. And Marine Lord doesn't really have a lot other than Archers at this point. Not a lot of Spahi, no Spearmen to work with. Those few Kashyyyks are carrying this fight so, so heavily, I feel. Yeah, the Kashyyyks are notoriously difficult to deal with, especially in, in the Feudal Age. 
little bit of extra armor goes a long way. But I think the big thing to note is that as the gold continues to trickle in for Puppy Paw, it's just going to mean more and more Keshix onto the field. He's got three in production at the moment, and he's getting so much value from them at the moment. This is incredible when you consider just how much value he got there. He's up 10 archers now compared to his opponent. Oh, the matter. That was... That was nasty for Marine Lord. Took a big beating on that matter. Might be able to counterattack this, but let's not forget, Marine Lord is getting a lot of his units from the military schools, which take a long time to produce these units. So these continued slugfests are not something that benefit Marine Lord here. Yeah, and just remember, as time goes on, Puppy Paw continues to add more traders. Up now, 13 workers over his opponent. Very happy to take this fight. I don't know why Marine Lord's taking this. He does not have yeah. the archer advantage in this situation, but he's got reinforcements. Has Mar Marine Lord reinforcements disconnected? Yeah, has Marine Lord disconnected? Look, the archers are just sitting there. I feel like Marine Lord's disconnected. I'm 99% sure say. Marine Lord's disconnected. Uh yeah, I think Marine did. I don't. I'm not 100% sure what's happened, but I'm 99% sure Marine Lord has crashed. This guy is good. Okay, he's not going to be making this mistake. He was sitting still for a while there. We're going to have to head back to the drawing board and let you guys know exactly what's going on here. But uh, Lidicor, I suspect we're probably going to be coming back through shortly because the the game I suspect is probably going to crash any second here, or not crash but end. So if it does, don't be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll let you know. Uh, exactly what happens uh, behind the scene. So that that's going to be it right there. So we were able to see it was indeed a crash uh, for Marine Lord. But uh, okay, we, we have received confirmation. Uh, so Marine Lord lost internet during that game. Uh, and as a result, it will be a win for Puppy Paw. So that's come through from the admin. So a oh, bit my. of an anticlimactic start there, Lidicor, to our first game in the grand final series. Oh, normally it's the Canadians that are losing internet. What's the deal here? <laughs> oh man, that's a, that's a tough break for Marine Lord. But um, to be fair, things started to look very, very good for Puppy Paw. He had a really good battle um, as Marine Lord was retreating. And even if they trade armies, that's something that we touched on um, before. A trade of armies means that both of them are reset to low counts, but that's something that makes Marine Lord's life a little bit more difficult because he needs time to build up those numbers again with the military schools. He only had a handful of production buildings to work with that can quickly produce an army. Still, I don't think Marine Lord was completely out of this game just yet, but his position started looking a lot scarier once we've seen this counterattack coming into play from Puppy Paw. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, well, look, <laughs> want to know what happens when you disconnect? That's what happens when you disconnect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was kind of weird. You could tell in the fight, like he, that was a bad fight and he shouldn't have been taking that fight. And the fact that he was taking it, it was you knew something was up. Uh, but very quickly, Puppy Paw dispatched of uh, of his military. So we head back, well, not, not necessarily heading back to the drawing board. We're heading back to the, the next board, uh, whatever may be upon it. Maybe it's a white board. Uh, perhaps it's a black board. Who knows, whatever it is. But uh, that was looking pretty good for Puppy Paw. I'm not going to lie. Uh, trade advantage, military number advantage. Keshiks were just going to keep building up there. And sure, you had like the, the nice build-up of triple military school for Marine Lord, but realistically, that's not enough to overcome like 13 plus traders that are going to continue expanding as the game goes deeper. Uh, looks like we're going to be heading into Holy Island, though. So that's going to be the first home map selection of Marine Lord. Opts to go for uh, his own home map selection here. Now, looking at the civilizations, uh, he can choose from Jushi, French, Delhi, Japanese, and Rus. A lot of good options available here for mm -hmm. Marine Lord. Yeah, he could look to throw something like Jushi out here. Uh, wouldn't be too bad. Uh, they're not particularly strong at the moment or particularly popular, but I think on, on Holy Island, you can definitely get away with them. What civilization do you think Puppy Paw is going to opt for here? Do you think we could potentially be seeing a little bit of English? I think Byzantines could be an interesting idea. We've seen some Byzantines being plied around here. JD could be a bit of an off-meta selection. Malians, I don't envision that being a thing. And English, perhaps. We actually see a lot of English on hybrid maps. It's uh, a pretty versatile civilization. And it's one of those few civs that can afford to play water and also put up some land aggression with longbows at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's English here. I feel like... It's going to be the only pick. And for Juicy Legacy in the English, that can be a difficult matchup. And that's exactly what it's going to be here. So, look, on if this was a land map, right? If you told me Dry Arabia, the matchup is English Juicy Legacy, I'd say, okay, this is probably like a 75% chance English win. This is hard for the Juicy Legacy. They don't really have an answer to Longbow's 
in the feudal age. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with largely a war on land is very minimal and it's mainly a focus on water. That's the big focus. Yeah, Jushi versus English. Now, Jushi do have their potential of putting up that um, aggression on land, but this is actually one of the more intriguing players or uh, players, uh, one of the more intriguing maps when you look at the map pool. One of the key things to look at is that there is a lot to focus on, and we've seen this over and over again on Holy Island. Even for the best of the best, it is sometimes challenging to keep track of all the battles happening on land and water. So a lot comes down to macro game, and I think the interesting thing about these two civilizations is that both of them are able to put up land aggression and naval aggression at the beginning of the game simultaneously. So there's going to be a lot of things happening here, even early game, I feel. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got to agree with you. I, I think that we're, we're going to see a lot of action early. Um, I'm curious to see exactly how Marine Lord looks to play this, though. Maybe he could look for an early stable, look to get some pressure out and just try and deal with any threat. Uh, but by, from, by the same token from Puppy Paw, we could potentially see Mana Arms out as well. That's something that, that has been uh, quite common in the past. But we've got another five minutes until the game starts. So we've got plenty of time to think about this so far. Uh, but uh, yeah, Holy Island. I feel like, yeah, English is probably the only thing he could have really thrown out here. Yeah, Abbas said not, definitely not going to be the case. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense. All right. Well, Lidicor has disappeared. It's just going to be me for now. Goodbye, Lidicor. Thank you for uh, for everything. I don't know what happened to Lidicor. I I'm Guys, still I here. I'm still here. All right. Welcome uh, back, everybody. He's, he's, he's playing around. He's playing around. Um, no, it's just uh, something went into my eye. So I guess I needed to take a couple of seconds off camera, but um, back we are. So I guess this is a good time, Ozzy, to have a bit of a preview of the upcoming maps, though. Frisian Marshes, Bridges, Rocky Canyon, Lipany Gorge, Cliffside, uh, and Coastal Cliffs uh, for the players, respectively. Again, we're going to have a Civilization redraft after game number four. So the Civilizations that you see available over here, that's only for the first four games. Marine Lord, I think he, he went with the most straightforward way so far. Just pick his first home map selection as game number two. Jushi versus English kind of leaves up uh, French, Delhi, Japanese, and Bruce for the remaining maps for Marine Lord, um, with uh, Abbasids, Malians, Byzantines, and uh, Jean d'Arc for uh, for Puppy. But again, I think a lot comes down to the order at which these maps are going to be picked. Otherwise, um, without knowing the exact order, it's just difficult to theory craft. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it, it's it's to be honest, it's it's strange how there's two different drafts that happen. And it definitely throws off a lot of my thinking because you're looking at the maps and you're like, okay, I'll play this here, I'll play that there. But then you're like, well, hold on. I get halfway through and then I can just redraft anyway. So I need to use my best sieves right now because I might not get an option to pick them later or use them later. So I need to 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 have them. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, next match, it's, it's Rus versus Byzantines, two very early picked civilizations. And the map after that might be Jean d'Arc versus the Japanese or some something, some combination of that. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it definitely leaves quite a lot of options open for these players. Um, I'm trying to think what, what I would pick if I was in Puppy Paw's position if I lose this map. I'd be surprised uh -huh. if he actually loses this, though. This is a... I mean, it, I guess it just comes down to water, doesn't it? Uh, it, it it's not so not so relevant, uh, the matchup on, yeah, uh, I, on I land. I think if he, if he ends up winning this, he's going to be more than happy saying, okay, Marine Lord, you picked the map again. Um, <laughs> then again, if he if he ends up losing... I could see himself trying to play something like uh, Lipany or Gorge and try to play a, a trade-style game that he tried to pull off in the previous game. He still has um, Abbasids available. He still has Jean d'Arc available. And again, I think when it comes to Puppy Paw, um, the principle remains he needs to play a little bit more off-meta because what he usually does, the standard gameplay, is just not something that seems to work well against Marine Lord, at least based on the match history of these two. See, I, I, I was thinking Coastal Cliffs and Byzantines. I've, I've seen Byzantines work very well on Coastal Cliffs in the past. Uh, they're very happy to play one base. They don't really need stone, you know, that much. And you can be very aggressive on that map and uh, and be rewarded greatly for it. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see a combo like that come out. And I guess if you're looking from Marine Lord's perspective, what do you really play on Coastal Cliffs? I mean, you don't really want to do Delhi. There's only two sacred sites that are pretty close together. So if you lose control, you're probably not going to have a good game there. Maybe the Japanese, but if you're up against the Byzantines, they're going to put a lot of pressure on. I mean, there's lots of different options for you, so we'll have to wait and see how, how it goes. But uh, 
yeah, coming into this, what, what's your percentage? If, if you had to throw out a percentage here for Marine Lord versus Puppy Paw, which way do you think it's going to go, Lidacor? I would say 70% Marine Lord. Um, I think it, it's not a civilization matchup thing. I think it's a map layout and playstyle thing. This is an extremely macro and micro-intensive map at the same time. Talk about the water micro. Um, talk about land micro if you have a lot of archers going on at the same time. And again, keeping track of all these uh, events happening, it's a challenge for all of the pro players. And Marine Lord excels in these fields, both micro and exceptional macro. And I think this map probably just plays into the skills that he has. And that's probably part of the reason why he picked this map as his first home map. He probably feels very confident playing this map. Yeah. And he probably knows that he's got the upper hand against Puppy Paw in this map, no matter what the civilizations are. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's chaos, this map. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's definitely one that I fear. Uh, th there's a lot going on all the time, or at least there can be, because uh, the, the focus is often on water. But whenever there's a stalemate on water, it always seems to spill over onto the land, and then it becomes a question of how you're going to handle it. So what I'm curious to see is how long Marine Lord actually looks to stay in Feudal Age, because he doesn't have a whole lot of answers against the English in the Feudal Age. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him go for a pretty quick Castle Age just so that he's got access to maybe plus two ranged armor for Palace Guards or even just Lancers, uh, which would help him out a huge amount. But yeah, not having Archers as the Juicy Legacy is difficult, but we don't have too much longer to theory craft Lidicor as, uh, as now. It's no longer theory. It's all practice. The game is about to begin. I'm excited. If I, if I had to give a percentage here, I would... I'd say a similar number to you. I'd probably say about like Marine Lord 60%, just because it definitely feels like his zone. But ladies and gentlemen, it is time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game number two. It is a pleasure to be here, to be enjoying this cast with you guys. Spawning in on the west side of the map in the color pink, playing as the Juicy Legacy, representing Gentlemates. It's Marine Lord. And on the other side, it's going to be Puppy Paw in command of Ling English playing as the color blue. We talked about this Aussie in the pregame. This is a tough map to play for any of these players, but it definitely feels like a Marine Lord map. This was his first home map selection over here. And we have the generation where the forest spawns in front mm. of the players. Um, this map can spawn in two ways. Either it's a fully open front or you do have a forest spawning in front of your base for both players. We actually seem to have gotten the latter for this game. And if anything, I think that favors Puppy Paw. The reason why? Because naturally marine lord seems to thrive in chaos the more chaos he can he can foster the better he, he'll do uh and by putting this wood line in the front of your base what it does is it says we're going to have a little bit more of a defensive game here and what you can do is you can take that wood line and you can start playing connect the dots which is my favorite thing to do with wood lines and all of a sudden you can start to draw this bad boy out to stone or to gold or to anything else that you might want to try and connect it to and you can get yourself a beautiful little defensive wall That, that's my TED talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, let's take a look out at the ocean and see exactly how many fishing boats we've got. As it looks like both players are going to be heading out there pretty early here. Keep in mind, both civilizations have got different bonuses when it comes to the water. So the Chinese, or the Juicy Legacy in this case, uh, they, they build things a little bit faster. They train them a little bit faster. And the English, they, pa they pay a little bit less to get into it. So two advantages. I think it's 10% reduction in ship costs for the English and 10% extra dock speed for the char or for the Juicy Legacy. And that 10% that you have for the English, you can turn that into longbows eventually. One of the cool things about English on this map is that as you age up the Feudal Age with the Council Hall, you do get a land-based production building. And because you do save a little on the fishing boats, you do have the ability to turn that into some land-based army and not only fight on the water in early feudal, but also be able to aggress your opponent on land. That's a really good point. Uh, that, yeah, it's just a couple of extra resources, but it can make a big difference because it means that you're getting those fishing boats out slightly faster. And have a look at this. We've got a second dock coming down in the Dark Age here for Puppy Paw. And he's going to be looking to add a, a couple more fishing boats in here. Now, he'll be able to use this as... or He'll be able to double this up as production. We've got both players now going for the double dock here. Getting it out a little bit closer to each other. How many villages have we got? Actually, I, I just realized we can see how many villages each of each players have got on wood. We've got 11 for Marine Lord, 9 for Puppy Paw. So they are absolutely pumping the fishing boats out at this stage of the game. 
And that's kind of what you expect, and that's why Fuel Age is usually delayed for uh, players doing these hybrid builds. You just focus so much on that wood initially that you don't even have any villagers on gold. Um, in fact, we can actually see the players just now moving towards the gold. Speaking of which, um, the gold mines for all these players are fairly exposed. You don't really have them tucked away at the back, which is something that you usually see on this map. It's going to be more north-oriented um, for Puppypaw, and it's going to be more towards the south for uh, for Marine Lord. But at the end of the day, both of these players will have the ability to potentially pressure the opponent's gold mine, and that's one of the best ways to slow down the enemy's production of combat ships. Yeah, yeah, that's, it can be very, very hampering. It, ever since they changed the cost of boats, uh, I mean, gold's always been a priority, but... Uh, yeah, there was a, a big change that happened to boats quite recently. Not quite recently, maybe, what, a year ago, I think, uh, where basically they made it so it costs food, wood, and gold now. Uh, but uh, we do now start to see those age-ups coming through. It's going to be the council hall for Puppy Paw. Five villagers on it. Uh, pretty early timing here, coming just before the five-minute mark. Keep in mind, he is on double dock, so this is a pretty aggressive or pretty greedy opening. 29 villagers in the Dark Age. That is a lot of villagers. It's, it also means that the escalation is going to be a lot more rapid once you get to Feudal Age. You do have powerful economies heading into Feudal. So as you get there, you will be ha able to spend a lot of resources on um, Navy and Army. And that is one nice landmark spot here for those Meditation Gardens. 25 stone, 25 gold. And what are we going to be looking at on the food? Maybe... What is They're 6 each, are they? Because they, they went from 8 to 6 each. So 36, so 72. So not, not bad, 120 plus for this Meditation Gardens. Pretty decent, considering it's post-patch. So I think Marine Lord's going to be very happy with this. But uh, yeah, Age Up's going to be coming through around the same time. Have a look at the stockpiles for each of these players. They're going to be spending a lot of resources as soon as they Age Up on military ships here. Council Hall about to finish for Puppy Paw. And have a look at that queue. Straight away, four longbows in queue. No, no uh, vessels of the sort. No ships, no nothing like that. Uh, but we do have double broad axe coming through for both of them later. I, I like this approach from Poppy Paw. At the end of the day, a single combat ship isn't going to do enough. It's an expensive uh, investment. You make that combat ship, by the time you get to the enemy base, he is going to have his, so you won't be able to do a lot of damage. Compare that to the longbows. Um, Marine Lord is starting to make some horsemen, sure enough, but the whole point of this approach from Poppy Paw is that it forces Marine Lord to make an expensive production building, the stable. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that Papipo doesn't have any spearmen, so he needs to be extra careful when it comes to engaging these horsemen, especially because this is going to be a very aggressive build over here. He's dropping a tower with two villagers. All right, well, he's also going to be throwing down the palings down on top of those villagers, making sure that those horsemen aren't going to be able to get too close. Now, keep in mind, he's going to look to try and pick up reinforcements here. It looks like he's supervised out a total of three uh, horseman at this stage, and now just looking to try and find any. Can't spot anything, though. He's just got, what, six longbows out? I think only a handful. Two or three have made it through to the front. We'll spot out that there is an outpost coming up. Knock their front on the palings, and it looks like a oh cleanup boy. will be coming through. Keep in mind, there are two vills here, Lytical. This, this tower should not finish. The palings didn't do enough. Tower is close to completion. Villagers weren't focused until this point. They still aren't. Oh! Horsemen There's no the way. Enough. How? I have no idea how that happened, but uh, even with that outpost getting up, I don't think it really does anything, right? Like, it's not like the Mongol outpost on the gold where it's like, now I can't get gold. What am I going to do? Like, it's not that bad. It's a, it's, it, was a, it was a tower. Marine Lord played I, that well, though. I, I like his opening. Yeah, it's, it's one HP. I think it was the scout beating up the villager, and because of that, you couldn't have an extra horseman. Ah. Yeah, it so was body blocking the horseman. So you actually replaced a lot higher damage output with a scout, which does nearly no damage. That's what it was, 100%. Yeah, it's got to be it. But we got ourselves a little bit of a, a water battle coming out. It's going to be 1-1-1. One, one, one. We got a war junk, we got a junk, and we got ourselves an explosive junk out here as well. We got everything going. Meanwhile, for the side of Marine Lord, we have got... Is this... What is it? It's hard to tell the difference between these. There's one with two sails, two with two sails, and one with one sail. So we've got two war junks and a junk. Oh, I didn't even know they have different counts of sails. I've, I've learned something today, I guess. They've also got oars on them as well. Uh, that's another way to tell the difference. Cool. Now, now try and tell the difference between a fishing boat on fire and a fishing boat. Uh, no, I won't do that. I can tell the difference between a horseman and a longbowman. I'm fairly confident about that. 
All right. How, how about a Jukunu and a crossbow? Nope. <laughs> Me either. I st I, I've played like a thousand Chinese games, still can't tell the difference. But uh, have a look at this. You'll be able to tell the difference after that. There's uh, quite a few shots that have been taken into that horseman. Lost a lot of health, but does manage to make it away. Uh, and Marine starting to build up the the uh, resources back there. What's he thinking about doing? It's going to be Jukunu. Have a look at this from Marine Lord in the Feudal Age. Oh, definitely I love a, a bit... It's, it's scary, man, playing Jukunu into the into the English. They can just kite you for days. You really want to well, do that? I guess one thing to keep in mind is that um, right now it's not a kiting thing for Puppy Paw. He's actually chasing. He's chasing away those horsemen. He doesn't really have the mobility. And at the same time, a bit of a naval engagement over here. Demo comes out. This is where things could get very dicey for both of these players. Have to pay attention to the land-based battles and at the same time micro their navies. Yeah, this is that chaos that Marine Lord loves, and this is where he feels so good. Have a look at this now. Into the wood line, we've got ourselves a little bit of double trouble. Our players continue to find it out on the water. See Hulks going up against the war junks. Number advantage in favor of Puppy Port at this stage of the game. Meanwhile, over towards the land battle. We've got spears together with the longbows that are going to continue building up. The Zhukunu able to do some decent damage here. As long as he's not kiting, he'll be A-OK. -okay. Looks like so far, so good coming through for Marine Lord. He's picked apart everything with the Jukunu. And this battle is fundamentally different from a battle that you see between these two civs on a map like Dry Arabia. Because, again, Avipal needs to pay attention to his navy as well. So he has a lot less time to micro his forces around. And we've seen that uh, come into play over here. These Jukunu have been very, very effective against all these longbows. And now you look at the land army, there is next to none remaining for Puppy Paw. The remaining longbows will get cleaned up by the horsemen. It's all Marine Lord on land right now. And he also has an eight villager lead by now. Yeah, that's an impressive villager lead. I, where did that come from? Is that just fishing boats? It's got to be, right? We see that there's been two worker kills for him. Oh, the, the two worker kills early on, of course. And then what? Six fishing boats, the difference. Yeah, we've got a lot out here. Look at this. 17 fishing boats compared to the 11 on the other side, I guess is what we're probably seeing. Indeed it is. Yeah, Maybe you have it. multiple Rats. docks here for Marine Lord. I think Marine Lord might be running four docks at this point compared to Puppy Post 3 or so. And of course, he does have the meditation gardens for the extra resources. Yeah, one, two, three. It's got to be four docks. Potentially even five. Whereas we definitely have a lot less for Puppy Paw to work with. Nice meditation gardens here. 110 resources coming through for him now. But the push coming through. Arrow slits is in for the uh, the dock up the front. It's going to be really careful about engaging with it. You can see it firing off there. It's got a huge range on it. Meanwhile, towards the north side of the map, we've got units looking to apply pressure towards the wood line of Puppy Paw. So we'll keep an eye out on that as well. But slowly and steadily, the numbers are building. And it feels like Marine Lord might have himself a little bit of space to go castle here if he wants to. He's definitely got the numbers advantage on water. I feel like he's got the ability to go castle here. Yeah, and I think he should. Um, he's more than fine on water. When you look at the navies, it's kind of neck and neck. In fact, he does have uh, weapon emplacements on this dock, so he should be able to hold this. And if he gets to castle age, he can start getting some palace guards out. And that's where things get very dicey for Puppy Paw. Things are looking so, so grim for the English player over here. Down in eco, cannot break this naval defense, and his opponent is about to get to castle age. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a big problem. One of the, the saving graces for Puppy Paw, I'll give it to him, is that every civilization's got access to, access to a special technology that increases pretty much the, the health and, and health of, of their warships. The Chinese have the ability to supervise most of their buildings, which will increase how quickly that tech comes through. The only thing is, they can't supervise the dock, because it would be massively overpowered. Think about supervising the dock, how crazy that would be, Lidacore. You would get extra food from your fishing boat drop-offs, but you'd also get extra production time as well, or production speed from the Imperial officials. It would be crazy. Uh, and there's, that's, a, that's the reason why you can't do it, because it would be absolutely broken. But the consequence of that is that your upgrade is going to take some time to come through as well. We can see it on the way now. Castle Age is in for Marine Lord. He's also getting some Shaolin Monks out, so he's getting ready to pick up the relics, uh, further escalate that eco lead that he already has. Um, and it's it's going to be Lancers, actually, for him, not Palace Guards. He still has a couple of Jukenu. Those will get the veterancy before this battle begins. Now, Papi Paw could do a lot of damage here on this wood line, but Marine Lord was cautious. He pulled the villagers away. And uh, 
I guess Poppy Paul now knows that he's going to face costly units, so there is no point diving. I, I think the worrisome detail for Poppy Paul is that he is behind in every aspect of the game right now. And I'm just struggling to see how he's going to turn things around. He, he might need a miraculous naval engagement or something. Because right now, the two players are doing very similar things, but Marine Lord is uh, ahead by a mile. Yeah, and this is this is going to just get even harder if Puppy Paul loses the water. Because by Marine Lord keeping the water, what it means is that he never has to do a farm transition. He's getting all of his food from the water, never has to think about farms. And Puppy Paul, while farms aren't the most expensive thing for him, it's still something you want to avoid doing if you if you can. But now, slowly and steadily, the dance of the warships begins. Marine Lord pushing up. He's got a slight number advantage. Ten versus nine. Keep in mind, we'll be watching out for the uh, for the, the fire ships in here. There's a single one, and the Puppy Paw's actually gone into quite a few. He's got three of them out. Meanwhile, a little bit of a push coming from sh to shove as Marine Lord moves in on that top side of the map as well. You can see just how much he's trying to put pressure on Puppy Paw. He loves that chaos, doesn't he, Litter? Oh, certainly. Um, this is all about fighting at the same time and hoping that your opponent isn't going to look when your demo ship approaches, but Castle Age is going to be coming in for Papipo as well as Marine Lord opts to retreat, and he is aging up with the King's Palace, so he's going to have that extra villager production available. He's only down by 9 eco right now, so I think Papipo, starting with the King's Palace, that's a reasonable way to start getting back into this game. Uh, Marine Lord has only picked up one relic so far, so despite that massive Castle Age advantage for Marine Lord, he wasn't really able to get a lot out of it so far. Yeah, that, that Relic number will continue to climb, though. He's picked up this, a second one now. He's got the position to take the third one as well. Uh, and then we'll get the fourth. The fifth one probably going to go over to Puppy Paw. So it'll be a 4-1 advantage. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the question for me is, what's Puppy Paw's win condition here? Like, if we make it to late game, then is, is that where we, our win condition is? I guess maybe. But the Juicy Le Legacy are pretty strong in the late game as well, right? But... I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's Men at Arms. Maybe it's armor cladding Men at Arms. I, I, I don't know how Perhaps. he looks to play this out the longer this game goes. I think the first benchmark to look at will be when Fish starts to run low and players will have to start adding um, farms. But both players will be more than happy playing with some farms, English and Jushi alike. For the time being, population is escalating rapidly for both of these players. We're actually approaching that 200 population zone because both players have been reluctant to engage on the water. Barely any ships have been lost, but that's a lot of demos. It's eight demos against three, actually. Yeah, you gotta be real careful with the demos because with the Here arrow ships firing out, They've got that AoE, and he's going to send one in, two in. There we go, big explosions. Arrow ship's going to soak it all up. He's got three out here. Puppy Paw idling out his own demo ships, and he's only just realized at the end there that he's got to keep them moving, baby. But unfortunately, both of them seeming to go for a bit of a hit and a miss. Eight war junks coming out for Puppy Paw on the other side. We see ten. Uh, so ten hulk, or eight hulks up against the ten war junks there. Uh, but it definitely feels like Puppy Paw is on the back foot struggling to hold on for dear life. If he loses the water, the game's not necessarily over, but it will be a lot harder. Oh, it certainly will be, and this is a really good push by Marine Lord. He's been patient. He's been building that Navy for a while, and now that he dives, he does have the cost age upgrades. Those demos also were fairly impactful. We are going to have a one missing over here. Puppy Paul, he still has a Navy intact, and Marine Lord will retreat a little, but he has idled out the fishing eco of his opponent quite a bit, so... Um, I feel like Marine Lord is going to be more than happy with that engagement. Yeah, that was a decent engagement there for him. Um, didn't manage to take out that many fishing boats, but to be honest, there's not a huge amount that are out there. But yeah, I think overall, Marine Lord's pretty happy with this. I think the big question is for Puppy Paw, like one of the things I would be looking to do right now is, is almost just ignore water, right? Like the farm transition isn't that hard for the English. You're, you're paying for farms half price and you're getting way better farms so there's that so one of the things i'd love to see him do is just go into like a whole bunch of stone maybe look at throwing down a second or a third tc in this case is because he's got the king's palace but you also need to defend against the imminent palace guards that are about to rampage through your base we know that's about to happen uh because marine lord's got eight on the field or nine on the field and six more in queue so there's plenty more where that came from and it could be oh is that a second did he wait how did puppy get this relic in his hands in his hot little hands that means it's going to be two relics for Puppy Paw? Damn, yeah, not that's, bad. That's actually crazy. Uh, Marine Lord is going to be a three, but given how quick Marine Lord was to cast Lage, a three-two is something that Puppy is going to be more than happy about. 
I don't know if uh, Puppy can hold this though. Marine Lord has rebuilt all the demos. He's got nine of them, and he just needs one good dive to sink everything that Puppy Paul has. Now the demo is going to be running in from that right hand side. You can see him moving up, almost trying to trying to hide them. Demo going to be coming out in response, and now moving up the left side as well. He's going to look to try and sweep across, and that's going to be it. Water almost certainly going to be lost after this. And look at this—we got the slow mo coming in for you in the bottom left hand corner. I don't know if it was slow-mo or what was happening right there, but we've got ourselves different angles as all of those ships go down. But even despite that, it feels like Puppy Paw is still holding on for dear life down here. Uh, yeah, I think weapon emplacements on the docks help a little, but when you look at it, that's partly because a lot of the damage was absorbed by the fishing boats. His navy is going to be gone. And look at the immediate reaction on them. He's basically saying, okay, I'm done with water. I need to wall off my base because this... If I have a chance of coming back into this game, it has to go through land. All right. You guys might see a little bit of a white box up on the screen. We are aware of it. We're working behind the scenes to get that bad boy fixed up. Uh, do not worry. But you can see what's happening. And this is exactly what needs to happen from Puppy Paw on land. I want to focus on the minimap just while we wait for everything to get fixed up over here. Uh, because we've lost water completely. And now the question is... Often, you know, what do you do in this situation? You've lost water. You've got two options. Number one, resign. I'm going to get that one out there nice and quick just before it, it might happen because it has happened before. And number two is my favorite, and that's where you go big or you go home. And it looks like it's going to be going big. So looking for that third TC. Uh, haven't really seen it just yet, but looking to control uh, the land, looking to get that economy really booming. There's plenty of resources back here as well for Puppy Paw. So hopefully uh, we see him look to stay in this game a little bit longer. But have a look at that on the Could other side of Marine Lord. be an interesting timing over here. Temple of the Sun being constructed by Marine Lord. And Marine Lord went into Palace Guards, but he doesn't have an awful lot of them. Puppy Paw's army is mostly longbows. Only a handful of crossbows mixed in here. I feel like Puppy Paw needs to hit a great timing over here to have a chance in this game. But once the decks come in here from Marine Lord, I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's all over for Puppy. This is almost an all-in here from our Canadian. Yeah, Elite Palace Guards is going to finish this, but I don't even think he's going to need it. Not enough crossbows here at all. Longbows are going to try and kite, though. They've got plus one range attack. That's going to be it. They've also got veterancy, so missing out a little bit. Palace Guards is going to try his best to run them down. Keep in mind, he's got the Temple of the Sun, which is going to be empowering the infantry movement speed. It's going to be moving everything faster. And look how quick those Palace Guards go. It's like watching horsemen, except they've only got two legs. They're like centaurs that have been cut off at the back. And now making their way forward. Look how quick they go. <laughs> it's just insane, aren't they? They're so... They're, they're, this unit's perfectly balanced. Please, Relic, don't even think about it. This is a perfectly balanced unit. Yeah, ironically, if Poppy had, like, five more crossbows here, this fight would have been a lot better for him. You see, he's slowly picking off all these palace guards, and the back line is only just a handful of Chukenu. But now the upgrades are starting to come in here. Man at arms for Poppy Paw on the way, but his eco is just way too feeble for this. This is a 160 population against 110 game. Puppy Paw is barely holding. Now he's an age behind, and everything is falling apart for the Canadian. Marine Lord looking extremely strong here in game number two, and I think he's very close to evening out this series. Yeah, he's definitely looking good, but have a look at that. Can we go have a squiz in the bottom or at the bottom of the map? I want to click on those traders. I want to see oh, how I much love it. gold, how much wood are they bringing in? I love 61. it. 61, look at that. You know, what a way to finish this bad boy off right here. You've secured water. Now you can have a little bit of fun. Have some trade ships. I'll let you. Uh, I love this from Marine Lord. He was in a really good position even five minutes ago, and he didn't just sit in that position and say, okay, I'm, I'm confident. He's playing for very high upside uh, things. Going for a trade, um, rushing up to Imperial, um, these kinds of things, he is just building off of that um, advantage that he already has. He didn't want to finish off Puppy Paw in this direct push. But he's kind of playing late game, just further escalating that um, lead that he has. And now that he's got uh, the elite upgrades on these palace guards, things are looking very, very dicey for Puppy Paw. I, I feel like, Ozzy, it's, it's not a matter of who, it's a matter of when at this point. Yeah, it can be really tough playing against palace guards, even when you're in the same age, in imperial age, against them. But fighting up an age or down an age in this case, uh, it can be so damn hard. Uh, because elite units are just, you know, not only are they 
got, or do they have more health? They've got more damage on them. They've got more armor as well. Uh, in this case, going to Imperial Age has granted him more movement speed. Um, and, you know, he's in Tang Dynasty at the moment, but once he looks to things like Ming Dynasty, where he's going to be getting more uh, more attack as well, it's, there's just so many upgrades you can stack on these elite units that they unlock at this level. Uh, and Elite Army Tactics is actually coming through now. He's also got plus three armor as well. All he needs to do is just make Palace Guards. I'm kind of surprised that he's still making crossbows as well. You, you don't even need to, Marine Lord. Uh, but people wants to go into Imperial here, and I guess Marine Lord is making some crossbows because he's afraid of men-at-arms. But I love this. He's moving out to drop a keep in the central sacred site. If mm. Puppy Boy is not coming out of his base, he's going to capture both sacred sites, start the timer, get the extra gold. He's also going to secure the large gold deposit in the window, middle with that keep, as Puppy Boy is looking to age with the Barkshire Palace. He himself is going to get a big boost from Imperial. But I just feel like this game is too far gone for Puppy. This game would need to be an hour long for him to have a chance. Yeah, but I, I look, it, 10 minutes is more than enough time here, and it, it's going to take at least 10 minutes to capture that other sacred site as well. Um, so I reckon, you know, realistically, Puppy Paw's got until about 35 minutes to come online. The Barkshire is going to buy him space as well, uh, which is important to note. Marine Lord's going for trebuchets, but remember, trebuchets, you're going to need a lot of them to take down the Barkshire because the Barkshire requires wood to repair rather than stone. So it's pretty much infinite. Um, so... I think Puppy Paw's position here isn't terrible. Basically, he just needs to try and stay alive behind his walls and, and kite. Well, that's easier said than done, though, because it I is. feel like Marine Lord probably will just ignore the Barkship Palace. He has enough Palace Guard to just march into the enemy base and wipe out the Eco. Puppy Paw is only at 98 villagers, so even a handful of casualties is going to be pretty problematic for him to deal with. All right, well, the Barkship now coming online. The walls at the front is, are going to be sieged down quickly, and... You know, we were just talking about, you know, you've got to try and survive here through this. It's going to be tough as he faces his opponent underneath the Barkshire. The Marine Lord is going to look to try and push through. Keep in mind, once the walls have been broken down, he just needs to look to focus down villagers. He's going to be able to push back these crossbows, but the real key here is just going after the villagers. And now we watch that worker kill count towards the bottom of your screen. You're going to see it rise. It's on 24 at the moment. It's going to continue to go up as the palace guards work their magic here inside the base of Puppy Paw. Down to 89 workers in total. He's got a lot of idols here as well. But as long as he's pumping crossbows together with men-at-arms, maybe if he gets a few hand cannoneers out, if he can afford it, uh, he can feel good about himself. Uh, but one thing to note is I don't even think we've got enclosures just yet for Puppy Paw. He, he is really running that tight of a ship when it comes... I, I he's just got have, no gold. I just have a screenshot. He's got, he's got absolutely no gold, yeah. no gold to work with. He's got no gold mine that's safe and secure, and as you said, he doesn't have enclosure. He's got virtually no gold income besides the two relics that he currently has. Uh, hey, he's slowly cleaning up these Look how much gold... Look at the gold the Marine Lord's got, oh, by yeah. the way. He's just stripping the map here of gold, I feel. He's taking all these exposed gold mines while he still can. Yeah, that's... Not only is that 3.7k gold, it's also 3.5k gold income as well. All sacred sites now captured. I think Puppy Paw is still in this, but it's this is... I mean, you're up against one of the world's best players, right? Like, it, this is not just your standard Conqueror 3 game. Oh, certainly. It's... Uh, Puppy Paw is still holding, but this would be a miraculous comeback if he ever manages to make one. He needs to decap the Sacred Sites, uh, and he needs to do this without any kind of access to gold. It also means that... Um, He's severely limited when it comes to access to elite technologies. Marine Lord's got a very robust eco. Farming going, fishing going, trade going. I just don't see this being a thing for Puppy Paw. Yeah, all right. Well, slowly and steadily, th those numbers will fall here. The crossbows ting off towards the, uh, the palace guards. And this is a, a good little decent trade here for him. I'm curious to see what kind of unit comp Marine Lord looks to play into. At the moment, it's still just going to be palace guards. I'm curious whether we see hand cannoneers coming out for either of these players. I think for Puppy Paw, it's probably a little bit too much to ask at this stage of the game. Maybe until he reaches max and then has a little bit of gold spare. But yeah, this is this is not an easy position for him to hold. He's going to look to go into Springles to try and deal with these trebs. Up to four trebuchets now, so quite a decent amount of damage that's coming through. Bleeding a lot here. His population is still abysmal, to be honest. 127 at this stage. Marine Lord is now banking up resources because he's Bobcat. I feel like I really don't know what Puppy Paw could do to turn this around, I feel. I think it's just a matter of time. 
Uh, Marine Lord is slowly sieging down the Barkshire Palace once that's gone. Uh, the farming eco is going to be wide open for raiding. Beautiful wall is from the Nest of Bees as well. Puppy Paw simply cannot break out of this base. Yeah, and this is the trouble that you have against Palace Guards. The Springald needs to move forward to take out the Nest of Bees and the Trebs, but it can't because the crossbows are having to to move back to deal with the Palace Guards. And then the Palace Guards are just going to have an open slate to take out all of those those Springles when they move forward, and that is just going to be so difficult to hold. With the Berkshire going down, we may see England fall. The ball looks to hold on a little bit longer. Nesta B is going to get taken out. The Men at Arms Village is getting pulled. He's bringing absolutely everyone to the fore. He said, you know what? We lost the Berkshire, but we did not lose our will. Lidicor, we will take you down today. Oh, man, that feels sad over there. Sacrificing uh, everything at this point, Puppy Paul does. Villagers do get butchered here. He's down to just 90 population. He knows that this is over, and Marine Lord is back in this set. Takes game number two, makes this set one apiece. You could really feel Puppy Paul at the end there was waiting for a Marine Lord disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just didn't come through for him, uh, unfortunately. Well played by Marine Lord. And I think, look, that's just that's just it when you're up against one of the best in the world. Like, if if this was up against, say, somebody who was a top 10, then there was a good chance that Puppy Paw could have held do doing what he did. But Marine Lord knew exactly what he needed to do, how to put on pressure, when to put on pressure. He did it perfectly. So well played to Marine Lord. Great game. Yeah, a lot comes down to that water being seized. Um, that was probably the final nail in the coffin for Puppy. But you can actually see that basically ever since uh, the two players hit Feudal Age, the eco escalation from uh, Marine Lord was just a lot more rapid. And uh, his opponent, Puppy Paw, was never able to catch up to that eco prowess. Ultimately resulted in the snowballing of the water and then later on just the snowballing of the entire game. Yeah, yeah, a lot of snowballs. All right. Well, that that was that was a that was a damn good game. I'm I'm curious, KP. What did you think about that game? Because that was uh, that was good fun. Oh, boys, I'm I'm starting to get the feeling that like English right now in competitive is like post Brexit England. It's pretty depressing <laughs> to look at at this stage. Still remaining under a 30 percent win rate. I think they're now down to like a 25 percent win rate in the entire tournament. We're well over 20 games, trending towards 30 games in total play. But let's dissect it on war maps uh, here. Lidical, you know. English used to feel like one of the best picks for Holy Island, but I'm not sure if it's just the state of the Civ or the fact that Zhuji, Japanese, all these new Civs are thriving on that map. But something has to change here, right? Like, I'm kind of surprised with the way that this has been going because going to this tournament, I talked to a few players and a lot of them thought that English would be A tier or S tier for a lot of these games. I think one of the issues that you'd run into playing English on a map like Holy Island is that you have one build that's extremely powerful, but extremely predictable as well. Everybody knows that it's going to be fishing into longbows, and we've seen that uh, come into play in this game. Marine Lord opened with a stable, knew fully well that the, um, that the longbows are coming, and Poppy Paw can consider himself lucky that he could even finish that tower. Um, in fact, he wasn't even supposed to do that. It was a complete cleanup right at the beginning, and uh, Marine Lord just had the upper hand from that point onwards. So I feel like part of this is new civilizations also being very powerful on some of these maps, but it's also the fact that um, English is almost a one-trick pony in many of these maps. Not just hybrid maps, but also land maps even. We all know what the English will do when you face them. Yeah, I feel like at this point, you know, I used to call uh, the Byzantines discount English. Now I think the English are just discount Byzantines. It feels a bit rough. But you know, the, the interesting thing as well, Drongo, is I feel like we're seeing a, a meta switch on Holy Islands in particular. Is we're seeing a lot of Japanese and Juji dominating. It seems like there's a bigger focus on using naval aerosolites right now and just focusing more on your raw eco and losing it and rescaling it, right? And, we have to remember English, that's not where their advantage lies, right? It's all about scaling one big force to punch through. And I think that's where we've seen a meta switch where it's about attritional damage into an eventual demo ship pump. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how the meta has developed because back in the day, it was 100% all in on water, maybe one or two units towards the gold and maybe a little bit of defense, but it was just all focused towards units. But I, I like the way that we have seen those naval arrowslits come through because it does mean when the naval when the naval arrowslits come through, it basically just shuts you down. There's nothing you can really do up against that, and that subsequently buys time for Castle Age or for Booming or whatever there is. But yeah, it was it was very well played uh, coming out from Marine Lord. Let's see if he can actually do as well in this next game because yes. Puppy Paw has got his favorite civilization 
the Byzantine. Insanely great performance out of him. I think he hasn't dropped a single game so far. If you're wondering why we didn't talk about game number one, all I can say about that is maybe if Marine Lord had Surfshark, this connection would have been more secure. Get to it, boys. Game number three. Even up, Delhi versus Byzantines. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game number three. What a pleasure to have your company today because this one is going to be good. I don't know about you, Lydical, but I have been looking forward to seeing Puppy Paws Byzantines all damn night. And now we get to see them in action. Ladies and gentlemen, in the north of the map, playing in the color blue on the Byzantines. It's Puppy Paw. And on the other side, Marine Lord in command of the Delhi Sultanate in pink. Here we are on Lipany, a map where... Delhi is one of the most classic civilizations to play, and I guess uh, Byzantines is the new kid on the block, but as much as civilizations like the Abbasids and the Delhi love to play on this map because of all these berries available, so do the Byzantines. Plentiful amounts of berries available all out there for you to get a lot of olive oil. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, you know. It, I'm I'm kind of glad that they added the uh, this map back to the uh, the rank map pool because Lipany, well, it's just known for its berries, right? Like that, you think of Lipany, you think Delhi, you think Ab Abbasid, uh, and now you think Byzantines, and that is exciting because uh, I'm a big fan of this civilization. It's one of those civilizations, and I know that this gets talked about a lot, but with the Byzantines, even at the Conqueror three level, it's still not a good civ. It's not actually until you get to the Conqueror four level that it becomes a decent civilization. There are so many different complexities to this sieve that you need to master to actually be competent with it at this top level. Uh, and so naturally, that's why we only see players that are quite literally the best in the world being good at it. Uh, so we are going to see a masterclass today. I'm looking forward to it. How do you reckon it's going to go down? What do you what do you think is going to happen here? Are we going to have a puppy paw win? Is he going to be able to take the lead back? Or are we going to see Marine Lord look to come one up in this series? I love the Byzantines in this matchup. I think the word I want to use on Byzantines is versatility. It allows you to field a very diverse army through the mercenary mechanics. And I think that's something that the Delhi could struggle against a little bit. Particularly, Javelin Throwers is an interesting addition here for Puppy Paw, kind of to respond to an archer heavy build that we often see from the Delhi. And Marine Lord is aging up with the Tower of Victory, so. His ultimate goal is going to be the use of uh, archers in this game. I just feel like um, when you do that against Byzantines that have javelin throwers, uh, that's a scary setup. And Papipa is going to play into the binary over here. So a lot of oil, olive oil on the horizon for him. Yeah, this this is an interesting start. So a little bit of a slower start that we're going to see from Puppy Paw here. Normally what we can see if you want to go for an explosive start with the Byzantines is starting by uh, taking all of your berries, well not all of them, but you know about three to four bushes, get gets you enough for those javelin or those longbows, and then from there you're able to leverage that into early aggression. But that's not the route he's going to take. Instead going to opt for a different route, going to be looking to keep that Grand Winery back on the berries. He's going to be able to leverage that into a whole bunch of olive oil and you reckon he's going to go for the Javelin Throwers. I think that's a pretty smart choice in this matchup. Lamette and I together with the Javelin Throwers, they're incredible. So, as much as we talked about this um, in regards to the previous game, about English being potentially a predictable civilization, same goes for Delhi over here. And the other concern that Marine Lord is facing here is that all three of those sacred sites are extremely open. Usually when you have so many cliffs on Lipane like this, you at least have one or two sacred sites that are fairly well defendable, but that's not really going to be the case here for Marine Lord, meaning that he's going to have to fight tooth and nail to secure and hold these sacred sites. Yeah. One of the other things I want to talk about, so we've got the early wheelbarrow coming through, but have a look at Puppy Paw's base. This is no ordinary beginning. We have got ourselves a triple olive grove opening before the five minute mark. This is kind of wild, right? This is reminiscent to, say, an English opening where we see farms coming down. This is kind of wild and not something that I've seen before. Normally, we've, we've known the Byzantines as a super aggressive, or at least I know the Byzantines as a super aggressive civilization in the, in the current patch just because of their explosive ability to get out of the block so quickly, but not going to happen here. It's just going to be a focus on economy. Probably just going to be sticking it to one base for now. Uh, no villages on stone, so definitely not going to be thinking about a second town center, at least at the moment. But we do have our first production building coming out. It's going to be a barracks for Puppy Paw. 
one thing to keep in mind is that if you play very condensed with the Byzantines and go heavy on the cisterns, you can get yourself an extremely robust economy. And I'm actually wondering if this build is going to end up being a semi-fast castle approach. Uh, when this civilization was released, one of the coolest builds I've seen was a winery fast castle. And the cool thing about that is that um, you can get your heavy cavalry out once you get to castle age, you can start securing relics. And that heavy cavalry is extremely useful when it comes to raiding, especially when you use their own healing ability that you get your, from your castle age landmark. Yeah, that's, that's a big factor. Um, let's let's take a look here at Marine Lord's base because we we've got archery range that's up here. Interestingly, it doesn't go for the racks early on, so we're going to be bringing out decent archer numbers. You mentioned before that all three of these sacred sites are open. I'm curious to see whether we have walls coming in because with puppy Paul going for the walls already on the bottom side, that's almost telling me like, hey, I'm not that interested in contesting your bottom sacred sites. Like I'll contest the middle, I might contest the top, but the bottom one, it's a bit too far away. It's a bit too close to you. I don't know what he's thinking, but. Yeah, maybe, maybe he's just trying to keep the enemy out. Maybe that could be it. Yeah, Papipo is going to play Limitani for the time being. Mercenary House is on the way as well. Now, one big difference between the Limitani and Ordinary Spearmen is that as long as they are in Shield Wall, archers take a long time to kill them. So the mechanics of a Spearman um, Javelin Thrower battle against something like Gazi Raiders and Archers is fundamentally different from what you usually see because the archers take a lot more time to take out all these Spearman-style units. And that's exactly it. Moving forward, though, have a look at this. We do have Javelin throwers on the way, so Puppy Paul going to be looking to move into the Javelins, as you suspected would be the case. Lament 9 numbers are right, uh, raising. Uh, they're rising, I guess I guess technically both of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, up to six now. Javelin throwers. it's going to take a while to get them out. Keep in mind, the mercenaries take a really long time to train. Normally about, what is it, like a minute and five to a minute and 20 seconds or something silly like that. Obviously, it comes down with your systems. They've been, they've been balanced as such, but uh, yeah, you can you can really notice how long it takes. So he's going to want these javelins out soon. And I'll be honest, I actually like this play from him. It, it really makes sense to be going into the um, Grand Winery in this situation rather than going into the Hippodrome. Just because you're probably going to want a lot of javelins out this game. And this is further supported by the fact he's gone into that triple... Uh, Olive Grove opening. Yeah, to be fair, um, what you do here with the Limitani and uh, the Javelins is actually very reminiscent of the classic uh, Mali and Donso plus Javelin yep. build. I also love how Marine Lord postured in front of the enemy base, though, because up until this point, Puppy Paul wasn't able to mine stone, so he was uh, kind of stuck with that tier 2 level of the cisterns. Now that he's able to access stone, He's going to start getting tier 3 and tier 4 up, and that's where things could get a little dicey for Marine Lord. But Marine Lord is leveraging the fact that his opponent has been a lot more defensive than what you often see from the Byzantines. And I love how Marine Lord is walling off some of the sacred sites. It's an, it's an extremely underappreciated element of Delhi gameplay. Makes it much more difficult for Puppy Paw to decap these. Yeah, what's going on towards the, the top side? It looks like we've got a couple of units that are up here. The Scholar will be forced off, but I got to agree. I I really dislike it when people don't wall sacred sites. It's just such an easy thing to do as the deli, and there's really no excuse, right? Like, you don't even need to send villagers out there to do it. Your infantry can do it for you. You just send a spearman out over to the corner, and look at this. A, a single archer. Just go and wall that sacred site. Just leave it, and it'll it'll just be up by itself. Now, yeah, you might lose it, but hey, it's, it's about getting that up, because once it's up, then you've got that safety net. You can afford to loot leave it a little bit you can make sure that your units get down there in time and that sacred site will be secure but now the numbers uh, puppy the is about to lose be... his scout and this map has a lot of stealth forests so losing that scout is going to deprive him of vision indeed scout goes down so puppy Paw is going to struggle seeing into those stealth forests yeah that will be tough and keep in mind he doesn't actually have a stable out so He's not going to want to make it from the town center, so he might have to throw down the stable to get it up. You really want to get that scout out immediately after losing the, the, the first one. It's really key to try and keep that bad boy alive. Uh, eight javelin throwers are out now. He's going to continue building more and more javelins here. There's no way about it. We've seen players do this before. I remember watching a game with Beastie, where I think he went up to like 30 to 40 javelins in the feudal age, which is kind of wild when you think about it, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, Have a look at the he's, income per minute as well for Puppy Paw when it comes to his olive oil. He's got 400 olive oil a minute coming through. 
Um, what's more important is that he's got 270 gold per minute without making any gold units. So this is a clear indication that he wants to go into Castle Age. In fact, he actually has too much food income at this point. He needs to wait a little for the gold to accumulate. But the units that he's making, the javelin throwers, those will cost him olive oil. So unless he keeps making Limitani, he is just going to be able to accumulate the food and gold he needs to get to Castle Age. And uh, he could have a very good Castle Age timing over here. He could be up to Castle in like a minute and a half. Yeah, definitely. Then once he gets to Castle, he's, he's basically doesn't quite have the printer, but uh, he's, he's got some decent numbers that'll come out. And look at this, once again, going to be forcing his opponent off the sacred site, preventing that timer from coming through. And I think that's what's really important. As long as he's maintaining that open window where he's not being locked into denying these sacred sites, he's going to feel really good. Just because it, as the Byzantines, it, it's just a numbers game. Once you get late game, it, it just feels incredible playing the Byzantines in, into the, you know, the, the mid castle. Oh my lord, there's nothing like the Byzantine explosion in the mid castle age when all all your farms are online or you're just pumping out from berries. But uh, at, at this stage, the Golden Horn Tower will be coming up here at 11 minutes and 11 seconds. It's going to have access to the javelin throwers. Already up to 12, so some good numbers. Yeah. The concern for Marine Lord is that he doesn't have anything that deals with this composition. He only has seven Gauzy Raiders to kill the Javelin Throwers. But what's more important is that with Shield War, these Limitani will survive long enough for um, for them to hold these Gauzy Raiders as hostage. And the Javelin Throwers can just pick up Art the Archers. Uh, so as much as Marine Lord has three Sacred Sites, Right now, he doesn't have anything that can beat the army of Poppy. So he himself is going to go up to Castle Age, and I feel like that's where things could get interesting for him. Men at Arms would be a welcome addition to this composition, but we also shouldn't forget the fact that it takes a long time for him to get his upgrades. So this opens up a pretty substantial window here for Poppy Paul. All right, Compound of the Defender going to be coming up here for Marine Lord. He did put the House of Learning down for a split second, but cancelled it. Uh, so I, I did get excited for a little bit in there. But uh, the age ups now come through. He's going to start getting out the javelins. Now keep in mind, he will be looking for the veterancy contract. It should come through pretty quickly. There it is now. I expect to see Lamette and I upgrade coming through shortly. Uh, but there's definitely a nice little window here for the Byzantines to push and push with veteran units while they wait for the Delhi Sultanate to get their upgrades through. And initially, it's just going to be the Javelins that have got the upgrade, but he's got the resources now to get the upgrade for the Lament and I as well. Only 16 wood, though, so it might take a little bit of time here. But uh, he can also move into Varangian Guard in the meantime, which will... Yeah, Varangians would be really good here, although he's facing some Gazi Raiders, but it's not like we have a lot of Gazi Raiders here. Crossbow's now coming in, though. Interesting choice here by Marine Lord. Maybe he is expecting um, some Varangians over here, because... Guess what? Crossbows don't counter anything that Puppy Paul has right now. And I guess he's right, because Varangians are on the way for Puppy. Yeah, the first one is now in queue. But keep in mind, with the Javelin Throwers on the field, these guys do very well against Crossbows, because Crossbows typically like to sit at the back and, and tee off on those Varangian Guards, while the Javelin Throwers have got a longer range, and they absolutely love dealing out that damage against the Crossbows. A little bit more health on the Crossbows as well, but now looking to pick off the Imam as it returns back to base, or the Scholar rather, as it returns back to base. It's got a little bit more health on it because of the Delhi bonus that you've got. Obviously, you get all your free technologies, and one of them is going to be that extra health for your Scholars. But now looking Our to pick up that... are so far from Marine Lord. Yeah, um, yeah, look at he them. He only had a handful of uh, Scholars to work with, and he sent them all out for the Relics. So decks are basically nowhere close to being completed. This is a Feudal Age army against a much superior Castle Age composition. And you see... Um, Papi is actually destroying the production buildings, not to <laughs> halt production. He's actually looking for the veterancy upgrades to try yeah. and stall them out. Yeah, it's really, really cheeky. Veterancy upgrade now coming through as well for the Lamette and I here. Plus two ranged armor has also arrived. And remember with the shield wall, this is just going to stack up incredibly well. A couple of men at arms on the front going to help out here, but the... Have a look at this. Hold on. The Lament Knight numbers are falling pretty quickly through this fight. The Javelin Throwers are going to have to very quickly get on out of here. And oh. Did he forget to hit the Shield Wall button, or did, did the nerf really just hurt that much? The Limitani died way too quickly for my liking. I, I have a gut feeling that Shield Wall might not have been active for the whole fight. Uh, he's still going to be all right. This is not a good fight for him, and um, it's definitely an underwhelming engagement for a Cosslage player facing a full Feudal Edge army. 
Yeah, I, I was expecting it to go the other way. I didn't expect our Feudal Age army to do that well. But it looks like overall, the relic count will be in favor of Marine Lord. It's going to be at the very least three to two. Hold your horses. It could be a four to one because the Wallalol's attempt is going to come over here. Lament and I do manage to jump out of the Ring of Fire before the explosion lands by the looks of it. And now he needs to make sure that he stops that relic from being picked up and Marine Lord's just going to drop it. Definitely the right call here. Yeah, clock is ticking here for Puppy Paw, though. His opponent has three relics, still a sacred site, the one that has been walled in, still under his control. And the village fortresses are coming close here for Marine Lord. Blacksmith upgrades getting close to completion as well. So that window we talked about, it's slowly closing. But one thing that he hasn't yet shown is the 18, now 20 Warangians he has. And once he shows them, that's going to be a nasty surprise here for Marine Lord, as Puppy Boy yoinks the relic right in front of Marine Lord's army. Go, archers, go. Look at them. They're trying the hardest to focus it down. Men at Arms also running up. A little bit of a raid towards that top side as well as the relic gets dropped on the ground. Now, keep in mind, this relic is very quickly going to get picked up. Akratoid Defenses comes in for the villagers at home. Ghazi Raiders go down. But I think more importantly, he's actually spotted out the Varangian Guards. But speaking of Varangian Guards, have a look at this. We've got action all over the map. Relic is probably going to be going in favor of Marine Lord, at least at this stage. Unless we can get some Varangian Guard over here. But uh, village account, Puppy Paws managed to deny two villagers on this map of their lives. So it's slowly turning in favor of him. Now keep in mind, he's also got the big olive groves. Uh, I think he's almost 100% uh, encapsulated his own grand winery at home with olive groves. So that is an important thing to note because he's pumping. Oh yeah, when you make a farm transition, you're always very vulnerable. So if he has a full olive grove based economy, it means that he has sustainability in terms of the food income, whereas Beast, or Beast, uh, whereas Marine Lord is uh, still relying on the berries, he's still relying on the hunt. So at some point, he's going to have to make that farm transition. Now, Village Fortresses will complete for him, but he doesn't have a single keep to use as a town center just yet. So um, the relevance of that technology is only going to come into play a little later. Yeah, this could very much be troublesome for him. The Varankian guard numbers in particular are significant. When, when you said, you know, when Puppy Paw shows his 20 Varangian guards that he's been hiding, I was like, 20 Varangian guards just hiding them? Like, that's absolutely insane, the amount of numbers that you've got there. And, like, we could look at Marine Lord. He's got 11 crossbows now, but still 27 Varangian guards. Like, you just chuck all those bad boys in uh, in, in the... Uh, what, what, what's the mode called? Sorry, Little Core. It's, uh, it's 5.37 in the morning here. I've forgotten the term. <laughs> the berserking. You berserk those bad boys on top of the... the uh, crossbows and it's not even going to be close uh, and puppy paw has the relic he actually managed to get the second relic which is i think a big accomplishment all three sacred sites decapped he's going to be two relics against uh, marine lords three and now he's breaking into the ma base marine lord is uh, holding his forces off for the time being but this is a scary composition 34 varangias 36 javelin throwers this is no pushover and uh puppy paw is looking for eco damage here yeah he wants villages that you can feel it right now the Varangian guards, they're, they're hunting and they've spotted out a couple of villages. They're going to be gold gathering villages towards that top side of the base. He's not going to be opting for it. Instead, looks like he's going to try and focus down this front line. Varangian guards moving forward. No berserking through just yet. He's going to be tanking up. Remember, he's got a little bit of extra. Oh, timing, the mango timing is absolutely immaculate. Big damage coming through. Oh, that was absolutely perfect timing. Marine Lord wouldn't have had it any other way. A second earlier, Varangian guards would have eaten them alive. A second later, and he would have missed the shot. But unfortunately for Puppy Paw, he heads away from the Marine Lord base with his tail between his legs, his head in his hands. And unfortunately, not a real lot of damage done here, except for this house. Yeah, he managed to idle a lot of villagers here from Marine Lord, so there was definitely some damage done. But as you said, masterful defense there from Marine Lord. Timing was great. He landed two beautiful shots on those javelin throwers. So at the end of the day, Puppy Paw's army is rather battered at this point. And the longer this game goes, the more benefit you get from those keeps for Marine Lord. Eco count is neck and neck now. Upgrades are in for him too. So this defense instrumental for uh, establishing him for the later portions of the game. I still feel like Puppy Paw's position is still really, really good. Uh, he has most of the map under his control. He could still deny a lot of resources from Marine Lord, but Marine Lord had an impressive fight here. Yeah, so Puppy Paw's, as you mentioned, he, he's got good map control here. 
which is typically what you want as Delhi at this stage, right? Like you want all three sacred sites. You don't always have them. Like maybe you've got two, um, but you definitely want map controls because that's where you're putting down keeps. And we can see right now that Marine Lord's keeps are defensive. He's got, so far from what I've seen, just the one keep. I wouldn't be surprised if a second one has popped up while we've been talking, but his village account will start to move upward. Um, and just keep in mind that the Byzantines, they really feel like a civilization that you can actually play on one TC the entire game. It's a bit of a weird civ like that, but just because of the extra income that you've got because of the olive groves, it just really feels like you don't notice not having a second TC up against civs that do have more than one, in this case, the Delhi Solnit. Yeah, and let's not forget, Poppy Paul has farms. Um, oh, look at the Varangians hiding in the stealth forest. Marine Lord must have missed them. I think he was chasing them with his army. Now he's swinging to the right side, seeing the javelin throwers, but those Varangians are creeping on the left. Probably waiting for villagers to move out towards that one last berry patch. Yeah, yeah I think that that's exactly what it's going to be. But now those numbers are starting to go. Look at the size of the army here for Puppy Paw. 84 with 6 siege compared to the 64 of Marine Lord. So quite a bit of difference between the two. He's also got the Springled out to deal with the Manganel threat. He's got a very tight combo here, so he needs to be careful about moving in through choke points. Marine Lord doesn't have a lot of safe resources to work with, so as you see, these villagers are soon very much exposed to aggression. And once again, Puppy is going to dive deep here. He's got two Spring Olds against one, and a Hero Siphon is also going to be on the way. Varangians could swing in from the north as well, far left side of the minimap. You can actually see a second group they of Varangians in. moving in. Could actually jump all of these Manganols. Yeah, we could see them berserking on their way through. Let's have a look at, and see. They're in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, pitcher in pitcher. Mango gets taken out by the Springles. Does a wonderful job there. He's going to look to try and focus down villages. There they go. Coming from behind. Oh, my God, Lidacro, it's beautiful. Look at that. Javelin's now teeing off. It's gonna, he's going to be able to take out villages here as well as the crossbows. Puppy Paw looking incredible on his Byzantines inside the base of Marine Lord. Clinching game number three is going to be the question. Will he be able to find it here? Camel's cleaning up as well. And Marine Lord, I feel like he's got no answer to this. Sure, he's throwing up keeps all over the map, but at the end of the day, if you've got no response to these Javelins, you've got no response to these Varangian, how are you going to possibly do it? Village account still somewhat in favor of Marine Lord. He's lost a couple this fight, that's for sure. But once again, Marine Lord holds. It's a little deceiving though, Ozzy, because these javelin throwers, they just don't work well against uh, against all those men at arms. But there's a second wave of Varangians on the way. 25 of them out there. Villagers now idle. Hero Siphon taking down the keep. And this is where things get dicey. The second wave is what, Mar what Marine Lord could struggle against. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, they, it seems to build up so damn quickly. You just, you don't even realize. I, I'm also going to remark how well Puppy Paw is doing with regard to spending his uh, olive oil. I always, always forget to um, spend my olive oil, especially around this time in the game. I'm probably sitting sitting here with like 3,000 olive oil. Like, oh damn, I forgot about that. But I've never seen it above like 600 until right now. All right, well, slowly. A single Hero Siphon takes a long time to take out this keep, and now there he is really a Mangano does. for Marine Lord. But he does have a little bit of extra space here because of the Hero Siphon, but shot comes a little bit short there. Springwood in place, but now arriving as well on the keep. Mango going to land on the Hero Siphon. Okay. We do see the Springwood rolling through. There's a raid to the south as well. I think a couple of Varangians made their way into the enemy eco. Oh, look at, look at the keep taking down the, the spring on how quick that was. He baited it in with the mango at the back. Uh, how much health have we got on this on this keep? It's still sitting at about 50, 60%. Yeah, he's going to have to head back to the drawing board. Definitely not enough damage to get through this, but have a look at this. Six workers already taken down in this raid. He is moving forward with those Varangian Guard and Puppy Paw doing his best to try and keep Marine Lord in line with his economic expectations. Yeah, Marine Lord is very much spread out, and Puppy Paw is not really exploiting that. You see all these little pocket ecos to the south from Marine Lord, but there is minimal pressure being um, sent towards that. Sure enough, some of these are protected by keeps, but you see this pack of villagers, for instance, completely undefended. I think there is a lot of raiding potential that Puppy Paw is missing out on right now. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. But it can be so difficult playing up against the Delhi Sultanate because you just never know where there's going to be a keep. It can be difficult spotting out exactly where they are. But uh, meanwhile, 
over on the side of Marine Lord, we start to see Court Architects coming through. That's how long he's been researching these technologies. Court Architects is on the way. He does have 11 Scholars out, though, so not doing too bad, but keep in mind, uh, Puppy Paw is sitting on 60-plus population military at the moment, whereas Marine Lord, he's on 44, but 11 of that is Scholars. So realistically, it's about half of what Puppy Paw is currently sitting on. Yeah, the army value at the bottom left is not going to tell you the full story because it doesn't actually include those javelin throwers. But yeah, it's yeah I think the marked. big takeaway don't, don't is that it. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, big takeaway is that those colors can help with combat healing, but it's not going to be enough when you have barely any units that can dish out damage. It's basically just crossbows, not even a single frontline unit available for Marine Lord. Those crossbows will get decimated by the javelin throwers, and then there is not much left for Marine Lord. I still think that Puppy Paw is a little too slow with this push, and I think he needs to be a little bit more um, aggressive and kind of trying to stretch out the field. But I'm still not very convinced about Marine Lord's unit's composition. Yeah, I, I feel like it's a bit of a tough spot, man. What do you even play against this? Like, Jaffel Pro, Varangian Guard? I guess Crossbow makes sense, but... The javelin throwers? So may maybe like Mang... Oh, I, I really don't know. Manganil Men at Arms? Maybe? Is that the play? Yeah, I, I think so. Varangians aren't going to be good against the men at arms. Uh, in fact, javelin throwers aren't good against the men at arms. So, um, men at arms is going to be your front line unit, and maybe you support that with crossbows and manganals. Um, an alternative, an interesting alternative for Marine Lord would be horsemen, or dare I say, lancers, trying to just start raiding. Because one thing that Puppy Paul does not have is mobility. So, cavalry raids from Marine Lord could easily stall this game out and buy a lot of time for him. You say that, but then he also has Lamette and I that have got teardrop shields with which give the extra movement speed, and then together with the charge, they can be pretty oh, well, quick. He's those got little guys. Zero of them on the field right now. That's a good point. I hadn't considered that, little court. Well played. <laughs> but have a look at the snipes on the Springles. Oh, those javelin throwers—they are so cheeky. They've got a lot of damage against those Springles. Oh, oh, I like that village. Oh, I, I, I just want to. I, I just want to thank our observer right now for noticing that because anytime we get like a, something crazy like that, I just love it. I, I was I casted this one game with Beastie up against Averly, and there were fire lances that were just going ham inside Averly's base, and I lost my shit, man. Whenever the game bugs like that, it's just beautiful. You know, want to know want to know what else is beautiful? For an engineering company, yeah, being damn, built in the middle is. of freaking map in the style forest. Now, Marine Lord was also thinking about Imperial here, but. Remember, Delhi take time mm -hmm. to get their upgrades. Marine Lord knows that he's actually pumping out scholars like a madman. He's going to be up to 18 of them. But still, there is going to be a timing difference over here, especially because Marine Lord is yet to start getting his landmark up. Yeah, yeah you're not wrong. Uh, all right, well, the Hisar Academy has now been thrown down, 28 vils on it, and immediately we see a Royal Cannon coming through here for Puppy Paw. Uh, and expect to see elite upgrades on the way. So we've got Lament Knight upgrade coming through. Roller shutter triggers as well, which is going to guarantee the siege war. And will we see the elite contracts coming through? Oh, no, that's, sorry. That's elite Varangian guards. I apologize. Not elite Lament Knight. Of course. It, it, why would it be Lament Knight? We've got none on the field, Drongo, you silly billy. And we've also got ferocious speed. Yeah, one thing to consider here is that Marine Lord gets the biggest value of the game for the Delhi from the Imperial Age techs. Those are expensive technologies, all coming for free for him. Take some time to research, but especially with that many scholars, it's not going to be a very long time until he has those. The other thing I looked at, Drongo, just for a brief moment, and you can actually see that at the top of the screen, is the eco distribution. Puppy Paw has 16 villagers on food. That is far from something I would call a consistent food eco. Yeah, you're not wrong. The transition, I mean, you've got 87 villagers on the field right now and only 16 on food. Where are they all? I guess they're, ga they're gathering up gold. I can see that. We've got 36 on gold at the moment. But yeah, it definitely feels like uh, the food economy isn't quite there yet for Pumpy Paw, which is impressive considering just how many units he's fielding. Bombard out now. Well, cannon rather. Royal cannon, in fact, uh, is, is now out. Going to be working down this keep on the front. And have a look at the upgrades that we've got in queue at the moment from Marine Lord. Now, keep in mind, these are the active upgrades. That means they're currently be, being researched. Not the upgrades that have been queued up. The ones that are researching right now. That is a ludicrous amount of upgrades that we've got. I think one thing that matters the most is the progress part. Many of those are close to completion. So, and once you have those, we are looking at a player that has almost every technology 
researched in the game, compared to Puppy Paw, and when you look at his eco upgrades, when you look at his blacksmith upgrades, they are far from impressive. Yeah, yeah, I, I gotta agree with you. It's definitely, it, this matchup in particular, it always seems to be a really good matchup. You know, we, I think we've seen it three times in the last two weeks, and it's, it's been incredible every single time. Uh, they, they just, they always seem to go the distance. But, uh, that's a lot of slowly, but still. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah 45 well, rank. One thing here. that's concerning for Marine Lord is that he's outnumbered in army very badly, and most yeah. of his army is actually scholars. He's got four yeah. crossbows, nine men at arms, and that's it. He, he actually has no army. He's got 126 vills and 23 scholars. That's 149 economic units. Now, granted, those guys are going to be doing some healing, but I don't think it's going to be enough. That is so many Varangian guards, Litacore. Oh, Litacore. I'm not even going to cast. I'm just going to watch in beauty as the Varangian guards eat everything alive. Look at these guys right now. They're like, they're just, they're just hungry. Hungry little guys that just want to eat. Elite crossbows has come through, though. Springle's moving up. Going to be able to take out the mango for any real damage is done. And I think that's it. I think that's all she wrote. How do you hold from here? I mean, I've said that yeah, like no four Springle's times this game. clutch for Puppy. Marine Lord barely got any value for the Mangonals, and without the Mangonals, his army was just lackluster. He's now queuing up a bunch of men at arms, still has a lot of crossbows, but he's losing the front of his base. And from the back line, these Royal Cannons are chipping away at those key buildings. The keeps are going down, the front of Marine Lord's base is getting annihilated. I think Puppy Paw has hit this timing perfectly, and uh, as crappy as his eco was a couple of moments ago, he had a terrifying army. And he was able to punish Marine Lord with this. Marine Lord still looking to rebuild that force, but while doing so, he's sacrificing a lot of real estate. Did he just go for landmarks here? I feel like landmarks might be the play. Perhaps. With Marine Lord just having so much mobility with regard to his economy, he's kind of everywhere, a little bit like a spider. Uh, I, I feel like just going for landmarks Where's might be the our play. Academy? Yeah, that's yeah, look, his our academy is the hardest one to reach. The other three is uh, easy take. They're all stacked together, yeah. All right, well, well, fire. Numbers? Crossbow numbers are still pretty good here for Marine Lord. Like, he's got 28 crossbows, and they don't really seem to have... He hasn't lost that many. I mean, we've got the Javelins now looking to focus them down. They're, they're getting up quite close and personal, so this could be it here. But the Bombards are working their magic on the back line. As long as they stay alive and chip away at the, the buildings here, he'll be fine. But keep in mind, he's still on one TC. That economy is just pumping a single TC at a time. Mango on the back. Once again, looking. We've been in this spot before. This time it's going to be in the Imperial right. Age as the manga now. Boom, baby. It's going to be a little bit short, though. Yeah, Marine Lord is back to 20 men at arms, and the Varangians are gone from the front line. These javelin throwers yeah. have to run all the way back here. Bobby Paul doesn't really have a unit that deals well or quickly with all these men at arms. He's done a lot of damage, but has he done enough? That's the question. He's still at 92 villagers only. Sure enough, he's got um, some relics, some sacred sites, the mercenaries available as well, but I'm not even sure if this keep is going up, Aussie. It looks like Lord Down may smile upon it. Men at arms, together with the mangoes, are working their magic. But uh, we, we're seeing a whole raft of things coming out here right now. Hank Kennedy is also going to be joining the field for Marine Lord. He is putting on an absolute display of defense. This is absolute insanity that we are witnessing here. How is he managing to stay alive every single time by the skin of his teeth? To me, it looks like it, for certain he's going to go the way of the Dodo. But unlike the Dodo, Look at the he population. does not give up. Look at the population, Aussie. Puppy is done. Oh he's running oh out God, of he's actually done. 30 population has to cancel the keep. And oh, oh my this God. could be a heartbreaking defeat here for Puppy. He's been assaulting his opponent's base for the last 15, 20 minutes. It looks like now he's the one crumbling. This is insane. How is this happening right here? You know, you know what's kind of crazy? I feel like maybe if Puppy Boar had gone for the third sacred site instead of going for the throat, it would have been a different outcome because he's just been fighting into the production of Marine Lord. So every fight that he takes, Marine Lord just replenishes his forces immediately. Whereas had he gone for the Sacred Sign, maybe played a little bit more longevity, perhaps he could have looked at a Sacred Victory. He's got Mangonel emplacements. He can easily bounce between two Sacred Sites. And now, I, I, I don't know how on earth he manages to hold this, but how did Marine Lord go from having 50 military, real, like genuine, bona fide, electrified, Populate, military population to suddenly like winning that fight because that, that was a huge army that Puppy Paw had. Was it Mango? I, I think shots a lot that of it comes down to hard counters. Uh, the crossbows pick off those Varangians, and those are expensive units for a player that doesn't have a very strong eco. 
At the same time, sure enough, Marine Lord lost a lot of crossbows, but Marine Lord's got a juggernaut economy right now. And I think you also have to look at the difference in the technology between these two players. Now, Marine Lord is 200 population, Puppy Paw still sitting at 150, and things are just looking very, very grim for Puppy Paw now. He's been on the offense for a long time, now he's going to become the defender very, very shortly. And I think the thing I'm still missing from Puppy Paw are raids. We haven't really seen him being able to do a lot of eco damage to Marine Lord. He's just now starting to mix in some of the horsemen. Yeah, I do agree. It's, it's one of the things that he's had difficulty with is, is finding a way through. But now we see how quickly the Varanian Guards dispatch yeah. of those men at arms. They've got the Berserking activated and they, they like three hit these. Maybe not three hit, like six hit the, uh, the men at arms, which is kind of wild. Yeah, he's only just using it now, yeah. Look at the damage! <laughs> 29 damage! Oh my lord, that's kind of crazy when you think about it, because you're up against, say, 9 armor or 8 armor, whatever it might be. You, you were really cutting through them. Yeah, but now he's facing uh, hand cannoneers on the opposing side. Mangonels as well to keep the javelin throwers at bay. Poppy Paw is slowly removing, but now he's got virtually no gold income. His eco is still extremely feeble. Starts to This whole situation starts to remind me to the previous game, where He's still alive, but for how long? Everything that he's doing right now is one step behind uh, the moves of Marine Lord. Yeah, and I, I think a big part of this is village account, right? Like, he's sitting yep. at 90 vills up against the 120. There's also the scholars in play, but then it's not as big. He's, I think he's actually deleted quite a few of them now. Um, but I feel like had Puppy Paw just added in the second TC at, you know, the 25 minute mark, he'd be 130 vills now. And it, it can be hard. Uh, adding in that second TC, especially when you've spent 36 minutes the entire game uh, not with a, a second TC. But now that that landmark's been scouted, this could be difficult for Puppy Paw uh, in defending this, because this is a big target, this landmark. I just want to add the fact that uh, this Stealth Forest is extremely important for both of these players. They don't really have good insight into a Stealth Forest without scouts, so you can hide your seat very well, and it looks like Bobby Paul thinks that he still has the quality advantage here when it comes to the army. He's driving in very aggressively, only to be met with a handful of hand and ears and some horsemen flanking from the north. But I guess he's back on track here, folks. He's once again getting an assault point through the middle. And just remember, these hand cannoneers are not your average bear. These are extra attack speed hand cannoneers from the Tower of Victory. So you got to give extra respect to these guys, especially as a Varangian guard because you just get so effectively countered. But uh, looks like the cleanup back towards the base of Puppy Paw has occurred. Nesta Bees, though! Oh my lord, look at the damage. He's got triple knobs out here. Not something that you typically like to see on a Sunday night, that is for sure, but... Slowly but steadily moving up here. Also starting to see a number of elite Yazi Raiders joining the field. More reinforcements coming into the back. Springles on both sides. Puppy Paw able to micro them out. Now we start to see the turns of the tides once again as the siege advantage is now really starting to sit with Puppy Paw. How many times yeah, have we have been in this position? have a lot of anti-cavalry uh, units, though. Nesta Bees are the anti-cavalry units that we need. Have a look at this. They are not focusing the hand cannoneers, though. Varangias are getting butchered by the hand cannoneers still. And once again, the population for Puppy Paw is dropping quicker than it does for, uh, for Marine Lord. Not a bad fight for Puppy Paw, but is it enough? And that, I think that has been the question that we've been asking throughout this game. A good fight, but is it enough? Yeah, and it's, you know, this is just one of those things where it's like, you know, we're against, you're against the best, one of the best players in the world, Marine Lord. Um, and if this was against anybody else, like a top 10 player, Puppy Paw would have rolled over the top of them like five different times here. The fact that it's Marine Lord though, it's just that methodical player who just very rarely makes mistakes. And he's just, I don't, I don't know how he does it. This guy's just on a, on a whole nother level right here. Uh, looks like we've got Grenadiers joining the battle. That, that's a Grenadier that I saw right there. So yep. welcome Grenadier. Marine Lord is starting to do the very thing that Puppy Paul was supposed to do long ago. I'm um, starting to build up cavalry and get some raids going. And remember, Puppy Paw's eco is fairly feeble, still just 90 villagers. So one good raid with these Ghazi Raiders can wipe out a significant portion of Puppy's eco. And I think that's what we need from Puppy. Um, he needs to get some horsemen going and exploit the fact that Marine Lord's eco is so stretched out. Yeah, yeah, I, I got to agree. Where does he target? Though? Probably that south side. And I think you almost got to 
Yeah, anywhere, yeah, that works as well. Um, but uh, interesting to note is that, you know, playing as the Byzantines, obviously when civilizations get to this stage, they're very resource hungry, right? Like they want their stone, they want their gold. But the Byzantines really don't care. Like they are quite happy just playing generally just like a, a wood food income. And, you know, oh, okay, I've got a little bit of olive oil, I'll get myself some more javelins. I've got, got wood, I'll get myself some more Lamette and I. And I'll mix in any Varangian guards that I can wherever I want. All of their siege, they're paying for with olive oil as well. Like, he, he really doesn't need gold. He's, in fact, he's got gold in the back of his base, which is still existent up there. We're 40 minutes into this game, and he, he's just casually gathering the gold. Yeah. He's got zero villagers on wood right now. He's got 60 on food. He fixed his food eco. But there's a big raid going on. Gauzy Raider is diving deep, and uh, Papi Paul doesn't have a lot back at home to defend against that. At the same time, yeah. it's only 20 hand cannoneers back at home for Marine Lord, so once again, Papi Paul could dive deep in here. Yeah, th this could be big for him here. Keep in mind, uh, what's the real threat, though? Because for, for Puppy Paul, the real threat is losing villagers. If he loses villagers, he's in a tough spot. For Marine Lord, like, what? He's, he's going to lose a little bit of yeah. production here? He's just going to rebuild it. He's fine. Exactly. He's got 100 villagers. V villagers. He's absolutely fine. Yeah, there's definitely a higher upside over here for Marine Lord, although Marine Lord himself is starting to lose some eco here down to 107. Are people barely losing villagers? He lost like 10 in that raid. He cleaned up the whole thing. And now look at the army count, Ozzy. He cleaned up the raid and now he's pushing with the nest of bees. Once again, Poppy is diving his opponent's base. This time around with 70 Limitani. Ah, uh, see, Lydico, I, I've, I've seen this before, right? It looks like he's gonna win. Don't buy it. I don't buy it. Not for a second. I've seen Marine Lord play this. He defends it every single time. I feel like a savant right now. Like I can just predict the future. Just when it looks like Puppy Paw's numbers are incredible, Marine Lord pulls a rabbit out of his hat. This guy's got so many rabbits in his hat, some people might yeah. think he's, he's actually running a pet store because this guy, it, it, where, Puppy do they, where, does, where does he get them from? Puppy Paw's eco is just so bad. He's got 80 wood per minute. What, what, what do you expect from an economy like that? That's the big problem for him. I, I feel like he's been taking some disadvantageous fights. He's diving in every single time, but he doesn't really have that potential to rebuild his army. And now, when you look at his numbers, sure enough, they look nice, but it's almost exclusive in the Mitani. He's facing men-at-arms and hand cannoneers. His army is being hard countered but by what Marine Lord has. I think Poppy Paul was just taking too many of these ineffective dives, mm -hmm. and he just wasn't able to punish Marine Lord's eco throughout the game. Yeah, I, I do agree. It, it did feel that way. Uh, especially with the Varangian guards, but I, I always felt every time the, the fight was happening that like, okay, surely Puppy Paw is going to win right here. Like, this is the one. It, it always looked that way, and somehow Marine Lord always managed to find a way to squeeze back a hold. And now, once again, the Lumet Knight will fall back here. Keep in mind the Nest of Bees are on the field. Double Springled coming out, though, from Marine Lord. Watch on the backside as he looks to fire down. We'll be able to take out that Nest of Bees slowly but steadily. Still hasn't actually focused it down. Oh my god, look at the Springles. Okay, he'll get the Nest of Bees. Don't worry. And the hand cannon is just continue kiting back here. With all the siege gone down, the Lament and I have got nothing worthy to defend. Where do they go from here? Oh, that, that keep isn't going up. Puppy is desperate for gold. He's got no workers on gold, no workers on wood. He needs that, but he's going to get denied. And I think this is the beginning of the end. Now his army gold composition in the top of his is... Base? It's just bad. He, he's still got a gold in the top of the base. I want to see how many, how many gold Ooh. points are left. Well... Ooh. Mm. Ooh. Why okay. are you going to bait me like that, Puppy Paw? 20, just take the 27. Like, what are you leaving it there for? I, it might be a bait. If Marine Lord doesn't know how much gold there is still there, all that he sees is that Puppy Paw still has gold inside the space. It's just theory crafting, but maybe Puppy Paw is trying to paint the picture that he still has uh, some gold left to work with, and he's not so desperate for gold as he actually is. 27 gold, man. That's like half the Varangian guard. Come on, get it together, Puppy Paw. He's down to two gold, 80 wood, 123 food, 40. Like this, he, he's floating less than 250 resources right now, the poor guy. Meanwhile, Marine Lord, um, he, he's saving up for a famine just in case it happens. Uh, I don't this think it's going to This is going to be happen. the last hurrah. You reckon? This could you be a dive for the um, landmarks at this point. I don't know if Marine Lord prepared the landmarks. I don't know. Yeah, 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 it is. Look, the vills are coming. The vills are coming. This is it. This is it. Yeah, he's pulling them. He's yep, pulling yep, the boys, yep. and Marine Lord is actually mispositioned. Now, uh, did Marine Lord repair the landmarks? If those are damaged or destroyed, there is only one or two to snipe. 
All right. Does he know where all the landmarks are as well? See, this is one of those things that we, I'm not sure if we know. He, he did have a few units that were diving oh, in DC. there. Oh, no. Look at the PC. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, this no. Could, this, he could do this. Oh, he can 100% do this. Oh, he my knows God, where all the landmarks are. Oh my lord, Linicor, hold my hand. It's actually <laughs> happening right now. We are seeing it. He's going to pull Vils. He's going to look for the repair. Will he be able to out repair the damage that's coming through? Not all of them are here, but Grens are going to help out on the backside. A little bit of Chinese. I, I think this is a good game. I think this is it. There, there's way too many units here. I think this. I think he's done it. Can we check in over on that, that uh, west Rino side? Is just pulling to... all his Vils to repair. Oh my lord, is if that okay? Th th I think this is game. I think that's it. I think Puppy Paul just did it, ladies and gentlemen. Game number three is going to be going over. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still hesitant to call it. I've seen this one before, that's Lidicor. It. That has There's to no be way. It. There's no way. There is no way. Puppy Paul pulls off a landmark snipe after 40 minutes of non stop pushing. Lidicor, can you believe this guy? Unbelievable. I don't know what to say, Ozzy. This has been the craziest game I've seen for a long, long time. All these failed assaults from Puppy Paul, he pulls an absolute Hail Mary. And Marine Lord, he had some of those landmarks heavily damaged from previous assault. Puppy Paul dives in. Marine Lord wanted to finish the game by attacking, but his army wasn't back at home to defend. And boy, oh boy, is this a massive boost for Puppy Paul. This looked like oh. a sad game for him. He looked so powerful, but he wasn't able to finish for so, so long. It started to seem like a desperation game for him, a complete morale destruction. And now he pulls off this miracle. He has to feel extremely excited going into game number three. Yeah, that, that's going to give him a huge uplift going in, in, into the next game. I tell you what, you know, taking the lead back like that, he already started up 1-0. But it was a disconnect, so it kind of, you know, it, it, you're up 1-0, but are you really up 1-0 fr from that motivation perspective? Now, 100%. He is up one game. We're going into game number four. We got, we got plenty more action tonight, but he is pumped. He's ready to go. Oh, man, this is, this is going to get good. I can't oh, believe that we are watching this right now, Lytical. This is crazy. And the small details that these, got, these games come down to, this was so close to a Marine Lord game, and Puppy Paw turns this around. And now he's the one heading um, into game number four with a game advantage. Uh, I think this is a perfect time to ask what Killer Pigeon has to say about this, because I'm sure that he's full of thoughts about this absolute madness of a game. Well, uh, yes, I actually, uh, you know, that was a very interesting game, a, a complete... 180 to what we saw actually out of Puppy Paul yesterday. In fact, I did prepare a bunch of notes. I wanted to run through um, his build order, the details involved. But then that happened. So it's absolutely pointless. It's out the window. It doesn't matter anymore because Puppy Paul turns it around in the most wild of ways. Let's dissect that game, folks. There's a lot of things going on here. For a start, Puppy Paul is off to a fantastic beginning when he kicks up into the Fast Castle. It forces Marine Lord off to a comfortable phase in the game. Compound of the Defender doesn't feel good when you're under 50 villagers. You're looking to be at 60, 70, so you can scale quickly into the keeps and take control of the map. That simply wasn't there. So Puppy Paul, mwah, chef's kiss, already looks like an improvement from the Beastie series yesterday. But then, after forcing this reactionary situation where you haven't got the scholars, you haven't got the stone, you haven't got the muxy to be Delhi at their best, we get this wild Varangian spam that feels a little bit too familiar from yesterday. And we all know how that one ended between BC and Puppy Paw. That was the one where BC was able to cinch your winner. And we saw similar issues here again. Puppy Paw, a miraculous win towards the end, but we'll get to that. That mid game was absolutely wild. What we saw is a man ramming his head against a brick wall that is the daily defense strategy and being relentless in it. The interesting part is Puppy Paul started to look clean when he raided to the north side. But as this went on, you may have noticed that south side was completely uncontested. That's what gave Marine Lord this second life to stay in this game. And while eventually keeps her in that area, they weren't an earlier point. I'm wondering, as we move further forward in the series, is this something that Marine Lord is gonna notice? Because Puppy Paw is proving to be quite a relentless force. He's not as much a puppy as he is a fully grown Rottweiler at this stage. He's like a dog with a bone, a guy who can even out aggro the likes of Vortex. And I think that says a lot for anyone who's familiar with Age of Empires 4. I think this is someone that we need to look for now from Puppy Paw. As we go further in the series, we've seen how great he looks with all of his teeth sharpened. But when he's not the person sharpening the sword, how do things line up? As we move forward deeper into the series, before we have a redraft, we have one more game. And in that game, consider this Marine Lord has 
has actually got statistically the better sieves. Two of his picks, the Rus and the French, have a 100% win rate. One of them being the signature sieve, one of them being the OP sieve in competitive play. The other being Japanese at a 50% win rate. And guess what? They counter one of Puppy Paul's better. Puppy Paul has access to Jean at 66% win rate, as well as the Abbasids, the fabled Abbasids, late to the tournament, currently seeing 100% win rate, being picked three times so far. But if he chooses to touch those dirty, filthy, Loser Marlians, we might be looking at a uh, return point in favor of Marine Lord, considering the Marlians, after five games, are sitting with no wins under their belt whatsoever. No one could have predicted that going in. But what we can actually uh, predict is more, more rel <laughs> relentless frustration coming out of uh, Puppy Paw. I think that game is a morale booster. If that had ended the other way, I imagine we'd be looking at quite the tilt factor that would need a reset. But what a morale booster that must be. The question has been answered. Can Puppy Paw overcome the Delhi kryptonite to his Byzantines? And the answer is an affirmative yes. But remember, folks, this is the best of nine. We've got some points on the board. We're three games deep. After one more, we will go to a full reset. That means we actually, if we go the entire distance, we're going to be resetting twice here. And I want to talk a little bit about these matchups we have, right? Because there's a few interesting like permutations there. I mentioned that, that Marine Lords overall got the better Civ picks here from win rates. Some of them are deceptive. French with 100% win rate doesn't really say much, but what we have to keep in mind is moving to that map number four, Roos is still the god tier sieve to beat. So Puppy Paw is going to have to some come up with something quite creative. I'm wondering if we actually might be looking at quite a weird one, one that feels reminiscent of what we saw before the Sultan's Ascend. I'm expecting a Roos versus a Bassid matchup to get us to that draft reset. Um, but before we hop back into that draft, one final reminder to come out, guys. EGC TV code, that, got, that code is running out soon. Like you have a matter of hours to use it. I want you guys to make sure you take advantage of this. The VPN servers are uh, mwah. The antivirus is mwah. I know some people saying they've got ads running. You've got two choices. You can either subscribe to this channel for the low, low price of $5 maximum, which will get you ad-free viewing experience for hours upon hours. Or alternatively, go spend 60 bucks to 75 bucks on two plus years of VPN service. And did I mention they have an ad blocker, which unlike the free ones will not lag up your Chrome. Trust me, I know I'm a cheapskate just like all of you. And I've learned the hard way. Sometimes it's worth paying. But so far, lads, we have Sim Marine Lord now paying in blood. Back up against the wall, at least in terms of the way that this draft goes out. He should be predictable here. It had to go this way. Roos coming out for Marine Lord, but Puppy Paw is not going to trust his fate to the Abbasis Drongo. Instead, we are going to get to see some Jean-Claude Van Damme. I'm very excited. There we go. I, I had myself <laughs> muted. I, I may have been nomming on some uh, Easter eggs here. Sorry to my, my little guys. But uh, yeah, I, I'm excited, man. We got ourselves cliffside. Roos versus Jean d'Arc. It's going to be nice. It's going to be absolute disgusting. Villager slaughter. Let's do it. Man, it's an interesting one to think about. Let's get ready. Remember, guys, after this game, there will be a draft reset, but this one is critical. Poppy Paul looking firm on Jean d'Arc, looking great and competitive, but Marine Lord, the Roos are unbeaten. Could that change here? Let's find out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game number four of our best of nine grand final series here for EGC TV's The Elite Classic. Today, we're on the map Cliffside. See, we've got ourselves a beautiful mirrored spawn with two wood lines facing each other. Let's talk about our players spawning in on our west side of the map in the color pink, playing as the Rus, representing Team Gentle Mates. It's Marine Lord. And on the other side, now with a two to one lead, rising star in the eyes of many, representing Canada, it is Poppy Pop playing as the color blue with Jean d'Arc. Ozzy, a map that we haven't really seen a lot in the playoffs of Cliffside we're talking about. And this is a map that's very different from the ones that we've seen so far. The players spawn so, so close to one another that it opens up a lot of possibilities for aggression. And you know, neither of these civilizations shy away from early game aggression. We could easily see some cheeky tower rush plays over here for Poppy Pop, for instance. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see it. Jean d'Arc is very good at doing tower rushes, just mainly because you can convert a lot of that building of the tower into experience. And while you might spawn close to your opponent on a map like this, you would expect that with that close spawn that you're going to be attacked a lot from the front. But the one thing I've found playing on this map, especially 
towards the top end of town is you are going to get raided a whole lot from the back of your base. So you need to make sure that you've got a plan to deal with it. Either you're going to wall up and keep yourself safe on the edges, or you better have units ready to protect you. But uh, speaking of units to protect, have a look at this. Marine Lord has got some good scout numbers out here. Beautiful micro coming through as well. Actually doing some starter step micro here to get that wolf and still continue on his way. So very nice uh, animation cancelling there. We'll check in with him soon. Uh, you can see the Joan of Arc. Uh, we've got her experience bar on, over on the right-hand side. I'm wondering if we're going to be able to get the, uh, the Rus bounty up. Maybe we can set ourselves a little bit of a timer for that one. Maybe you can check in around the three-minute mark. Only my goal's around 200, at least 250. If I can get at least 250 at the three-minute mark, I'm feeling good. Yeah. School of Cavalry, Landmark. Uh, no surprise on that front over there for Poppy Paw. Um, he's going to just be building that with Jean d'Arc herself. Whereas on the other side, Marine Lord is going to move out for the Kremlin. Might just be right next to that gold mine. Would also secure the hunt with that. Indeed, that is a lovely spot. It's going to be a little redundant when you look at the positioning of that cliff, but it's going to secure valuable resources. So I feel like that's a reasonable position for it. Yeah, I think that's a, a big component. And uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to guess right now for the Rus bounty, I'm, I'm going to go 285. Oh, he's just getting another one right here. I'm going to go 310. What do you reckon, Ludico? Ooh, I'm, I'm closer to a 2... 40, I would say, with this wolf maybe 265. Let's take a look. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, chat. I'm, look I'm looking at Twitch chat. Hold on. Give me a sec, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing 80 Boonty. Yeah, 80 Boonty actually makes a lot of sense. Can I, oh, can yeah, I change? Oh, yeah, 80 Boonty for Marine Lord. Hmm. I mean, that, that is the usual meme. How didn't I think of should that? Should be more than 80, though. He made three scouts, yeah. so, so it should be more than 80. I don't know, man. Sometimes I make three scouts and I get 80 Boonty. All right. You're not the only one, Ozzy. I know a pro player that does that. <laughs> you can see that he's picking up the wheelbarrow, so that's always a good indication that he's probably doing a little bit more than 80 Boonty. And it is going to be 300, so not a bad little benchmark to be at at the four-minute mark there. He'll be very happy with that. And a huge shout-out to our production as well for being able to get both the bounty for the Roos on the screen, at the same time as John Dark, you might think that that is something that looks simple. Well, it might look simple. It's not that easy to do. So, shout out to them. They are doing a, a very good job here. But Wheelbarrow coming through for both of these players early on. Already got that age up on the way for Marine Lord. And now, about to arrive here for Puppy Paw. Where do we go from here? Which direction do you think he's going to go? Is it going to be the Archer? Is it going to be the Woman at Arms? Uh, I, f I feel like... We've seen an uptick when it comes to the use of uh, the Archer variant of Jean d'Arc here. And I think that's probably the direction that I would expect uh, Puppy Paw to go. It can do a lot of good things for you. And I think especially the value that we've seen in the Archer version of Jean is that you do have that powerful long range arrow that you can shoot, which is immensely valuable when it comes to initiating fights. But looks like Puppy Paw is going to do the conventional good old fashioned way. And he's just going to play with uh, the Swordswoman variant. All right. Well, it looks like we're going to have double TC coming up for both of these guys. Definitely the right call here. Marine Lord on the Rus. Definitely their strongest straight. Their, their strongest strategy. Stray was a combination of strategy and play, Lydical. Uh, for a guy who's 6, 17 in the morning. That's pretty early uh, for me. Uh, that, that's my best attempt at English. Anyway, second TC going to be coming down here. I suspect we're probably going to see a pretty quick castle timing after this, but he could look to just play units instead. Um, naturally, knights into archers makes sense. It depends what he scouts out from Puppy Paw, and there'll be no shortage of scouting. He's already got three scouts on the field at the moment. Jean's going to do a little bit of running, but he's got so much food here to take advantage of. Second down center on the way here for Marine Lord. Classic Roos build to work with. On the other side, second DC as well for Puppy Paw, but... I think the two down centers are fundamentally different. Puppies is very much to the front. It's almost on the uh, Marine Lord side of the map. He's actually going to lure in a boar, at least uh, try to do that. John is nearby as well to help out. Marine Lord's entire base is super condensed, whereas when you look at Puppy Paw, he's very much stretched out across the map. Yeah, it definitely feels like he is intentionally denying resources here. Like, this is not a standard play. I think. When you look at Puppy Paw and his base layout, 
there is a very clear second town center, at least in my eyes, and that's at the back of the base. There's a deer pack back there with a couple of wood lines next to it. That seems like a pretty good spot to me, or maybe on top of the gold. Another good spot, especially when you've got scouts like this harassing you. But no, he goes over there. That is a very aggressive position. So I wonder if that means he's going to look to try and play a little bit longer in feudal. Uh, I could see that being a thing. Uh, militias are out there for Marine Lord. Uh, Bobby Paw is the only one with an actual, like, long-lived combat unit the single knight is out. And with the French, or a French variant civilization like uh, Jean d'Arc, you can definitely justify playing longer into Feudal Age militias. Out here to do a little harassment, but they shouldn't be able to accomplish much. It's a little sad for Puppy that he actually has to make this mill and make the tower. I think he wanted to lure that boar all the way to the TC, but he apparently wasn't able to. Yeah, un unfortunately... Sometimes you look at the lure and you're like, yeah, I, I can do this lure. Nah, you can't. Now, interestingly, Joan only picks up zero XP for killing those militia. So it's quite literally free real estate to be sending those militia out to their to their deaths to Joan. That's cool. I didn't actually know that. I, I would have thought they would have cost like the, the base food cost of like, what is it? Two XP or something like that. But not even going to be the case. So we've got Marine Lord. He's on the way for a fast castle. On the other side, Puppy Paw... He's also kind of looking like he's going to fast castle, but he does have knights in queue, which makes me think maybe he's going to do it. Maybe he's not going to do it. Lydicor, is he going to pull the plug here? What's the deal? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. For the time being, I'm actually seeing a very slow and methodical game, very reminiscent of the previous one, where you just had the players kind of poking and prodding, but neither of them committing to much aggression early on. Marine Lord is going into Castle Age here. Puppy Paw seems to be doubling down on Feudal, though, adding two more knights. Yeah, interesting decision to do this because it's going to mean that relics go over to Marine Lord. And I think he's buying a lot of space with, the, with these Kremlin Gremlins. The fact that he's forcing units into a specific area and that he's chasing underneath the town center, he's stopping the walls from coming up. It's just being a nuisance. And this is really, really good for him because he buys himself plenty of time back here. Meanwhile, Puppy Paw, sure, he's secured map with that second TC, but what else does he really have to show for it? Nothing, really. It's just he's stolen a little bit of resource. He's stolen the boar. He's stolen a little bit of hunt. That's it. I feel like the big thing here for, uh, for Puppy Paw is that his TC is exposed. So if Marine Lord beats him to Castle Age and we suddenly see an uptick in the level of aggression, especially fueled by the resource income from a high trade house and relics, that town center is more than exposed for Puppy Paw, so I feel like he needs to be the tempo setter of this game, and that hasn't really been the case so far. As you kind of touched on that, the militia have been used very well by Marine Lord to just draw Puppy Paw to specific areas. And keep in mind, uh, the militias don't give XP to Jean d'Arc, so Marine Lord is doing this without Jean d'Arc actually getting any benefit from it. Big move here as well for Marine Lord. He actually focused down the scout with the town centers. So now Puppy Paw is deprived of vision. Yeah, this is nice. On top of that, the scout also has the self heal. So being able to take it out early definitely helps a lot. Uh, but uh, we do see that uh, Puppy Paw might be thinking about going Castle Age. He's got a fair few knights out, but doesn't seem to be interested in too many more. Villager might go down here, but the heal comes online. Puppy Paw able to keep that villager alive for just a little bit longer. He is slowly walling in Marine Lord on this west side of the map. We can see walls have come up throughout the center. Down towards this south side, he's going to continue walling across all the way. He is very greedy with these. And you got to remember that when you go for walls like these, they're very easy to compromise because it's so hard for you to defend. You know, when you think about having to run your knights all the way from the south side here, then over towards the east side, up around and wrap around the cliffs and then up to your top TC, that's a lot of distance to go. Yeah, I feel like a lot of this for Puppy Paw is just about denying relics. You can actually see um, the way that the relics are positioned. If he was off that whole southern portion of the map, he could limit Marine Lord to realistically at maximum two relics. And I think he's going to be more than happy with that. Ultimately, uh, as you said, defending these walls is near impossible for him. But this feels like um, a short-term insurance policy for him in many ways. Yeah, I wonder why he didn't wall in this one in the center. Have a, if we have a look back here on, in the center, this one's just like sitting there and he could have easily walled that one in. But yeah, you know, I, I guess... Uh, the sacred site is too blocking too the optimal path, yeah. that's why. I, I think you're right. Yeah, it's hard. I think you've got to kind of angle it up and around. 
a bit weird. But the knight number is going to continue. I thought he was going to go Castle Age. Have a look at this. He's got six knights in queue. He is really committing here. So he's definitely looking to play this matchup a little bit more differently than what we've seen in the past. Because uh, normally the, the follow-up to this would just be Castle with Arbs. Um, Arbolatria would, would do very well here. Uh, but not going to be the case. Still nice looking rate. to put on pressure. He could potentially look at going into the Royal Institute here as well. If, if he oh. gets up to enough knights, this could be really difficult for Marine Lord to deal with. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking too. At this point, um, let's not forget, he's still the underdog of this series, despite being 2-1 um, at this point. So I feel like he needs to hey, play high upsides, and the Royal Institute gives him just that. Um, you see, it forces Marine Lord to play crossbows, which is not something that um, the Roos love to do. A Royal Institute, indeed, is going to be the landmark of choice. And I think one of the most important things is that with all these walls up, Marine Lord can only go through these walls at certain positions. Um, he either uses an opening or he needs to break through himself. At the same time, Puppy Paw can use all these gates that are scattered across the map on these walls and just appear at random positions with his cavalry mm. hit Marine Lord Zico. Yeah, yeah, and that's really, really nice uh, for him to be able to do that. Village account's still pretty decent at this stage. Keep in mind that uh, Puppy Paw's taken out three so far, but I think the, the highlight here is going to be this Royal Institute timing. He's got a lot of gold in the bank as well, so I think he's going to be clicking pretty much as soon as he ages up on that Royal Bloodline technology. We'll yep. keep an eye in that top right-hand corner. It's going to be elite, or rather, veterancy that comes through for these knights to start with. Village is going to be on the run here. He's going to lose a couple. Trying to even out that score on that village account. Marine Lord with a slight advantage here. A lot of the knights here from Puppy Paw are battered, and Royal Bloodlines takes a long time to research. So if Marine Lord wants to push, now is his chance. But that defensive tower being fortified makes it much more difficult for Marine Lord. It takes a long time to torch down. I think a critical detail is um, what we're actually seeing to the south here, though. Puppy Paw with all these walls guarantees himself a lot of gold, and I'm actually looking at the map, and Marine Lord doesn't have a lot of safe long-term gold available. Yeah, this is always a bit of an issue on this map. You've got, you know, one gold on the lower ground, then a second gold that's on the lower ground that's a bit further out. And then all the rest of the gold's in the middle of the map. So you've got to fight for it. But now, with the Kremlins and the crossbows, I think Marine Lord should have the numbers to be able to hold onto this. We do see the uh, the Royal Knights coming through. Keep in mind, I'm not sure if the Kremlins have got Brace. I don't think that they do. Um, so he will be able to get decent damage on them. But uh, John Dark might go down here. Wants to try and keep John alive. Just to try and get that level three. Royal Bar yeah. Bloodline's still coming through as well. Puppy Paw is going to lose a couple of villagers here. Nice surround by Marine Lord, but he's waiting for two things. He's waiting for Royal Bloodlines to finish, which, as we discussed, takes a long time. But he's also waiting for those militia to expire, which should happen any moment now. Once that yeah. happens, I think he's going to be more willing to take this fight. Yeah, yeah, Bloodlines is about to come through. And with this, I wouldn't be surprised if he absolutely just destroys in this fight here. John's on the back as well. Needs to try and keep her alive. Bloodlines about to come through any second. There it arrives. And now with the Bloodlines, it's going to mean that these, these, uh, these longbows, these Royal Knights just take an extra round from the crossbows in the face. Feels very good uh, to have these, this Bloodline in the Castle Age because it means that your fights that are going to be happening over the, the next couple of, well, ne next 10 to 20 minutes or so are always going to have this Royal Bloodline, this extra health, and you're always going to be feeling really good about it. But now still working his way, kiting through. The numbers are decent. Horsemen are going to be coming out. I take it back. Those are going to be John's riders that are joining the battle here. And moving up the back, we can see she's going to be looking for a spin to win. Able to find it here. The crossbow numbers are starting to fall, but able to keep Joan alive. Just a little bit of health on her. That runs into a knight. I think she might go down. Indeed, she will. And now Bloodlines still online here, but not, not a huge victory there for Puppy Boy. I felt like it probably yeah. should have been more than that. What do you reckon, Ludicor? Uh, if he keeps... Jean alive, I think it's all right, but without that, it's a little lackluster. At the end of the day, this tower is still intact for Marine Lord, so Puppy Paw is being pressured on his food eco here. He didn't manage to clean up all the crossbows, and uh, this was a costly endeavor at the very end. Now, he still has a massive advantage in mobility, and he needs to leverage that, more so than he did in the previous game. And this would be a perfect opportunity. Food eco to the north from Marine Lord. Marine Lord responding just in time to get those walls going. Yeah, that was really well done by Marine Lord identifying, you know what? These knights yep. look like they're posturing for a bit of a raid. Let's just make sure we stop that before it even starts. 
I feel like Poppy Paul needs to use smaller groups of knights to raid now. He's got 16 of these. He's not facing a lot of pressure. He knows that Marine Lord doesn't have a very scary army at this point. He could easily afford to send two or three knights to the south and hit Marine Lord's eco there. Marine Lord is completely defenseless to the south, and uh, that's not something that Poppy Paul has been exploiting so far. Yeah, yeah, there's a big opportunity down towards that southern position. Uh, a lot of villagers stacked up over on what I think might be berries. Uh, but we do start to see upgrades coming through for Marine Lord. It's going to be Boyar's Fortitude arriving. This will combat the difference in health a little bit here, but not a huge amount. I think it's an extra 20 health, if I remember correctly. Maybe 25 health for Boyar's Fortitude. It's going to buff all uh, cavalry units, which includes things like scouts, warrior monks, horse archers, uh, but most importantly, knights. These are the bread and butter of the Rus army. It doesn't buff the crossbows, fine. though, and Marine Lord is relying very heavily on these crossbows as well. So, oh, and this fight takes place before that upgrade comes in. This is a fight that should massively be favoring uh, Poppy Paul. But again, he doesn't have those breakthrough numbers that he needs. The heal comes in, keeps some of the knights alive. But once again, a bittersweet moment, you feel. This fight just didn't seem convincing enough. And uh, Ozzy, I'm starting to get a deja vu to the previous game here. Yeah, definitely is feeling like that. I'd love to see it. I, I did a whole bunch of testing on, on Crossbow Knight and what, what counters this unit composition. You know, what's the best way to take out the Knight? And by far the most, uh, the, the superior combo was always Knights together with Crossbows. They would always just be full Knights um, just because of your ability to, to micro and kite them. Even with Royal Bloodlines, we can see how powerful it is here. So I can't help but feel like even though Puppy Paw's been going 100% only Royal Knights 18 minutes into this game, Maybe adding in a couple of horsemen here can really change the battle because oh. those horsemen get double damage against the crossbows. They don't get countered by the crossbows. And on top of that, they're also cheaper than the Royal Knights, which means that you can effectively have double of them. So they're not just doing double damage. They're almost doing quadruple yeah. damage, if you think about it like that. I don't mind Poppy Paw using knights exclusively, but he's misusing knights here. Um, now he's facing a superior enemy, so... Um, he's going to have to potentially fight this, but just look at the southern portion of Marine Lord's base. This is wide open for raiding. Papi Paul's got walls there. He could easily march into Marine Lord's base. He could have done that long ago. We don't see that mobility being utilized. Instead, he's taking direct engagements against uh, units that are supposed to hard counter knights. And even if he cleans up these troops, he's going to pay a huge price for this. A lot of those expensive knights are going down here for him. A little bit of a wall -a lol on that top side. He's going to go for a charge on it. Could be dangerous. Could be very dangerous, but he's not going to be able to find it. Manages to knock that relic out as well. Meanwhile, on that south side, I mean, it, it, the, the, the trades that we're seeing between these two players, it's just there's so low number trades now that are coming out. Like, you, you're talking a handful of, of crossbows against a handful of royal knights, but we do finally see a secondary unit being mixed in here for Puppy Paw. It's going to be the Arbolatria. I still believe that he needs to leverage that map control a lot better. Needs to be pressure on Marine Lord's eco th to the south. Um, Papi Paul needs to start picking up relics. That's not something that he's been doing. Marine Lord was able to secure three out of the five relics despite being confined into his base for so, so long. Again, I feel like there are certain elements of uh, gameplay that are somewhat missing from Papi Paul in this game. And those are costing him very precious uh, value here. Um, lack of raids lack of pressure on Marine Lord. Finally, we are seeing that mobility being utilized. I think it's going to be a little too late, though. Marine Lord has a lot of horsemen. Yeah, with the horsemen on the field, they're going to do so well up against those Arbola Trio. Uh, and, uh, and now as they, they look to make a connection, the well, they might do a pretty decent job of just cleaning up oh, these yeah. horsemen to start with. Have a look at this. That town center towards that top side is going to be going down shortly by the looks of it. Uh, the horsemen will not have a chance against all these knights, but once the crossbows arrive, it's a different story. But this is what Papi Paul needed. A raid into the heart of Marine Lord Zico. Look at all this real estate. Villagers will be fleeing to the far right here, but even just the idle time by itself is so valuable here for Papi. I think he needs more of these. Yeah, yeah, I gotta agree with you, but now the crossbow numbers Looking pretty decent. He's going to try and tank it up with a little bit or distract with the horsemen, but the Royal Knights continue to flood through. Gets a nice heal off as well. A little bit of a spin to win on the backside. Joan still looks like she's got full health. Going to be able to empower all of those big attacks through. 
And now just cleaning up the horsemen here. The crossbow number's not that high. This is uh, definitely not a good fight right now for Marine Lord because we're fighting in the economy and it means that in the event things don't go our way, you can see he's picked off all of the cavalry here. He's just going to run off and he'll come back another day. Uh, normally, oh, I wouldn't be a fan of trading uh, horse or trading knights to horsemen. But in this case, it's all right because uh, Puppy has a second wave. He's got Arboletria coming to the north. And with the horsemen gone, these Arboletriae will actually carry these fights. In fact, you can actually see a small group of those troops moving to the north. And finally, he's putting some pressure on Marine Lord Zico. And his composition is a lot more um, serviceable compared to what it used to be. And am I seeing a trade technology being researched? You are indeed. Well, keep in mind, trade is technically on the field. We did see a market towards the north. I never saw any traders out from it, though, but I suspect there probably is one or two. It's not a bad little technology. Main, mainly useful on maps where your trade is not the best, but have a look at that. Yeah, we've got nine traders out already. Who needs gold veins when you have got gold on the road? That, of course, is the, uh, the trade road that we're talking about. Uh, level Remember, four, Marine Lord doesn't have a lot of gold to work with. He was taking... Oh, big miss micro there by Poppy losing, Sean. Ouch, that's He's... ugly. Anytime something like that happens, I'm like, okay, did he disconnect? What happened right there? Like, we're talking about, about pro-level players right here. Uh, but it looks like, for the moment, Puppy Paul maybe just wasn't paying attention to Joan. Definitely still seems to be at the computer. Uh, Puppy Paul is back to 99. So once again, um, you're looking to see him use that mobility here. Marine Lord is making spears that feels very, very sad when you're the Roos. And remember, he's on a serious timer here because of the lack of uh, safe gold available. Now Poppy Paul mixing his level four as Joan. Well. Oop. Just remember, level 4 Joan is a big timer here. Once level 4 Joan's oh, here, true. we're going to have ourselves a real problem because we're in the Castle Age and uh, level 4 Joan's going to be unleashing all sorts of problems onto the field. Welcome, Joan. It is a pleasure to see you here. Except for Marine Lord. Marine Lord is not going to be welcoming you, that is for sure. Because now with that beautiful little buff right there, we can see all of the units around is going to be just gathering up. What, what type of buff have, have we got here? I'd, I'd have to double check. Is it the attack speed increase? Or oh, it's the individual unit buff up, right? Like you, you can knight one of the, your units. I... Uh, is it, it's oh, possible no, it's that Poppy threw Jean away intentionally and just said, okay, I'm willing to just refund her because it's easier to link it up with the rest of my army that way. Yeah, that could definitely be it. Yeah, bring her over to the front because she's level four, right? And I want her to die before she gets level four. Or well, like Ooh. she was... Oh my God, look at this. this oh is actually... my Lord. This is insane. Puppy Poor is going ham right now. Have a look at this. Red Palace, 40 bills on the Red Palace. This is not getting denied as well. The, the Royal Cannon comes out. This is from Joan, by the way as now we're in our really difficult spot, Lidicor. Oh my lord, Marine Lord is gonna be in so much trouble here. Imperial Age hits for a player that already has a very well upgraded army. Royal Knights already have Royal Bloodlines. Now there's a Red Palace in your face. Royal Cannon already out there. Manganos to deal with a very infantry focused army here. This is looking extremely grim here for Marine Lord. And you know, Puppy Ball, there was a lot of talk about him. What can he do against Marine Lord? He's just showing he's out here for blood, and uh, the more we look at his gameplay, the more realistic um, the perspective of him potentially becoming a champion becomes. This is incredible. I mean, he's obviously been a really good player for a long time, but the fact that we're seeing him play like this, I, I, I can't believe my eyes right now, Lidicor. This is insane what we are witnessing. A little bit of a raid coming through over on that east side of the map. Just a couple of pink horsemen making their way through for Marine Lord. Spears going to be moving up, able to take out a couple of rogue units here. Joan just going to be popping off a little bit of damage here at point blank range. Joan, you, that is a fight you don't want to take, my friend. Keep in mind the landmarks, Ozzy. All three landmarks kind of close to one another and the town center is being taken out. Poppy is going for the landmarks here. He's not messing around. Fourth landmark, though, is being placed for Marine Lord currently and it is very far away from where this action is. So that should great reaction. keep safe a little bit long. Oh, no. that, that is a great reaction by Marine Lord. And let's not forget, he has done a masterful job in the previous game holding these assaults. Uh, this time around, Puppy is trying to go for the landmarks. Remember, Puppy doesn't have a massive army right now. I think he's lacking the elite upgrade on the Arboletria. The accent upgrades are somewhat mediocre. Jean has just now fallen, so this is far from over. 
Uh, it still looks grim for me. Oh, hold, hold your timing. Hold your time. Look, uh, look how many vills we've got on this landmark. Litacore, there's. I don't think that landmark's being constructed fast enough. Have a look at the the, the landmarks here. He's focusing all three landmarks. The Kremlin. Oh the my. Tamsin, oh, this oh could my. actually be it. Look at the, oh, the double trebs are working their way through, but it looks like he will make it just in. Oh, it's by the. Oh my lord! The towns, all three landmarks have fallen, but actually, I'm not sure if that TC has fallen. We've oh. only got two out of four. All right, it lo it looked good. It wasn't actually. Let's, let's that be good, honest. But... That was divine intervention on the side of Marine That was a split second difference. Whew. All right, I, I had a little bit of a what's the word? Excitement going on right there. I think that's what they call it. Uh, what is that? Is that, that a landmark a snipe? No, that was a keep attempt. Uh, from, no, look at from, look uh, at the bottom left. Four. Yeah, that, that was a keep. He, he he was trying to put down a keep. Uh, excuse me. Are you sure? That, yeah, yeah. Are you sure? A, he was trying to put down a keep, but now he's just now he's just taking springles out. He's like, yeah, you know what? We'll just get he's rid of He's going all in. Is he actually? Is he yeah, pulling the, all the bills? These are not there for a keep. What the marine look just gave up? Are you serious right now? <laughs> he, did, he, knew, he saw the villas lit the core and he knew it was over. He's like, oh, villagers have gotten pulled. I got to type. I got to type in GG for this one. Uh, he was down to 16 army. So truth be told, if those villagers and the army commits, I think it was actually scouting from Poppy potentially. He sent in a bunch of wheels to find the last landmark. And Marine Lord was just like, yeah, maybe Marine Lord thought he saw it. I don't think Poppy Paul actually saw the landmark, but he was damn close. So maybe Marine Lord said, look, he spotted it. He's going to go there and I can't defend it. I'm just going to tap out. But Aussie, I'm not going to lie. This is uh, potentially the greatest grand finals that we've seen so far. The level of madness that we're witnessing in each and every one of these games is just through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. This is absolutely crazy, man. It is. I, I'm so impressed that Puppy Paw has made it to the grand finals. <laughs> gonna be so much more impressed if Puppy Paw beats Marine Lord. Like he, he's already gone through such a hard lineup. The fact that he's gotten here has been insane. But you know, wow, Puppy Paw. The, I'm speechless, man. Let's let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. I don't want to jinx it. Let's just keep on moving. I want to see the next game. Litical, show it to me already. Show it to me. Let me see it, please. Uh, angry maple syrup noises as we are heading into game number five here. This is the best of nine, folks. So first to five is going to win this. Coast of Cliffs is going to be the map of choice. And this is where we're entering an interesting territory, something that we haven't yet had the chance to talk about. Marine Lord, besides Holy Island, he has been picking his opponent's home maps. So if Marine Lord mounts a comeback over here, He's going to be playing the remaining games mostly on his own home maps. And I think that's a very important takeaway from this. This time around, we're also going to play on one of the home maps chosen by Poppy Paul, Coastal Cliffs. What do you reckon, Ozzy? Um, is this a smart choice by Marine Lord? Is he not risking too much here? Mm, I, don't, I don't know about this map. I'm going to be honest. Uh, Coastal Cliffs. Uh, so they've redrafted at this point. So new sieves unlocked for everybody. Marine Lord's got the Byzantines now. Puppy Paw's got the Chinese. I can't help but feel like Puppy Paw is just going to pull the Chinese out right now. Uh, this, this civilization's incredible. It's quite good on this map as well. Uh, Byzantines are pretty good here as well for Marine Lord. So I'm curious to see exactly what pick he goes for here. Probably not going to be Delhi. Probably not going to be... It, it's going to be Jean d'Arc or it's going to be the Byzantines. It's one of those two, I feel like. Uh, meanwhile, for Puppy Paw, yeah, I suspect you have to... What is it? Ottomans or Chinese? You could probably probably the Chinese though. Like, well, it's gonna be go Byzantines Mongols being well. picked here by Marine Lord. That makes sense. Bobby Paul, Holy Roman Empire, get out of town. The last pick. Look at this. This is the fat guy in okay. gym class. The one who got picked last. Speaking of fat guy in gym class, Killer Pigeon. Hey, how oh. you doing? Hey, and don't, don't mind me. I've just been sitting in the background eating chocolate bars and crying to myself because Poppy Paul is just making AOE4 look too simple and it is depressing me, Drongo. He's leveling up this game. Honestly, like, I'm watching these games. The last two games were basically landmark races, right? From Poppy Paul. It's almost like he just remembered that killing landmarks is a way you can win games, right? We're used to competitive games ending before that point. I insane what we've been seeing here. But yes, this is an interesting matchup, actually. Marine Lord conceded quite a lot in the draft, if you think about it. The Chinese pick 
is just god tier right now. Puppy Paw, five wins, no losses. This is his de facto signature sieve. On top of that, Abbasids is a 100% win rate. The HRE, since the buff, have not dropped a game. They are out of control. And I gotta say, Lytical, like looking at this matchup on Coastal Cliffs, Byzantines, we've seen a few players deliver here. I think most namely would be uh, Louis comes to mind, Puppy Paw, and also Dumu have done remarkable things with this sieve, the purple sieve on Coastal Cliffs. We've yet to see what Marino can do. And what I'm curious about is who's going to be attacking, who's going to be defending. That new buff with the marching drills and the HRE has given them some insanely aggressive timings. I think one big takeaway from the previous two games is that Puppy Paw found his rhythm and he found a play style that he succeeds with. And that is this ultra aggro, sometimes YOLO aggressive strategy that we've seen in the previous game, especially. He wasn't forced to pull a villagers in the previous game. But I think he is feeling this need to finish games quickly and play super aggressive, and he's finding a lot of success with it. This map, Coastal Cliffs, it's um, essentially Arabia with reduced size. You can't actually access the water. So one of the things that this um, uh, results in is a smaller playing field. Players a lot more um, confined and a lot closer to each other. And I feel like that actually plays into the hands of Puppy Paw here. Now, um, again, pushing the Byzantines is going to be an interesting one, and uh, this is a matchup just by the looks of it that I would prefer the Byzantines in. But I just feel like the map could play into the hands of Puppy Paw in terms of play style, and it's going to be interesting to see how Marine Lord is going to handle this uh, potentially ultra aggressive gameplay that we might be seeing from Puppy Paw. Yeah, it's interesting coastal cliffs. As you mentioned, the fishing is not accessible. Uh, I like to call it Dry Arabia on Slimfast, which seems appropriate after I just got fat shamed by Drongo. Um, but the, the interesting thing to me as well, Drongo, is on this map, it's not just that the map is more compact and kind of makes it easier for slow armies to take control. It's the fact that TC booming sieves get punished here, right? The loose stone means usually things like the Chinese and the French don't really seem that viable. Yeah, it's interesting, but I think there's also other aspects as well. So the Holy Roman Empire, as an example, if they're going for a fast castle, they'll typically want to get three vills, send them out to stone to get 42 stone so that they can grab an emplacement on their, their outpost. Is that going to happen here? That's a question. Uh, Byzantines, while they might not be looking for a second TC, typically they're going to be looking to get that system network up and running. Are we going to see a delay in that? Potentially. But yeah, you're 100% on the money. One, one, one base focus is, is going to be a big thing here. Even with the Chinese on this map, you know, we see them. Uh, I, I've seen quite a few games here. And one of the, the common themes is that we don't even really get like Zhukunu on this map. It's mainly uh, horsemen. It's mainly archers. And then it's Song Dynasty. And then maybe a second town center. But very, even for a 2TC civilization like the Chinese to be playing 1TC on a map like this, I guess I just guess that speaks to the rhythm of this map. The fact that you've got less space to play with. And of course, you've got uh, less resources in the base, obviously no stone. So yeah, it's uh, it's undoubtedly going to be an exciting game. Uh, I didn't mean to, to fat shame you. I do apologize, KP. Uh, no, it, I, it's I'll... fine. It's fine. You know, the problem is like I do um, all of my surfing virtually, not physically. So I've put on a few pounds. It just happens. But you know what? It's time to add an extra number onto this board. We are 3-1 on the score. Puppy Paw, if he wins this, he will find himself on match point. The redraft begins on Coastal Cliffs, HRE, Byzantines, the two biggest benefactors of the patch just before Grand Finals weekend. It's time to decide which one is the king. Well, I'm ready, Litacore. How about this? We've got ourselves a game number five. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Coastal Cliffs. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today as we witness a Dark Age barracks coming through here. Let's uh, let's introduce our players before we get ahead of ourselves. Spawning in on the south side of the map in the color pink, playing as the Byzantines, representing gentle mates. It's Marine Lord. And on the other side, now with a 3-1 to one lead, Puppy Paw with the color blue as the Holy Roman Empire. This is Coastal Cliffs. This is Puppy Paw's home map, but Marine Lord opted to play that, having lost the previous game. So one thing to keep um, an eye out on, Aussie, is that Marine Lord played or opted to play the recent games on Puppy Paw's home maps. If he can drag this series out, make it a 3-2 or a 3-3, the remaining maps will be almost exclusively on Marine Lord's home maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good point. And I guess that gives Marine Lord an advantage. And now that we've gotten through to this point, you can have a bit more confirmation in the sieves. You can feel a little bit better. I just had I just had deja vu right then. But of course, I wonder what happens. You know, deja vu is such a weird thing, isn't it? 
I, I, I don't really know too much about Deja Vu. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not too much of a woo guy. But the only woo I will be saying is, woo, let's go puppy paw. Can I get some puppy paw in the chat right now? Don't worry, we'll get Marine Lord in after as well. But I tell you what, Puppy Poor is up in this series right now, 3-1. Coming into this, man, uh, I tell you what, yesterday before the series started, if you told me that Puppy Poor is going to be up in a series against Marine Lord 3-1 after taking out Beastie the day before, I'd, I'd say, I'd tell you me, I, I'd tell you that you're joking. There's, there's no way, ain't no way. But look at him. He is coming out of the box, uh, out of the gate strong right here. I don't think a lot of people had that uh, on their bingo cards. And I think Papi Paul found himself a very nice um, approach that seems to work well against Marine Lord. He's this ultra aggro build, uh, something that he's been doing in a previous game as well. And almost the YOLO style all ins that he is playing around with. This time around, he's going to open with the Dark Age Barracks, try to pressure that forward gold from Marine Lord. But Marine Lord got what he wanted. Um, he actually has enough gold for Feudal Age. And he opts to age up with the Hippodrome despite not touching the berries in Dark Age. I don't know how I feel about this, just mainly because obviously it's harder to go for the um, the the Grand Winery if there's the threat of, of spears. But one of the big issues that I always have whenever you open up like Hippodrome or something is if it's against spears. It just, to me, it just doesn't make sense, right? Like with, with the Hippodrome, what are you looking for? You're looking for that early tempo. You know, you don't really care too much about the heal. It's nice, but it's not a big... It's not a big goal. But we can see the reason why he's done that here is because he knew what the follow-up to these spears was going to be. The spears were just the opening. The rest of it is what matters. And that's going to be that we are going to completely deny these berries. There's no chance that these berries are going to be taken before the six-minute mark, seven-minute mark. Marine Lord's got appropriate responses for this, but it's going to take time for him to get them online. Now, one thing that could be worrisome for Puppy is that Throughout the previous games, he struggled to contain Marine Lord within his base. Uh, Marine Lord was always able to slip out, get some extra resources. So as much as um, this tower is going to deny the berry patch to the south, Marine Lord still has one to the east, and technically there's even a hunt to the north. And if Poppypo isn't active in denying those, Marine Lord could easily get away just taking that as his primary food source. Yeah, all right, well... Let's take a look and see how this, this one unfolds because it looks like we have got ourselves... Where, where is that age up coming through? Is he not... Is he, what's he, is he going for survival techniques or something? There, there was a whole bunch of resources in the bank, but I don't see it on the UI. Um, what do we got? I think he just doubled down on Spearman. He's up to seven. You do expect a delay in, um, in Feudal Age timing as a consequence. He's got seven villagers on gold, so now he's trying to rush Feudal. And that's going to be a mercenary camp. This is where it gets a little dicey for Puppy. Because I think we're going to see... Lo Actually, it's, that's a range. Could have been mercenaries and longbows, although he doesn't have a lot of berries to work with just now. But he's yeah, just going I to open with range, and that's going to be a second DC build from Puppy Paw, though. Interesting. I, I would have thought he would follow this up with a direct Fast Castle. I've, I've always loved like this Dark Age aggro into Fast Castle. It just reminds me a lot of Age of Empires 2. But interestingly, we don't see that at all. He's, he's yeah, going in for a second TC, so... He'll be looking to focus on getting his stone and then it most likely transition into wood once he's got the Arcana. Interesting decision. So it locks down the berries completely. He's got access to another two sets of berries, but the, uh, the third set is kind of blocked off by this outpost. I mean, you can still technically get there, but you'd feel a little bit vulnerable oh. if you tried. I don't know if he just changed his mind or he just wanted the uh, emplacements from the very beginning, but he actually pulled the villagers from stone. So there is going to be no second town center here. It's just going to be towers with uh, with weapon emplacements. Ironically, I feel like a second DC could have worked. I think he is just a little too late to the party with that. By the time he starts building it, these archers arrive. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I know what you... Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tough spot, actually. How do you play this one? Because you've opened up with... The, the spears, you put the outpost down, but the outpost doesn't really block anything. Wait, what? why are we going for a second run here? Because th this is... He's, he's going for more stone out here, so... Is he going to be looking to put down putting down the mining camp? With the archers as well on the field, this could be really difficult for him to hold. Because he doesn't have the resources to throw down an outpost. And he is going to be doing some long-distance mining puppy paw. What is going on right here? Yeah, I feel okay. like um, this game plan feels a little awkward from Puppy Paw right now. I feel like uh, maybe the plan started to stall out beyond dropping that tower. 
And I'm just concerned for Poppypo right now. Feudal Age Men at Arms, I'm not the biggest fan of that, especially not against the Byzantines. Um, Horsemen now harassing these veils. Defensive towers have to be dropped. And I think this is a position where the Byzantines are going to be more than happy just playing aggressive. I would not be surprised to see some Hero Siphon in a couple of minutes. Mm, uh, I'm still trying to work out in my head. Like, could have he just gone for an outpost on the gold and just called it a day and, and just gone castle? I, I don't think he's got the appropriate food numbers for it. You can see he was trying to throw the mill down on the berry. So he, d he doesn't actually have the food to go castle here. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, no sheep at all. Compare that to Marine Lord, who I saw bringing in like 46 sheep back there. He was looking a little bit New Zealand at me. Uh, but uh, yeah, you always got to be careful with these guys. Yeah, look at this. I feel like he's just dropped Anatolian Hills. 11 sheep. So he, he's had a good start, a good opening here with, with the sheep numbers in his favor. And that's going to limit the options that Puppy Paw's got. But th this is a really tough game for him to play now because of the aggression that, that Marine Lord's putting out. It definitely feels like it's Marine Lord's game to lose at this stage. Oh, certainly. Like, we only have a couple of spearmen here for Puppy Paw. Marine Lord's going to have to bail on the gold mine. But right now, Puppy Paw's lifeline is that board to the north, and Marine Lord is converging over to that position. Uh, it's going to be double defensive towers. That's why he actually <laughs> mined the stone. He still has a lot of stone to work with, but he doesn't have safe access to wood. All these lumberjacks have to be pulled. You look at the overall eco from Puppy Paw, and it's just abysmal right now. Yeah, it definitely doesn't feel like this doesn't feel like a, a strong opening. I think a big part of this, and it's a weird little thing, but the berries being at the back of the base means the outpost goes at the back of the base. So you can just kind of ignore it, right? And that's exactly what Marine Lord did. No Grand Winery, so no real worries. And then he's just got a secondary berry patch just a little bit over to the right over here. It, it's like there was no outpost in in the game at all. And now all of a sudden, Puppy Paw is so much further behind than what he should be. And now we're seeing the consequences of it. Marine Lord just camping up the gold here. And uh, yeah, this is this is not looking good on the opening here for Puppy Paw. How does he get himself back into this game? Because Marine Lord's just going to continue turning all of these berries into additional units. We've got the Kashyx that are out. That's the way that he's opted to go. He's looking to hit with raids as well, but men at arm numbers are now going to start to climb for Puppy Paw. I don't know how I feel about this, Lidicor. Uh, I don't like Fuel Age men at arms. I've never liked them. Mainly because... Uh... A fuel age economy isn't really good enough to sustain the mass production of a very expensive unit like a man at arms. At least not um, for an extended period of time. I just feel like um, that's the problem here for Puppy Paw. His army is non existent. I think he actually wants to castle. I think that could be his lifeline, but I feel like this game might just be too far gone. He doesn't have a standing army. He would need some sort of tech advantage. Maybe on a paper, he. Castle Age with Burgrave and the Men at Arms could work, but he's so far from making this happen that I feel like by the time he gets there, Marine Lord will just snowball this game. Yeah, see, for, for me, the hope is like building up enough knights or enough lances that it's going to be okay. But gold position in this game, which is something that we haven't talked about, is absolutely terrible for Puppy Paw. And I think this is something that Marine Lord has definitely identified as he does pop a little bit of triumph there. Not going to be able to find too much uh, extra healing. Uh, Keshik's also going to be able to pick up some villager kills. He's not going to have space inside the town center. I feel like Puppy Paw is just seconds from tapping out at this stage. Like, you got this much military in your base. I think he wants to go for it. Maybe he might be thinking about going for the Burgrave. He does also have the um, the boar to help him out. But have a look at this. You've got triple gold. And it's all within, like, one screen on this right-hand side of the map. You've got a single gold back here. And then just a little bit south of this position, there's your other gold. And now to the right, there's another gold as well. So there's no real difference on, on these gold positions, which means that as long as Marine Lord controls this tiny little quadrant, it's very hard to get gold. You I, can do it, but it's hard. I don't know what to think, Ozzy. It's a Ragnitz Cathedral from a player that has zero map control and very limited safety. I just... I can see this being a Hail Mary play, basically saying, if I can't get map control, I'm done. If I can get map control, I can get the relics quickly. And he's likely going to play Knights over here. Yep. But I just don't see him being able to secure any of the relics at this point. He's got so little map control. I think this was definitely the play from the beginning. I just would have loved an outpost on the gold. But then it's also like, well, you kind of need food as well. And I mean, he's done food over on... He's got had the ball for food, but it's just one of those things. And But now Golden Horn Tower is coming up as well. Keep in mind, Marine Lord didn't go for the Grand Winery, so it means he's not going to have uh, monks on the field immediately. He's going to have to drop a monastery to get them out. But still, 
Marine Lord's the kind of guy who's going to put that bad boy down with yeah. like eight villagers. There goes the tech advantage. Marine Lord is aging up to Castle Age as well with the Golden Horn Tower. And the problem that I'm having here for Poppy Paw is that his eco is like super bad. So yeah. even if he had the tech advantage, he has virtually no functional economy that allows him to mass produce units. And I just don't know where he's going from here. Unless, actually, Ozzy, I think I might know what he's doing. If he's doing that, that's one of the crazier ideas. Okay, it looks like he's dropping a stable. For a moment, without those stables, it crossed my mind that he might try to fast Imperial with... Yeah, um, straight to Swabia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight to Swabia, trying to salvage this game by mass-producing villagers. Yeah, that could work. And then, like, you, you throw down... You, as long as you got the one outpost in the back, you're okay. Uh, but it looks like a single Keshik is going to be able to take out... Was that two men at arms that I think it took out? Uh, meanwhile, let's check in with the base with Marine Lord. I reckon we've already got ourselves a monastery coming up over here. Let's, uh, let's check. At any second now, that bad boy is going to be thrown down. Where is it? Where are you? Maybe over to, towards the right, I reckon. Yeah, over there. Oh, no, nothing. Jeez, Marine Lord, I expected more from you. Come on. Get your head in the game, son. All right, well, Village is getting taken out once again. We've seen this story before this game. Now we see it again as more villagers go down. He's taken out 12 workers this game already, which is a huge amount. Oh, like that's, a, that's a lot of lost souls. And don't forget, those are HRE villagers. So because of the buffs that they receive, they're actually more valuable, so to say, than normal villagers are. Now, one silver lining here for Poppy is that Marine Lord doesn't have a lot that can deal with knights. So for the time being, he's going to fall back. I think this is where Poppy Pop could try playing into uh, the Pass of Shrabia. It's still ma a massive stretch at this point, but being down 13 villagers, I don't think he can sustain Castle Age combat. So a status quo here for him is simply insufficient. Yeah, I got to agree with that. I, I like the fact that he's moving the knight onto the enemy yep. side as well. Hopefully we get a little bit of a distraction out of here. Hopefully it draws units back towards this side. Clears up a little bit of uh, potential to pick up relics. If he can get to three relics in this game, I think he's going to be pretty happy with that. And we can see him moving towards this top side. This could be a three relic game for him. Taking the middle one, pinching it, moving it north. He could get sprinkled in placements on those outposts. They're going to be safe. And he looks like he might be thinking about going Imperial here as well. He should. I think he could see Bill still be in with a chance here, Litacore. Yeah, to be fair, um, right now his position is precarious. But Marine Lord has slowed down. And what uh, Puppy Paul needs to do is raid, raid, and raid. He cannot really fight the army of Marine Lord directly with all these crossbows out there, um, Kashyyyk. It's just not going to work. But as long as he just runs circles around Marine Lord's base, Puppy Paul can buy himself time to get to Imperial. And when the Pass of Shrabia goes down, it might actually be dropped on the double gold deposits south of Puppy Paul's base. That gives him a lot of safety. And he needs that to get back into this game in terms of the villager counts. He's actually taking a second four. You can see the villagers moving all the way there. I feel like now we're seeing a super YOLO build here from Poppy, but he kind of needs this. Otherwise, yeah. I don't see him coming back into this game by just playing conventionally. I agree as well. And I'm, I'm just waiting for him to get this third relic to the bottom side of his base. Like, it, it's just sitting there. Just go take it. Marine Lord's just picked up his first relic. But it looks like we do have our prelate coming out finally. I'm uh, going to be moving out towards this position. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the other thing to note is these relics are a little bit vulnerable towards the north side of the map. So that's another thing to be very, very aware of. But Cataphracts are now he's losing out. precious time. He's got no food income, and he's being delayed into Imperial because of that. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, and, and see, this is where it all just goes back down to sheep, right? Like, the fact that Marine Lord comes into Feudal Age with, what was it, like 13 sheep compared to Puppy Paw, who's got zero. Uh, it's just these these tiny little differences that can really start to add up over the course of a game. Like having thousands of food compared to your opponent. Now yeah, I think Poppy needs out. to buy Imperial here. Yeah, I, th I think that could be a pretty smart move, actually, because it's not a whole lot of resources to, to buy in from this. Uh, and the problem is that the best spot for the uh, Pass of Shrabia has now been taken to the south of his base. And I'm not even yeah. sure if he has wood to make a market. That's how bad his position is. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, the one thing to note, though, is that you, because you do have three relics, like, this isn't terrible uh, with regard to gold income. Sprinkled emplacement is through. Uh, that's going to help him defend in this position. 
going to be able to force back, but remember there's more villagers that have been taken out. But just remember, I, I, I guess if Swabia does come online, villagers, we don't really care about them, right? We lose villagers, it's going to slow us down. But if, if we've got Swabia, well, things are different now. I think the big problem is where that Swabia goes down. Because right like now, that. Puppy Paw has basically no safe resources to work with, and it's going to be a super, super confined position back at home. I think now Marine Lord can change his approach, play the resource denial game. He actually saw the mill here, so he can raid the food villagers. Barely any lumberjacking going on for Puppy Paw. He's got no farms. He's close to depleting that gold mine. Even with all the villagers out there from the Schwabia, he will not have access to resources simply. Yeah, and look, Swabia is coming up, but have a look at the position. The village is going to be forced back. He's going to have to cancel it. And unfortunately, that will mean that's 28 villagers. That's a lot of idle time. And he will go for that spot that you identified. The one thing to note about this position, which I really don't like, is we're very far away from our outposts. This will be open to Hydrosophons. It will be open to any kind of units here because we really badly need to take these out. Now, speaking of getting taken out, have a look at this over towards the west side. I would have loved to have seen these relics shuffled out of here a little bit earlier. Not going to be the case. And with that, you're going to be losing a huge amount of gold income. Who's going to try to siege down these Karasophons? Marine yeah. Lord didn't expect villagers to show up here from the left side. The Boar villagers were pulled. And Puppy Paw, I mean, he's fighting such an uphill battle in this game, but he's trying to pull off a miracle. Rams undefended, or um, Hero Siphon to be precise. So one of them will be taken out. Second one gets away, though. And now Marine Lord is going to pay more attention to this. Uh, oh. Hello? Yeah, there we go. Please take out the first one. There we go. All right, so Imperial Age is through just before the 18-minute mark. He's going to start printing villages with that. Second Kyrosophon now coming through. Uh, it's about half health, but with the amount of units that he's got here, it's almost certain that this bad boy is going to be going down. In fact, both of these guys will be going down here. That'll be the loss of two relics, and that'll mean a flip from 3-2 relics to 4-1 relics, or 1-4 relics. Um... It's not a pretty flip right here. And this was something that was entirely preventable, something that we saw miles away that, that, that could have been fixed. Just, you know, one of those small little things that, I guess in the heat of the moment, when you've got so many things that you're focusing on, it's just not something that you consider. You just think, okay, it's safe. It's not. Yeah, it, it might have been that he was concerned that he wouldn't actually make it back home from this position with the monks and with the limited map control he had. The concern now for him is that... Um, Sure enough, the villager printer is going to print villagers, but he's down by 20, so it takes some time to catch up. Yeah. At the same time, he lost a bunch of relics, so by the time yep. he offsets that, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a hassle. Having said, but, that, uh, the I guess the saving grace here is that he, with the Swabi being cancelled from its original position, the Swabi and now is on gold. Yes. Uh, and so now we've got access to gold. So that's something that we've got going for us. Another thing to note is that we did actually get an outpost up. The cannon emplacement has come through. We're only fortifying it now, but the cannon emplacement's already there, which means that we should hopefully... I mean, it's going to take a lot to defend against four Hyrosophons. We're going to need some yeah. sort of unit here. Um, and look, 61 he needs a military pop against four military pop. That's, 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 that's a tough sell right there. Remember, there is emergency repairs, but... Uh... The problem is, as you kind of highlighted, the bombard emplacement works well against those units, but when you have four Hero Siphon moving in, you need something that takes those out. Four Lancers will simply be insufficient, even though those are elite knights now for, uh, for Puppy Paw. Villagers will be pulled, but once again, this is just uh, one step forward, two steps back, at the, uh, I feel like, for Puppy. Exactly. Yeah, he's got elite knights have, have come online, but look at the crossbow numbers. Starting to look a little bit sour here. Marine Lord's done a wonderful job so far throughout this game, managing to secure uh, this position. But now we see the emergency repairs coming through for Puppy Paw. He's trying to hold on. It's been a tough game, an uphill battle from the very beginning. But Lidicor, I don't think there's any way he's coming back into this one. Nope. He should be busy typing GG at this point because all his eco is getting decimated. He's pulling everything, but this game is just not working out the way he wanted. He's down to 34 population against 112 from Marine Lord. It looks like Marine Lord is not going to go down easily. He's going to secure game number five here in just a matter of moments. That's it. Both sacred sites now taken. That's going to be the nail in the coffin, but definitely. Uh, I, I feel like the coffin had been constructed. I feel like at... at you know, quite early on in this game, Puppy Paw had been put into the coffin. He wasn't responding. And it's only now that the nail has finally gone through. Uh, that was a tough game for Puppy Paw. That was, that was not an easy one.
I feel like the big takeaway here is that this was Puppy Paw's home map. So not only is this a win for Marine Lord, it's a very important win because now Puppy Paw only has one home map to play on. Any games beyond that is going to be on Marine Lord's home maps. And that is something that could be an extremely influential factor heading into game number six. But Ozzy, so far we've been having an absolutely impressive grand final over here. Bit of an anticlimactic uh, game here, I feel like. But this one... Puppy Paw just felt like he wanted to try something off meta, didn't really work out. So we're going to be heading into game number six with a 3-2 scoreline. All right, well, we've got ourselves a very fun matchup. One of my favorite matchups, the Chinese, baby. I am, I'm huh. looking forward to this. What are we going to see out of Puppy Paw now? Keep in mind, Lidical, Puppy Paw is undefeated on the Chinese. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident throughout this entire event. So we're going to see something big, that is for sure. It's going to be good. Uh. We're going to see yeah. either the Chinese get defeated or the Chinese victory. Well, well, it's not like you have many other options uh, unless you can draw a game out in AoE 4. But I think uh, this is a good time to hear what KP has to say about this uh, whole setup that we're having over here. Because at this point, this series could go all the way to the distance, it seems. It would be lovely to see what he has to say about all this setup. Well, boys, this is going to be an interesting one. Not only have we got the signature service Drongo just highlighted coming out from Puppy Paw, on the other side, this is quite intriguing, Ludacore. Uh, Marine Lord is yet to play Jean Dark once in this tournament. So it's kind of an unknown quantity. But then again, surely this is just a simple upgrade for the Lord of all French Beckers. I think so too. And I think, let's not forget, this is the grand finals. So if you've had some hidden strategies, especially considering that the series were a lot shorter in the previous rounds, and especially considering that Marine Lord was usually stomping, so he didn't have to resort for his hidden strategies whatsoever. I think one of the big things here is that um, this could easily be one of those uh, civilization picks that we simply haven't seen because he's been saving it up for the Grand Finals. Oh, well, Drongo, it's time for you to just open that nice little Cuban box that houses not Cuban cigars, but... Chinese picks. I know you want to talk to me a little bit about this. Puppy Paw, arguably, I'd say at this point, looking like the best Chinese player we have in competitive at the moment. Are we just looking at a cut, simple Barbican rush coming in on Frisian Marshes? We could definitely see that. Uh, one of the things that with Frisian Marshes is you do spawn in the corner, uh, and quite often all those resources are going to be towards the front. I don't think we're probably going to see a Barbican rush. I feel like it's very risky uh, to go for it. Uh, we, we have seen... You know, like the spears together with the Barbican Rush can be very difficult to deal with. Um, who knows? It, it, you could potentially have it, but I, f I feel like Puppy Paw, even with the option of a Barbican Rush, he could just play standard, and I reckon he'd like his chances here. This is a decent matchup for the Chinese. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is just going to be making sure he doesn't lose too many villages or doesn't lose any villages early on against that first night. Against John Dark, if he looks for a little bit of range on her as well, which I suspect, suspect is probably going to be the case in this matchup. Uh, just because of the, the early uh, early spears. But I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to have my notepad out. I'm going to be taking notes on everything that I see here because, uh, well, Puppy Paw has really changed the way that a lot of people play the Chinese. Uh, so I'm very excited to witness this live. And it's interesting to think about actually here, Lidical, is this is a very unique map in the way that it gets scouted. Typically, we say China is the S tier when it comes to scouts. But French and Jean have an interesting, unique little quality in Frisian Marshes that actually makes them a, a decent matchup, at least for that critical race towards sheep. Oh yeah, it's um, the classic French and French variant approach that we have. Knowing the layout of the map by being able to tell where the market, the neutral market spawn initially, is something that gives you an edge when it comes to deciding which direction to go with your initial scout. And that's usually what you just need to win that race towards the sheet. Now, as you kind of touched on that, obviously Chinese scouts, they will be on par with this, but uh, there's a lot more quote unquote gamble factor in Puppy Paw's initial scouting. If he chooses the wrong direction, Marine Lord could easily yoink most of the sheep for himself. And we've seen that being a big factor in the previous game, for instance, Marine Lord didn't have, or um, Puppy Paw didn't have a lot of sheep to work with. And that's something that definitely had an impact on his gameplay in that game. And, you know, the interesting thing is when you get that type of sheep haul, Drongo, that's when options other than just 2TC song booming comes in the picture. I think, actually, on average, we've been seeing more Fast Castle Palace Guard spam games out the Chinese, something that could even overwhelm a Civ like Jean d'Arc. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Um, I, I think going up against Jean d'Arc, 
you're always looking for a different angle of attack. Uh, and the palace guard is one that you've got to be very careful about because you can just run a single palace guard and now all of a sudden they have to send a single knight to follow it. And then the problem is if you go and do that another three or four times into different little spots, it can get annoying very quickly. Uh, so it's a great way to find space. Uh, but to be honest, I, I mean, with Puppy Paw, he, he's been a whole bag of tricks with the Chinese. If he if he just played one TC here, I really wouldn't be surprised. If he went two TC, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I, I, I'm just... I'm just glad we are in the presence of somebody so competent with this civilization because, yeah, as you know, I like this Civ. It's a cool Civ. Mm -hmm. And I think he looks a, a lot more firm, a lot more strong when he plays into the Feudal and the Castle Age, right, Lydico? I don't think we want to see any Dark Age shenanigans. It, if anything, I wonder if that's kind of creeping in Puppy Paw's mind because it felt like, you know, in that last game, we maybe saw a little bit of overkill aggro too early from the HRE. Yeah, that was one of the things I was a little concerned about regarding his gameplay. Um, particularly when you look back at the Jean d'Arc game he played, um, as I kind of touched on that um, before this game that we've just witnessed, he pulled villagers, trying to finish the game as quickly as possible. He didn't need to do that, but he still felt like he wants to do it. And I felt like he went maybe a little overly aggressive in the previous game. And this is something that he needs to be careful about. Playing aggressively and playing all-in are two fundamentally very different things. And he still has the lead. He doesn't necessarily need to take major gambles, especially because he's playing one of his signature civilizations over here. So I think he needs to be careful not to play too all-in-esque. Because, uh, again, he gambled a big one in the previous game, didn't work out. He gambles again and fails. It's an even series. And, you know, I I'm wondering if that kind of mentality because it worked in game three and game four, it's kind of stuck in his brain now, Drongo, right? Like the whole idea was just here and there, all inning versus aggro. We saw it work out in game three, game four, but I was highlighting in game three, that Delhi Byzantine game, a, a more harassy side flanking approach would have got him the same result. So maybe Puppy Paw just needs someone to pat him on the back. Maybe Wam needs to be there like, yo, you're playing well, but remember there are other times in the game where you can actually bear fruit here. Yeah, I think that's definitely it. And I suspect here in this matchup, he's going to be aware of that. The main timing I'm, I'm going to be looking for is the Imperial timing. Obviously, he's, he's pretty damn good in the Feudal, in the Castle Age, but for China in particular, the early Imperial Age is just so damn strong. When your opponent's still in the Castle Age and you're fighting up against those Imperial upgrades, it makes it so damn difficult. So that's what I'm going to be looking out for as his timing. Whether he pulls all of his villages or not, that's going to be a different matter. Okay, simple question. I know Drongo wants to answer this. Socks or Cox, what are we going to get in this game? Why not both? Who says we can't have socks and cocks? Because we have socks limitations and, cocks? and we're not getting a French or matchup. Instead, it's going to be Jean versus Chinese. We hop into Frisian Marshes to see if Marine Law is going to take us the distance or if a puppy paw can get on match point. Wait, he, he was talking about landmarks? Okay. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game number six. We are here on Frisian Marshes to witness puppy paw in his very first grand final of an STR event. It's a best of nine. I'm excited. Litical, you're excited. Let's get into it. Spawning in on the east corner of the map in the color blue, playing as the Chinese. It is Puppy Paw. And to the north, it is going to be Marine Lord playing as Jean d'Arc in pink and leveraging that little advantage that we discussed in the pregame. The fact that he knows the layout of the map based on the spawn position of those neutral markets gives him a bit of an edge when it comes to collecting sheep. And he has a respectable haul of sheep um, trailing his scout. Puppy oh. Paw. Up. This is Puppy Paws, and this is all right as well. But when you look at Marine Lords, that's where it gets very, very juicy. I, I know, I know. But it's just like when I'm playing the Chinese and I've got that many sheep, it's going to be a good game. I've got safe sheep or safe food for a long time. And that's all that matters. So I think he's just going to be happy with like that many sheep. Oh, oh my, oh my god. <laughs> Wow, he's very happy right now. Oh, yeah. he, he, you know, oh, that is that is that's a good number of sheep to have right there. That yeah. that is yeah, that's that's ludicrous. It's kind of crazy how 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 many sheep you can get on a map like this. But uh, I guess it's uh the is it? Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the creator of this map. Uh, yeah, me too. But it's the same person that has every single map littered, littered with sheep. Yes. I do believe. Oh, he he <laughs> loves he loves Rus. Uh, uh, Adney, Adney, that's his name. I remembered it. Uh, all right, well, it is going to be oh. indeed our Chamber of Commerce, a.k.a. our Cox. We're going to be getting them out for you. Imperial Academy on the other side here. But this gets scouted out straight away by Puppy Paw. And that's one of the big differences between this Jean de Vart game 
And the last one that we saw on this map is that it's going to be scattered out very early here. Uh, but I guess the uh, the outcome for that that game it didn't really change anyway, did it, Litical? I feel like one of the interesting things to look out for is that this setup is very similar to something that we've seen in the third place match between Louis and Beastie. Mm -hmm. That time there was an HRE versus Jean Dark matchup, but same thing, Jean Dark went for a trade, and ultimately she got overwhelmed by uh, by essentially mass men at arms from Burgrave Palace. I'm actually wondering if um, I I'm sure that Marine Lord has seen that. I'm actually wondering how he's going to change up his approach to Jean d'Arc in lights of that, considering that Chinese can do pretty much the same as well. They can play a semi-fast castle approach and flood you with palace guards. Yeah, they just supervise uh, the barracks instead. Uh, they can get some pretty crazy levels of production, but uh, we'll ride on board with Puppy Paw for a little bit as the age up comes through very early age up and have a look at this. It's going to be a wall on the corner which is going to be very difficult and annoying to deal with here. If this gets scouted out by the by uh, Marine Lord, it should be okay. Uh, but if it doesn't, it's going to be very tough because he'll know to just send Joan over towards that corner as soon as she's finished building that landmark. Uh, this is uh, a very, very interesting approach over here. But I love this from Puppy Paul, and here's why. The whole concept... Um, as uh, Marine Lord, by the way, is mining stone. So mm. this could just actually be a bait chamber of commerce um, and play heavy into two TCs. Or maybe he is actually expecting a move like this from Puppy Paw. But one thing is sure, you know that Jean is going to be building a landmark. You know that uh, the French won't really be making Dark Age units. So there is basically no chance of someone intercepting this villager. Yeah, it, the exception is the scout. If the scout spotted it, because then you can send Joan. But I think even at this stage, like, what are you going to do? You send Joan across the field, but the, I, I feel like it's going to be finished by the time there. You've got a really fortunate spawn here with this little bit of a wood line. Um, but the, the fact that Marine Lord's going for a 2TC, I'm kind of curious to see what he's going to do after that for the follow-up, because this is just like, to me, this is just sounding incredibly good for Puppy Paw, right? Like, the longer this game goes, the better it gets. I mean, we've we've seen some pretty crazy games where Jean Dark in the late game is incredible. I don't know if it's going to stack up against Puppy Paul's Chinese though, so we'll have to wait and see. But uh, this is going to be this is going to be a good game. We're going to have a we're going to have a, a long one. I can say that much. I honestly don't know what to expect from Marine Lord here because uh, playing two TCs when you've actually went for the Chamber of Commerce and hence you don't have uh, a essentially a school of cavalry to produce knights on, feels a bit of an awkward approach. So we're going to have to see how that um, that works out for him. At the same time, it gives him an insurance policy. Even if there is no trade, he's going to have this um, whole, uh, whole 2TC approach working. And I'm honestly wondering if this is indeed just the Bay Chamber of Commerce. He probably expected Poppy to scout him. Says, okay, it's going to be a trade build. I'm going to commit a villager to wall off this left side. And Marine Lord is just going to say, hello there, I'm playing two TCs. Now, I guess the unlucky detail here for Marine Lord is that the stone is right next to the Chamber of Commerce. So it's not like he could really hide this game plan from his opponent. Oh, he picked off one of the Vils. He almost lost Joan, but not going to be able to find it. So not a bad trade there for Marine Lord. He did lose a lot of health on Joan, though. Um, and yeah, that's unfortunate. But it's, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that Puppy Paw didn't see that coming. That he didn't think, oh, you know, maybe Joan will go for a snipe on my wood line. Uh, and, and just putting up that, that little bit of a wall there. But uh, you're not going to be able to find it. Trade is still moving out onto the map. I don't think he's aware just yet of the walls that are inside here. And we look like we look and see the village is actually getting quite comfy. It looks like it's going to be outpost. So maybe a couple of hand cannon slits just to help out as well. Very annoying. I actually think that Marine Lord is just trying to play ultra greedy now. Because that's the only explanation here. Traders and two DCs. Maybe he thought like, okay, if Puppy Paw plays multiple town centers, I can beat that with trade. But trade alone might not be enough. So what if I play two town centers and trade? Unfortunately, this trader is going to fall flat over here and Marine Lord is going to be like, oh shoot, this isn't going to work as I planned. Now, ironically, he's just going to send that trader to the very southern corner and it's not like Puppy Paw can do much to stop that. Yeah, what this does do is make it a little bit easier to reach, though. So we'll have to see exactly what the plan is for Puppy Paw. It looks like he was going to... He was thinking about going for a stable, but cancelled it. He's probably going to put down the second TC, then he'll get the stable down. Uh, but, yeah, this, this is quite a common 
I wouldn't say it's a common, but this is a, a strategy that we've seen before. I remember watching a game that B played up against Beastie, where he basically did the same thing. The idea was, I'm just going to get my early eco upgrades, and then I'm going to get my traders for that, and I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll just call it seven traders. If I lose them, I lose them. If I keep them, I keep them. Uh, and the whole idea is that he's going to go 2TC into it. Uh, and then that essentially allows him to boom, um, but still maintain some pretty decent production, still have some good gold income in the early game as well. Because if we click on each of these traders, you have a look how much these are pulling through. These are going to be pulling like 120s, maybe 130s. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's a nice guess. So, and John is nearby. So oh, the villager that, isn't going to be able to wall in this corner. Yep. Yep. That's a dead vill. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Puppy Paws lost two vills already in this game, but he's got the second TC up. He's got Song Dynasty. So if we were to look at scaling here, you're, you're talking about three villagers per minute for Marine Lords Town Centers and four villagers a minute for Puppy Paws Town Centers. So after 10 minutes, it's 60 villagers versus 80 villagers. So there's still a bit of a difference between these two when it comes to this economic scale. The one difference, of course, is the fact that we've got traders out. Yeah, it's, it's going to be the military scale, though. Puppy Paw is heading into Castle Age here. And again, this is going to play into this whole concept of flooding your opponent with palace guards here. But look at what Marine Lord is up to as well. This is what I kind of touched on when I highlighted the third place match. If he gets all, uh, pushed by palace guards and he's still in Feudal Age, he's going to have a tough time. He cannot really mass produce knights that can deal with like mass palace guards, especially when they have uh, spearmen accompanying them. So what Marine Lord is doing is banking up resources. He wants to have a reasonable castle age timing as well, so that if palace guards are a thing, he's going to be able to meet them with Arboletria. In fact, he built double ranges just for one archer. That's actually not for the archer. That's going to be for future Arboletria. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're 100% on the money with that. And we can see right now a little bit of a, of a retreat coming through right here. Attempting to avoid Joan. She's on that south side of the base. Lots of gold over here as well. But uh, yeah, Castle Age now comes through before the 10-minute mark. So not a bad time here for Puppy Paw. Uh, does have uh, quite a few Imperial officials out as well. Um, I'd love to see if he's picked up the Imperial Examinations tech just yet. I suspect he probably has. Uh, we'll, we'll quickly check in on the Imperial Academy shortly. Maybe. Hopefully. No. Puppy's going to play Lancers, by the way. He's not going to play Thalas Guards here. Ooh, interesting. This is a smart move. It basically guarantees that the only thing that can really hurt... Ooh, uh, the only ooh. thing that can really hurt you here is Spears. Uh, I don't think that's a big deal. And I, I know that people always seem to be going for the Imperial Officials. I don't even care if I lose Imperial Officials because you got to remember when you lose a villager, you've lost that villager for the rest of the game until, you know, you reach your critical point of villager gathering, which is, might be like 130 vills. So if you lose that villager right now, you've lost that for the next 10 plus minutes. Whereas you lose an Imperial Official, you just click a button on the Imperial Academy and you just rebuild it instantly. It's not a big loss at all. So I, I, I mean, actually back to differ. Um, because here in this case, uh, here in this case, they sniped the official that was supervising the stable. So this definitely hindered the night production from Puppy Paw. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. That's going to slow him down quite a bit. And that's going to buy a little bit of time here for Marine Lord. Keep in mind, he does have... He's got some decent production going out here, despite being Castle Age. We see two Arbolatria in queue. He's got eight knights on the field already. So this is a, this is a decent amount of units that he's got. Lance is now going to be coming out here. Keep in mind, Joan's still level two. She's going to be doing her best to run away. But with the Lancers here, fortunately, the Knights are going to be able to turn around and save her. That's a lot of Lance or a lot of Knights out on the field here. Now, keep in mind that I think that was a Guild Hall that we saw saw coming on that top side of the map. Did you catch it? It was a Guild a Hall indeed. It? it was? I think the worrisome detail here for Puppy Paw is that his Knight production is very lackluster. At the end of the day, now we're looking at um, French knights with candled saddles. They'll be superior to the lancers of the Chinese. We've got nine of those for Marine Lord. He's been building them ever since he was in Feudal Age. And we also have Arboletria out there for uh, for Marine Lord. So what Marine Lord can do is keep the Arboletria at home to prevent raids and use his own knights to hit the enemy eco. I just feel like uh, this is one of those games where Puppy Paw is trying to do something similar to Marine Lord, but he is behind in every possible way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. It looks like we're going to have ourselves a little bit of a sacred site capture here. Uh, the longer the game goes, the better it gets for Puppy Paw. But uh, I've seen some really good games from Joan of Arc uh, in, in the late game. So, you know, I'm 
I'm pretty impressed by her power in Imperial Age, so we'll have to wait and see exactly how it goes, but as I said earlier, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this game does go the distance to, you know, post-Imperial sort of thing. But, that would uh, be very much welcome, I feel like, for Puppy Paw. He wants to play a long game here. In that case, Chinese is going to be great, but in this early to mid castle age, Shalandark should have uh, the advantage over here. Nice raid by Puppy Paw, though, intercepting these traders as they are heading back. This is exactly what he needs to do to slowly start stretching Marine Lord's attention out and take pressure away from his own base. Yeah, yeah, 100% right. Um, let's uh, let's check in now, down towards that south side. Another trade is going to be caught out of position here. Not really out of position. I mean, you kind of expect it on the trade line, but uh, yeah, caught. caught with his pants down. Let's put it that way. But uh, numbers are starting to really build here for Marine Lord, and Puppy Kapoor is going to do the right thing. He's actually going into Spears now, uh, so going to be looking to try and counter, but it looks like Joan's going to get picked off in the middle. It's going to be close. Oh, she pops a heal and manages to micro away out. Boar still here as well. It's going to go down. But uh, yeah, Puppy Paw not able to snipe out Joan just yet. I want to highlight the detail that Puppy Paw hasn't managed to kill. Actually... Destroyed value just said 120. It was a zero a second ago. So I was about to say he hasn't actually managed to kill anything, but there is no way. He killed two traders. So something is definitely off with the UI there. But nevertheless, when it comes to army destroyed, he barely did anything against uh, Marine Lord's forces. And that's why Marine Lord is up to 15 knights and 15 armor entry. Nice little raid on that top side. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about those values. One of the things I've found is those values are completely off. So basically useless. Uh, but have a look at the numbers that are building up here. Marine Lord's got that quintessential French force oh, of wait. Ablutrae and Knights. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Puppy Paul wants to go into Imperial. Ooh, okay, okay. Is He needs to do Great Wall Gatehouse, though. He surely can't be doing anything but Great Wall Gatehouse here. Let's have a look and see which landmark he goes for. He's got a little bit of stone. Yeah, he's got five bills on stone. I think he's going to be putting down the Great Wall Gatehouse. So he probably wants to put that down. He can he can either go for the back of the base or he can go for the gold. And it looks like he's going to go for the gold here. He doesn't really have farms at this stage, I don't think. Can we, does he still have sheep? Is he still doing uh, no, sheep? No, no, no. There is no way. He was on berries before. Um, he's okay, on shorefish right. right now. And he's about to, he's about to deplete those uh, pawns close to him. He's just now making a farm transition. He actually walled off the northern side of his base. This is a fairly safe location. Is, is that making a farm transition? Is that stone walled off? Otherwise, this nope. is very Red. dangerous. Yeah. So it, this is where it gets hard for the Chinese because you you really want to defend your farms. You know, I don't think he really cares that much about the gold. I, I feel like it might be a little bit of a misplacement from his um, Great Wall Gatehouse because you really want to be covering farms with that. Uh, but it looks like we're going to be seeing a or level three on Joan coming through yeah. now. So she's gone up, but now with Imperial Age coming through as well, it means that Elite Spears can come online, which are very, very good in this situation. Um, we don't have uh, Royal Institute, which means no Gambesons just yet. At least I don't exactly. Think so. That's I don't a big thing. Villagers will be intercepted here, so Poppy is going to lose a couple. But yeah, without Gambesons, those uh, Arboletri don't stand uh, up as a really good fight, at least, against these Spears. And we have a Nesto Beast firing from the back line as well. This is a tough defense for Poppy Paul but a must-have if he wants to have a chance in this game. Yeah, veterans he coming through on those spears, not being supervised, just taking a long time. These are hardened feudal age spears right now, despite Puppy Paw being in the Imperial Age. He's got no stone in the bank to throw down a keep. Nesta Bees is trying to fire off, but there are so many Royal Knights underneath this town center. Yules are going to try their best to come through and repair. Hold, hold, hold the line. They're getting a little bit of damage on, but all the spears are gone. He's got five left remaining, six in queue. And the villagers have managed to just repeatedly heal this bad boy up. But look at the vill count. Look at how many workers have been taken out here. I think Puppy Paw knows that the game might be over. When you've lost this many workers, he's lost 42. I think this is it. I think this is the game. Yeah, that, There's no way you're coming back it. from this. This he's is it. All his whole eco is gone here, Ozzy, and, you know, I was looking um, a little surprised when um, he actually decided to go into Imperial because he had nothing back at home to defend with. But, yeah, as you kind of highlighted, even the veterans he was missing from these spears when he took the fight. He was lacking numbers, but he was also lacking severe quality as he is tapping out of this game, and this one takes Marine Lord back into the series. Now it's three apiece. Jeez Louise. This is a back and forth series. We're just going 1 0 1 1, 2 1 2 2, 3 2 3 3. It doesn't stop. These two are just trading game for game for game. And uh, yeah, so I, I think like analyzing that game there, 
a, a big issue is knowing that if you're going Imperial, you're going to need some sort of defense against that push. So one of the big things for China that you're looking for is throwing down a keep to keep you safe. But against that many units, that was a lot of units. And keep in mind, I guess we're still pretty early in this game, right? Like 17 minutes is still pretty early. You don't expect that many units, but I guess that's just the 2TC that's coming out from the the French or from uh, Jean d'Arc. It's just been a really nice push that um, that Marine Lord's been able to do off there. Explosive push. Yeah, it's, it's the fact that he was able to preserve his army for the entirety of the game. He basically lost no army and he just slowly built up the knights, slowly built up the artillery. Whereas for Puppy Paw, he slowly lost his knights. In general, he didn't have a very robust economy. Spent a lot of resources on Imperial just to get absolutely nothing in return. Um, those kinds of things kind of snowballed the game out of control. But we will be heading into Rocky Canyon over here, which leaves one home map remaining for both of these players for game number eight and potentially game number nine. Mm, good matchup here. Japanese, Delhi Sultanate. I'm looking forward to this. I, I love watching a good Japanese game, so that'll be exciting. Rocky Canyon, pretty decent map here for the Delhi Sultanate as well. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to see exactly how this one's going to go down. Uh, does this actually go the distance? I've got a sneaky suspicion it might look cool. These two guys seem very evenly matched. This is kind of wild. Uh, I, would, I would love if it went all the way to the distance and give us a real nail-biter. But the last couple of games, I felt like Puppy was starting to run out of juice. And let's not forget, Chinese was his go-to civilization. Mm. I just feel like maybe he slowed down a little. Maybe Marine Lord found the response to that uh, aggressive game that uh, Puppy Boy is playing, that all-in style approach that we often see from him in this series. And in that case, if he really found the answer, uh, we could easily see a 5-3 over here at the end. But... We are going to have Japanese making their debut in this series over here. That's not something that we've seen so far in the six games that we've witnessed. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the Japanese and seeing the direction the puppy ball goes. I think at the moment, they're, they're pretty one-dimensional. And I suspect we're probably going to see a lot of spears coming out from Marine Lord early here. But I, I think to lead this one off, I'm, I'm kind of curious how it's going to go down for puppy ball. Because naturally, you want to go into Castle Age. You want to try and get your Shira out straight away. But then going into a stable might not make sense against the Delhi Sultanate. This is going to, this is going to be a fun matchup. I, I don't know if you can really play standard Japanese here. But, you know, um, there is one more person who needs to give his opinion on this. Uh, and that's definitely not my um, El weird Gato? messed up cam. Is that, is that but... you, Elgato? <laughs> Elgato. Hey, Elgato. Hey, Elgato. I didn't realize they sponsored us on this event. Okay, you get a free shout out, but no others after that. Um, Yes, welcome back to the set. This is getting kind of wild. We're getting a little bit deeper, but we felt it was a nice little break moment before we get towards a match point situation. Insane turnaround. We now have a free, free scoreline situation in this best of nine. But obviously, let's get the most important thing out of the way. You've still got time now. Can we just shout out Poppy Poor Marine Lord for making sure you have a few more hours to use that code? Why have you not used it yet? I, like, I've been checking the numbers. I know a bunch of you just genuinely did not actually go across and use it. Do I need to list off the reasons again? Do I need to shame you for being a, a filthy Malian picker? Or maybe you're just oh, a one-trick Japanese guy who loves Onabagisha a little bit too much, but you don't want your wifey in real life to know about it? I can actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to do confession time here. As a MOBA player, I do enjoy Jean. But I realize that if my... Pearl, uh, my partner, my girlfriend, knew that I played this much Yon, she'd probably leave me. She'd leave me for one of those like Japanese main chads. I'd be completely screwed. Thanks to Surfshark, I can hide that and many other secrets of the internet that I partake in. You need to take advantage of this, guys. Remember, like, there's so many situations where you just get spam emails, you find your data ending up on weird kind of locations. You know you hear those stories about data leaks and also these marketing companies having all that info? Surfshark can help you out with that. So definitely check them out. And once again, just a reminder, Extra three months on us, $60 or $75 for 2.25 years worth of coverage. That works out, that equates to less than $3 a month. Take advantage of this absolute steal. But you know what? We're at risk of uh, meaning to steal the fun and the fury of the Delhi Japanese matchup. You see, they brought me in for a reason. I may have lied to you. It's not just Jean d'Arc. I have actually another account that registers as me actually being a Botswana that I mainly use to play the Japanese. I am a Japanese officiado, and I can tell you this matchup has sent a bunch of swings and roundabouts to the Delhi and the Japanese. Originally, the Delhi 
was seen to be a hard count by the Japanese with these vicious fast castle builds. But thanks a um, big part into Dumu, especially in the group stage, and also in his prep before the tournament. Shout out our boy lad, Benny Boy, an absolutely magnificent Deli Officiado. He found an, an interesting little way in his labs to uh, overcome the Japanese threat. He ID'd for us that this matchup is all about baiting prolonged feudal to get in towards castle age. It's critical to actually find that right balance, that nice little spice, that mix that allows you to keep your opponent dragging their heels, building that feudal army when you make the switch over. We've seen amazing builds out of Dimu, uh, especially around the Dome of Faith into a fast castle timing, allowing to flood the fields when the Japanese are still stuck contesting feudal age. But where this gets interesting, is if there's another player on the other side that has incredibly impressed me in this tournament on the Japanese, it has to be Poppy Paul. He had some remarkable performances with this Civ recently. Uh, one notable game, I believe it was up against B, where he went for a 2TC Mass Yumi approach to contest the Delhi, bait them in and overcome them. And folks, if you think I'm hoping him talking about Yumi this much, I assure you I'm not. Puppy Paw, I think, out of all the players I've been watching, has been spamming Yumi more than anyone else. It's a very interesting unit comp. In the Feudal Age, if you actually get all the upgrades, Steel Dower plus the Bannerman Aura, Steel Dower itself gives a 25% damage increase to those Yumi. What you have to keep in mind is Japanese, we've seen some interesting builds around the idea of Mount Samurai. Phenomenal, yes. Yes, they're a premium unit, but they still lean to that idea of Zerglings. And everything else about the Japanese is about Zergling. So why should Yumi be any different? This is what makes this interesting, is we could actually have a game where it's just a stare down to see who is going to blink and try to get out of Feudal first. And if the Japanese wait around for that right moment, if they scale into that mass Feudal army, you're going to find them to be an unstoppable beast. But you know what? It is time to get into it, decide who is going to find themselves on match point in the Grand Finals Elite Classic 2. We take to our seventh game, Japanese versus Delhi, to see who can break the tie. All right, we're back, Litacor. You ready? We got 55 seconds to go. All right. I I'm going to ask you. Ready. What I do you couldn't reckon? be more ready, to be honest. We've seen an absolutely impressive grand final so far, um, Aussie. We had some crazy games, some impressive moments. Talk about, you know, um, the Lipony game, how it ended, the cliffside game from Puppy Paul. We've seen a bit of a lost momentum here for him. And this suddenly turns into almost a must win for him here. We have two more maps remaining, Bridges and the Gorge. Those are the home maps of the players, one each. And we do have, of course, French, English, and Malians remaining for Marine Lord on the other side. Ottomans are still available for Puppy Paw, so he's got still that one wild card, a civilization that we've seen being extremely successful in some of the previous sets that we've witnessed in this event. But Ozzy, we're just seconds away from game number seven on Rocky Canyon. It is going to be the Delhi Sultanate facing off against the Japanese. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, gosh, you can hear my voice. Sorry, it's getting a little bit early in the morning here. 7.40 a.m. I think I've been awake for about 24 hours, but let's get into it. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to game number seven here in your best of nine grand final series for the Elite Classic 2. Spawning in on the south side of the map in the color pink, playing as the Delhi Sultanate. Representing Gentle Mate, it is Marine Lord. But he has been anything but gentle to his opponent in the last couple of games. Papi pa is facing off against him with the color blue playing as the Japanese. A civilization that he loves to utilize and he's extremely proficient with it. To a certain right. extent, it's a meta pick from Marine Lord. Maybe not so much from Papi pa. Japanese is not your conventional civilization playing this map. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what Puppy Paw's got for us, man. I, I'm kind of I'm rubbing my hands together. I just I, just give it to me, Puppy Paw. What you gonna throw at us today? Is it gonna be? It's gonna be a fast castle, right? I can't see any other way that he tries to play this one. Maybe he gets a couple of units out just to be a little bit annoying early on. But other than that, man, I don't know. What do you reckon, Litical? What do you What do you see if you cast your hands down upon that dreary ball that provides? What's it called? You know that little thing that they do the the ball. The, I was going to say the conveyancer. <laughs> Do you know what a conveyancer is? It's like a, it's a, it's a legal professional, but it's it's not. Uh, clairvoyant, that's the one I'm thinking of, clairvoyant. Uh, slightly different from a conveyancer. Uh, yeah, what do you see on your in your crystal ball, Litacore? Tell me. I'm seeing some Onabugeisha to open things with. I think it's actually mm -hmm. something that you can utilize a lot to stretch out the defenses of the Delhi, like be very aggressive. 
in the very uh, end, this could easily turn into a massive Archer versus Yumi battle. But this is one of those matchups where uh, the Delhi Sultan needs to be a little cautious committing heavily into Archers, because Japanese can pivot very quickly to Mass Samurai, and Mass Samurai will just eat your Archers alive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and I like what you're thinking. I think Onibagaisha, just to start off, definitely makes some sense. Uh, we're probably going to be seeing Ghazi Raiders come out, so don't be surprised if you see a couple of Spears join the party, but I, I wonder what that castle timing is going to be. One thing that I'm noticing, though, is the placement of the Kura Storehouse. Normally, when we see that fast castle, Kura Storehouse is normally positioned towards the wood line. Not going to be happening today. And I wonder why that is. What's the plan? What's, what's the go, puppy boy? What do you got in there? Meanwhile, Marine Lord, let's talk a little bit about him. Obviously, the wheelbarrow is coming through. He's playing the Delhi Sultanate. Tower of Victory is on the way. No real surprise there. It's not going to be mixing with the Dome of the Faith today. But uh, I'm suspecting we're probably going to see some big guns out of him. Uh, decent number of sheep here for him as well. I, I think... Does he still have sheep uh, outside? Yeah, what have we got? 10 sheep, 11 sheep. Not a bad number here for him. Compare that over to his opponent. What are, what are we looking at here for Puppy Poor? He's got 10 sheep as well. So they've split it right down the middle, these two players, with regard to sheep count, which is absolutely fine by me. Yeah, I think one of the big things with the Kura Storehouse is that it gives you a consistent supply of farms, and that's immensely valuable when you consider that uh, it makes your farm transition a lot smoother, and you never have this window where you suddenly run out of food and you have absolutely no food income. I think... That's immensely valuable for Feudal Age Combat, and it's something that we're going to have to keep an eye out on. Now, I love how it's positioned towards the back, especially if Puppy Paul ends up walling in between the two forests he has. In that case, I think that Kura Storehouse is very safe, and it's going to give him a very robust and consistent food economy for Feudal Age. All right, well, have a look at this. We have a second town center coming down. A little bit of a strange thing to notice is that this is not the typical build order we would see for a 2TC Japanese. In fact, we haven't seen a 2TC Japanese for a long time. Uh, not, not since the likes of, say, Demu back in the day where he came up with that 2TC build order that just kind of went crazy for a little bit there in the meta. Um, but, uh, yeah, going to be going onto the gold early and then jumping over onto the stone. And maybe that's a little bit about forecasting what your plan is, right? Because if you spot out that, hey, my enemy's gathering up lots and lots of stone, you know he's going to make a second town center. But now I like this that a element lot. of surprise. I like this a lot for Japanese because, let's not forget, they can fortify their town centers. Pushing into those is a lot more difficult. And there is a second um, aspect of this, something that just actually popped into my mind. Normally, when you play a greedy game or against a greedy opponent playing multiple TCs, what do you see? Players go for Siege Engineering, they bring in the Rams, the Hero Siphon. But that's a lot more difficult to do with the Delhi because it takes a long time to research those things. Delhi thrive in open field battles and securing those sacred sites and getting map control. They're not so good when it comes to this feudal age regression against multi TC builds. Yeah, that's definitely true. I've seen a number of games that have kind of blown my mind. I, I remember a game that I watched recently. It was the Roos up against uh, the uh, the Delic Sultanate. And Roos player just played 2TC and then just played standard like Archer play and just beat the Delic. And I was like, uh, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, you, you just, you can't just beat the Delic on 2TCs and they're on 1TC and they're putting all their resources into only making an army and you're making villages and uh, doing silly shenanigans like second town centers. Didn't didn't make sense to me, but obviously it's uh it's something that the Delhi Sultan have have a little bit of trouble with. So we'll see exactly how Marine Lord looks to play this here. Uh, I'd love to see him get out onto those sacred sites really quickly. Third sacred site might be a little bit hard though. Look at the positioning on it. Yeah, obviously this is something that you can predict as you um, plan for this game or this map in particular. The sacred site spawns are very consistent throughout um, the map generations. So you can game plan going into a game knowing how the sacred sites will spawn. So um, Puppy Paul knows fully well that one of those sacred sites will be difficult to secure or potentially keep under Marine Lord's control. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing to note. And like, maybe that that could be what Puppy Paul is looking to play into, you know. I can get away with going for a second TC because that's a very awkward angle to fight into uh, for Marine Lord and, and that third TC or that third uh, sacred site location. Nice little steal away here from uh, Marine Lord's base. Yoink. Don't mind if I do. Gets himself a, a little bit of a sheep. 
Uh, but now starting to take out infrastructure around the base. We see a, a farmhouse out here probably going to be taken out as well. Uh, but Marine Lord is going to be moving towards the middle of the map. We start to see sacred sites are going to be very quickly ticked over as uh, we have got Sanctity that is now online. There are so many things to look out for here, Aussie. For instance, Marine Lord is playing double blacksmith. And one of those blacksmiths went for uh, Siege Engineering immediately. He's actually skipping the combat upgrades to get Siege Engineering. He might be thinking about playing aggressive. But at the same time, Poppy Boy is playing into Horsemen. And he could double down on Cavalry play with an Uma Banner man. And Horsemen are very effective when it comes to fighting Gazi Raiders. And Marine Lord doesn't seem to expect this um, kind of an approach. He's actually making archers. Everything that Marine Lord is making can be beaten with Horsemen from Poppy. Mm, yeah, I do like this a lot. This makes a lot of sense. And this is something that people often neglect. It's, it's kind of like that whole 2v2 theory of, you know, what, what beats horsemen and archers? And the answer is just double horsemen. Um, and I think it's the, very much the same here is you've got Marine Lord who's just naturally defaulting to Ghazi Raider and archers. And of course, that horseman still exists. So unless he put, puts the barracks down and starts making spears, he's not going to have an easy time. And look, there it is. Within, within seconds of saying it, we see the spearman now in queue for Marine Lord. So he knows exactly what's up here. He says, hey, if you want to make horsemen, go for it. But you're going to need to make some Yumi Archer as well. I think the reason why this is good for Puppy Paw is because this might be setting up on a boot here. And this was something that it's one of the most powerful units that Japanese can work with. And if he's posturing with a bunch of horsemen, Marine Lord is not going to invest that heavily into archers. So Unabugesha could easily reign supreme on the battlefield. Yeah, th this could be really difficult to deal with. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised though if we just see a whole bunch of, uh, of Yumi Ashigaru. Uh, they're particularly strong, um, especially once a good mass is built up of them. And I, I feel like this is a decent matchup to be doing it here. Uh, but uh, he's now going to be looking to secure up an additional sacred site. We see the central sacred site has been captured. On the south side, we've got that one that's... I suspect it is being captured currently. Is that what we're seeing? Well, people has been very active trying to deny these sacred sites with his own horsemen. And you see, he's trying to do the same thing here as well, contesting the sacred site with the horsemen, while also engaging the Gazi Raiders himself. At the end of the day, he built a respectable eco lead. He's got a 10 worker lead already. He has uh, denied the Sacred Sight from his opponent. He's pushing away the Scholar as well. I think he's doing extremely well given the circumstances. Yeah, I agree, especially considering he's on 2 TC. He's got an 11 Villager lead already. It still hasn't paid off just yet, that second TC, but it'll take some time. But once it's there, you're really going to start to notice it. And we now see, is that a market being thrown down for Marine Lord? Is, is, oh, he's going to be using the the gold from the market and then converting that. So he's probably going to be buying some wood here uh, by the looks of it. Um, so that means he's going to be doubling down on Feudal Age. He's, there, there is no plan at all to go into Castle Age at this stage, and he's going to be continuing uh, to purchase and, uh, and construct or train more scholars here. Bannermen are on the way, though, and the puppy is starting to mass some Yumi as well. Numbers are looking very good for Marine Lord, and let's not forget, he has gotten Siege Engineering, so... He could actually play super aggressive over here, and Papi Paul doesn't really have an army that can stop that right now. And speaking of aggressive, there it is. That's going to be the first of the battering rams. A little bit before the 11 minute mark in this game. All three sacred sites are captured as well. Spear's going to be moved out to the bottom side to just neutralize any units that are down there. But Marine Lord feeling good about himself. I, I think this is kind of par for the course where Puppy Paw knew this game would go, right? Like, you know that you're going to be losing three sacred sites early. This is pretty standard. Um, and the idea is that you, you've held off a decent amount, right? Like, it, uh, the worst thing that can happen is what Lucifron does, where three sacred sites all get taken at seven minutes. And you're like, what do I do now? I'm going to lose the game at 17 minutes, and I can't do that. He's bought himself plenty of time. Like, he's got until the 20-minute mark, pretty much, to make sure that his defense is solid. And that should be more than enough for that second TC to pay off. Oh, certainly. And right now, Poppy Paul has no desire to fight this battle on an open field. He's poking around, seeing if he can chip away with some damage here. But ultimately, he wants to take this fight under his town center and this tower. And as much as Marine Lord has almost double the forces, it's a very different scenario when you consider fighting under the Japanese town centers. All right, well, he's going to be looking to neutralize the Sacred Site on the south. A couple spears are going to be joining the fray. And even if he just holds this Sacred Site or stands on it, it's just going to be annoying because it delays that Sacred Victory. 
And it's not that Marine Lord's going for it 100%, but he always wants to just keep that open as an option for him because it can become a real threat. You know, if he's getting walled in and uh, maybe you go castle, you get a keep or two, then you can have some real trouble. But looks like for the moment, we'll be sticking it to Feudal Age as the Ghazi Raiders come through, focusing down this outpost. All the units inside are going to be revealing themselves. It looks like a bunch of villagers there, uh, which is unfortunate. Yumi Archer is going to continue teeing off, focusing down the front horsemen as well and there's plenty of units making their way through but there's gonna be two workers that go down in the mix uh was it yumi archers it looks like yumi archers that were inside there no they, they are villagers. Uh, no, they, they were workers and, villagers. Uh, to be honest they absorbed a lot of damage over here and some of them could have been killed they were low hp but i think one of the big things was that the spearmen of marine lord they couldn't actually get to the enemy horsemen because their own horsemen blocked them out so and the spearmen got picked off without doing any significant damage out there and for now, Puppy Paul lives to see another day. He is going to get housed over here. His houses are getting taken out. So now he's 90 out of 90 population. But uh, I think he's thinking about engaging this, but he's a little hesitant. And reinforcements should soon come in for Marine Lord. All right. Well, I might have a little bit of additional commentary here. So you'll have to excuse me. I've got a certain baby Drongo who's going to be helping me out, mate. You call out anything you see. You see circles, you say circles. If you see rainbows, you say rainbows. But for the moment, we're just going to be looking at some destruction. Uh, but people are still housed, and this is actually hindering his ability to field the new units. Suddenly, Marine Lord has basically twice the army compared to his counterpart. Yumi Bannerman is out on the field, though, so there is a little buff out there for uh, Puppy Paul's forces, but losing all these houses slows down his military buildup, and now he's facing three battering rounds. Yeah, this is going to be difficult for him to hold. The Yumi archers, at the moment, decent number, 26 of them. He's going to try and kite his way backwards. Ghazi Raiders looking to try and make some, make some damage here on the front, but the spears as well. Just going to be the focus of these Yumi. Village is going to be falling back as well, and he's looking to focus down that town center. The Battering Ram's looking to, to target the um, the farmhouse instead, so not missing out a little bit on that DPS on the town center. Vil's repairing up, trying his best to take this town center out before the defense can come through. An insufficient wood, not the time to be having it at, at this stage of the game. 14 minutes through, he needs to keep this town center up, and Puppy Paw. 12 villager advantage. That's all he's going to have this game. He's lost 11. Marine Lord's looking solid in this game, number seven. Yeah, this defense is stalling out here for Poppy Paw. He only has Yumi now, and he's still facing a couple of Ghazi Raiders. Rams are still pushing forward. You need to pull villagers to take out these Rams. That's exactly what Poppy is doing. He lost the town center. He's now trying to just body block all these Rams, take them out. Looks like Marine Lord's push stalled out a little as well, but Marine Lord still has all three sacred sites here. He managed to take out the expansion town center. He's cleaning up Puppy Paw's army. I feel like for the first time in this series, Ozzy, Marine Lord could have the score lead. I think that might be happening here. This is looking very good for Marine Lord. The fact that Puppy Paw has now lost that village account as well, that is going to be a big factor. And indeed it is. That is going to be the game Marine Lord manages to take the score lead. Wow. And I tell you what, that's a pretty good time to take the score lead when you're at match point, isn't it? Oh, certainly. Um, as the saying goes, you only have to lead exactly once in a series at the very end. And I just feel like for Marine Lord, he reacted extremely well to what Puppy Paw did here. I absolutely loved the 2TC horseman build that Puppy Paw went for, but Marine Lord's reaction was so quick. The moment he saw the second TC, Instead of doing the conventional thing with the Delhi, which is grabbing the ordinary blacksmith upgrades for combat, he used one of those uh, um, blacksmiths to use um, and get uh, the Siege Engineering upgrade. Siege Engineering comes in early, and this allowed him to go for an aggressive ramp push at, the, at a very early timing and just ultimately snowballed the game. Yeah, that's, that's a really smart move because it's not something that we often see. You know, sometimes the, the double blacksmith comes in and naturally the first thing you look for is ranged armor, ranged attack, get my double ranged upgrades in from my ranged units. That's a really normal thing that you do. So I think it's very well played from Marine Lord to identify, hey, I need to take this town center out sooner rather than later. Don't let it go through. But it looks like we have worked out what our new map is going to be. We've worked out what our new matchup is going to be. And... Ooh, this is a good matchup. We've got ourselves English versus the Mongols on Gorge. How do you feel about this, Litico? Uh, it's a gorgeous matchup, I must say, but 
again, one of the things I'm looking at here is that when you have Mongols, Gorge plays out so differently. If you have two civilizations that can war, Gorge easily goes into our long games. But with Mongols, it's a very different story. Now, Poppy Pop could play into this super aggressive game. We're going to have to see if he does that. We're going to have to see if he plays uh, trade. But one thing is sure. He lost this game, and he opted to take his own home map here. Even if he wins this game, a decider is going to be played on Marine Lord's map. So I feel like this is where Marine Lord starts to benefit from the things we've discussed before. That is the fact that he used up his opponent's home maps early on. So for this last portion of the series, Marine Lord actually has the home map advantage. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting factor to consider. I mean, going, I'll be honest, going into Bridges, wait, will they get to redraft for the mm -hmm. next game? Okay, because I was going to say he'll have the Marlians and French, which are absolutely terrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, Mar Marlians not too bad, but the French, yeah. Um, okay, that's that'll be very interesting if that's the case, because that means you've basically got two S tier sieves for whatever you want to do on Bridges. You know, you want to do Chinese versus English or something like that, go for it. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, okay. Let's focus on what we've got here. We've got Gorge. We've got Puppy Poor attempting to get himself back up onto an even footing with Marine Lord. The Mongols versus English. This is a common matchup that happens. And I know a lot of lower level players have trouble with this because naturally the first thing you do when you're playing the Mongols is you, you put a barracks down and you get spears out. And from the English perspective, it's very simple to counter this. I just build my landmark and then I make a longbow and then you scream and cry and you go home. Uh... So I'd, I'd be expecting that from Puppy Paw's side, we're probably going to see some early horsemen out and then maybe look to trade. The only thing to note is that trade on this map, it's a bit awkward. Your neutral trading posts are in the middle of the map, not in the dead center, but they are on the edges in the middle. Um, so this will be something to keep an eye out for. But Marine Lord running a an English army, not going to be particularly mobile. Another factor to consider. Oh, certainly. I think that's one of the big things to look out for. English... They are notoriously slow moving. At the same time, Mongols do have Dark Age horsemen. They have Kashyyyk in Feudal Age. A lot of tools that they can utilize to exploit that lack of mobility. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this. I think this is going to be good. You've, you've really got the mo most mobile civilization up against the civilization that's arguably the least mobile. Who, what civilizations are less mobile than this? I, c I can't think of one. I just want to make longbows all day, ladies and gentlemen. Speaking of longbows, it's time to get into it. We are here on Gorge, Litacore. This is game number eight. Now, keep in mind, this is the best of nine series. So that means that if this game is won by Marine Lord, that this is your final game in the series. However, if it's won by Puppy Paw, well, the good news is we've got another one coming up after this. But let's get into it and introduce our players for today, spawning in the north side of the map. As the English, playing in the color pink, representing Gentle Mate, we've got Marine Lord. And on the other side, a player that fell from a 3-1 to one lead to a 3-4 scoreline. Papipa with the color blue as the Mongols. Victory is still within reach for him, Ozzy, but you feel like momentum started to shrink. Maybe it's attrition from a long set. Maybe it's just uh, Marine Lord sorting out to have a suitable way of playing against the play style of Papipa. Whichever the case, the last couple of games have been fairly one-sided towards Marine Lord. Poppy Paul is looking to change this. If he cannot, it's going to be the end of the story for him here in the Grand Finals. Indeed, indeed it will be. And we already start to see something interesting happening here with Marine Lord. He's going to be going with a 3-3 opening, which means three on food, three on gold. Uh, popularized by Divine DFP, my boy Divine. Uh, and he's looking for an early wheelbarrow here. So making sure he's got a bit more mobility. Now, I want to check in with Puppy Paw and see how his economy is doing back home because it looks like we're not even going to have any Dark Age units coming out from him. It looks like it's just going to be the good old classic villager action that we see here. So not, e not even a stable getting thrown down here in the Dark Age. No outposts, no nothing. He's I, I wonder what we're going to see out of him today. Does he look to go into mass archers? Maybe get some horsemen out potentially? Could be the way. So many options, let it go. Uh, I think one of the issues for Marine Lord, issues, quote unquote, is uh, resources not being safe. Particularly his gold is very much exposed. There is no early Dark Age aggression so far from Poppy Paw. What, what I think could be interesting to look out for is exactly what Poppy Paw is doing a silver tree. 
you actually mentioned this just before the game began. English is probably the slowest civilization in the game. And oftentimes, this can be punished by going for a trade, simply because the English will struggle to chase down all these traders and just be at the proper place at the proper time. In fact, we've actually seen this on uh, another hybrid map. I actually forgot the name, but... Uh, oh, it was Canal. It was the same thing. We've seen a lot of English, and oftentimes the response was Mongols and just going for the trade. Yeah, so we'll have to see how it plays out. One of the things to note about the way the trade is on this map, it's not necessarily one that you can push to separate corners. So, like, if, you, if you've ever watched Beastie play a map, oh, I'm trying to think of a map, like The Pit, as an example, what you'll see him do is he'll get the silver tree and he'll put it in the corner, and then he can trade to the north uh, neutral trading post, or he can trade to the south neutral trading post. The trouble with this map is, let's say he puts, in this case, Puppy Paw puts his silver tree in that west corner and he looks to trade down south, which I think is probably going to be the best option for him. It's going to give him a nice route, should be relatively defensible uh, and uh, you know quite shallow, and then it'll give him a good income. If that gets attacked, if that gets walled, if, that, if there's problems down there, he, he can shift them up towards the northern trading post. The problem's going to be it's nowhere near as lucrative as what that southern side is. And that's where the issue is on a map like this, because you don't really have those options. If, uh, I guess the alternative is that he could just throw a second market, maybe down in like the south corner, and then trade north to south that way rather than west to east. But we'll see what the plan is for him. It's definitely going to be trade, though. We know that much. Yeah, I think the thing I always dislike to a certain extent uh, about Mongols trading on a map like this is that, as you touched on that, the trading posts are very, very open. If you are using, let's say, Jean d'Arc to trade, you have potential to at least partially wall the map, make it a little bit more difficult for your opponent to challenge that trade. The challenge with the Mongols is that um, it's going to be a wide open map. Best thing that you can do is drop a bunch of towers, but that's a big investment. And if you don't do that, Marine Lord is still going to roam the map in a couple of units, and he's going to try to at least pick off a couple of traders every once in a while. And as oh, no. he's doing this, he's using the scout to block the foundation of the building, so Puppy Paw cannot deploy the Silver Tree close to the Ovu. This is not... that's not a good start right there. Uh, it, it always feels really, really bad whenever your opponent is doing that. I, I've played... oh no, 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 no. Stop that now, Marine Lord. Stop that, Marine Lord. We've talked about this. We've talked about this. It, it okay, needs he's to go the to distance, you. Marine Lord. We want oh, no, to go he's we not. the whole nine games. Oh, my Lord. That is the worst possible Silver Tree spot I've ever seen. Uh, at Can't this point, Puppy Paw is just bailing on that. He's saying, look, I need to deploy this because I need to start making traders. But he wasn't able to get double production going as a consequence. He does have double Keshik coming out, though. And that could be the saving grace for him. Because Marine Lord is just now dropping the barracks for a Spears. So... Um, Puppy Paw could actually retaliate for all that harassment. Keep in mind, he does have palings that are still in play, so we'll have a look and see whether that's going to be the case. But at this stage, two vills on gold for Marine Lord definitely indicates an intent to play Feudal Age, which is definitely the right call here. I guess the other option is he could look to try and go castle and get knights, uh, but it's always going to be dangerous against the Mongols. They have the ability to get a lot of units out quite quickly. Uh, and with no outpost on the gold, there's not going to be much chance of uh, securing that at this stage. Yeah, what I would love from Marine Lord is just going super heavy into longbows and spears. As old school as it gets, getting some walls back at home, something that he's doing to the north already, that kind of limits the movement of those Kashyyyk, and then just straight ahead march into the enemy base, because the Mongols will want to use their mobility over here. They don't want to take direct fights, they just want to drag out the game and leverage that trade. Marine Lord is already setting up some farms, so he's going to have a very consistent source of food. So if he starts building up mass spearmen with mass longbows, that might be tough for the Mongols to match. All right, well, we'll keep an eye on it because the longbow numbers are beginning to build here. Checking with Puppy Paw, though, he is looking to mass up archers, and this is one of my favorite things to do against the English. Whenever you're up against the English, one of the most common things you'll see them do is put down a barracks as soon as their council hall is finished, and they're going to start making spears and longbows. And you want to know what beats both of those units? archers. So if you make enough archers, you can just kill them both. The only thing you've got to be careful of, men at arms. So let's keep an eye out and see exactly what the plan is for Puppy Paw. But he's got some pretty effective counters to men at arms. He's got the Keshik uh, in the back pocket just in case. No, 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 no. Look at this. We've got the scout beginning to move. Oh, no. 
Marine this Lord cannot so happen again. You are so annoying, Marine Lord. Stop it. Let me trade. Why would you let me trade? I just want, I'm just a humble trader, sir. Look at this guy. And that's just like we're reading to a show how small differences make the mile. It feels <laughs> so innocent. It feels so elementary. But that is a market being blocked for so, so long. And this is causing a severe disruption in the economy of Poppy Paw. Okay, it looks Masters. like he managed to deploy it finally. Oh, and the scout goes down as well, which is a bit of an awkward spot for Marine Lord. Keep in mind, he could have gone 46 minutes into this game and never made a stable. He'll have to make one now if he wants to get that scout nah. out. Otherwise, he's going to have to make it from the town center and uh, and he's going to lose a villager by doing that. So, you know, you got you got to weigh it up, the you know? Yeah, but then it's one of those things where it's like, I could have made it uh, from the stable. It would have cost me a little bit more, but I would have had my villager instead and it would have paid off in three minutes. I think yeah, that's what but, it works out to be. It's, it's always yeah, just better to drop. If, drop if my grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike. So it is what it is. That, that is a great point. I hadn't considered that, Lytical. I'm, I'm still trying to see that metaphor, though. It's kind of like being a centaur, but like a modern age centaur. I look forward to the future. Uh, but speaking of the future, Marine Lord right now, he's... Yet to pick up any blacksmith upgrades. We don't see anything coming online from him just yet, but there's a fair bit of gold in the back pocket. Maybe all that wood that we were talking about that he would have spent on a stable if he wanted to, uh, and is instead going to be going for a blacksmith. We do see plus one range attack. Can we, can we go check in the base? I want to see where Marine Lord is making this, this scout from. It just came out. Where did it come out from? Quickly, go to the pink base. Go to the pink base. That's what's important right now. No, don't do it. It's too late. Oh, Litacor, somebody stop him. That's not enough longbows. <laughs> and the archers are always faster than the longbows are. They can actually chase him. This is a terrible fight for Marine Lord. All the spearmen gone. Kashyyyk is going to absorb a lot of damage. And the archers will just chase the longbows. This is something that haunts English so, so much. You move out with an insufficient army. There is just no chance of retreating intact. This is not looking good right now for Marine Lord. Fortunately, he does have that extra attack speed that will allow him to leverage the power of the English longbow into the center of the map. Needs to extend this network up a little bit further. Plus one ranged armor is through for Puppy Paw. The attack's coming through on the side of Marine Lord to cancel it out. Still no armor coming through just yet for Marine Lord, at least not yet, because it, we can't see it yet. But uh, yes, expect it soon, though. Looks like Marine Lord gets away with some of his troops, so he is still going to be all right here to a certain extent. He's heading towards a neutral market. Um, I guess partially because of all that the disruption when it comes to setting up the silver tree, it's not like he's going to find much over here because guess what? Puppy Paw barely has any traders. In fact, Eco is neck and neck and you only had uh, two Eco killed apparently by Marine Lord. So that just goes to show how little trade Puppy Paw was able to establish. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because at this stage of the game, as a Mongol player, you're probably wanting at least, you know, five, six traders at the very minimum. On the, on the higher end, you know, 10 plus would be lovely. Um, and you got to remember that uh, for the English, pushing out of their base is difficult, so they want to try and secure these outposts. Uh, and we do see, I think Marine Lord is going to be looking to try and secure it, but uh, the number here uh, is definitely not in favor of Puppy Paw, even though it might be slightly higher. You're going to need a lot more archers uh, than just, you know, two or three more or five more in this case. Uh, it, it definitely feels like when you're fighting up against the longbows, you really want to outnumber them by quite a fair bit. The other thing that you are looking at is having a the unit that closes distance very quickly, either horseman or even better Keshik. Because the whole point of the longbow versus archer micro is that the longbows can get a bunch of volleys out before the archers can close distance. And you can extend that by proper micro of the longbows. But when you have something like Keshik chasing them, suddenly it gets a lot more difficult to just fire volley after volley with the longbows. Um, you either focus down the Kashyyyk, in which case the archers catch up, or you're just going to stand and fight. So I think one of the ingredients missing here for Puppy Paw is some sort of a unit that can contest the position of those longbows, like a Kashyyyk. He's got exactly one Kashyyyk on the field right now. And I, I think this is where it comes back to trade, right? Because the more traders you have, oh, yeah. the more gold income you've got, and the more gold income you've got, the more gold you can spend on Kashyyyks. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if I, if I don't have this, it's going to feel really bad. 
Uh, but we do indeed see him setting up uh, the outpost over towards this side. So this is where it becomes like a really nice opportunity to throw down that market in the south corner and then start trading north to south rather than east to west. And he should. This is where the lack of mobility for the English comes into play. Everything that Marine Lord has is to the south. So what you do is uh, swing to the north with your traders. Marine Lord is only going to have a tower nearby once he leaves this position. So you can kind of play this cat and mouse game. It's not going to be as effective for Papipo as the other market would be, but at this point, this is just a matter of getting anything going for that silver tree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, well, the numbers continue to build here. It's still pretty even Stevens here. A slight villager advantage in favor of Puppypaw. Slight military advantage in favor of Puppypaw. Uh, but that's to be expected when you've got cheaper units than what the English have got. The one thing to note is that the men at arm numbers are starting to build, and they're building at the perfect time. So between 30 and 40 uh, longbows is when you want to start adding men at arms, typically. Anything less than that, and uh, you won't have enough longbows. Anything more than that, and you're waiting too long. Uh, and what these men at arms are going to do is they're going to break the stalemate, typically when you've got these big archer masses. The one thing to note, though, is the Keshik number has not risen. We're still sitting on one Keshik, and that's a bit of a red flag for me because it means these men at arms are just going to have the free reign, basically, over the archers. Now, you can kite them. You can be very effective at kiting them, especially with the Mongols, with all your different ways to buff up your attack speed. Obviously not a whole lot in the Feudal Age uh, without that Yam network, but you do have the Mongol Khan... Uh, to also help out. But yeah, no. as you kind of highlighted, they are just going to be absorbing the damage, and there is no unit for Puppy that can actually absorb the damage. Khan gets picked off immediately as the battle begins. Yeah, look at the longbow defense coming through here. 42 longbows up against 44 archers on the side of Puppy Paw. Not to, not to mention the men at arms, which are going to be tanking up. Look at how much damage these guys are tanking up. Able to tank up two whole volleys there. And every time you get a volley off on the men at arms, uh, a, a second goes past. Uh, but also, you know, you lose an archer because the longbows hit you. Um, so that is something to be very aware of. But that sneaky little trade is happening towards that west corner. Not very effective trade. So I'm sure Marine Lord doesn't really mind that much. But the villager is going to get picked off. And he's going to start pushing through towards this outpost. Lidicor. I don't know if Puppy Paw is going to be able to hold this position. The archer number has started to fall. The men at arms together as well. Distinct lack of Keshiks out on the field at the moment. I'm starting to worry. I'm really starting to worry. Oh, villagers getting caught in a crossfire as well. And this is exactly why you're mixing those men at arms. They're not there to dish out the punishment. They are there to absorb the damage. Puppy Paw is just now starting to focus down the enemy longbows. He's been losing villagers and archers left and right because he was busy dealing with all these men at arms. The cost efficiency of these fights have been impressive for Marine Lord. Um, men at arms, for sure, are pricey, but when you keep losing archers because you're focusing the men at arms, it's got to be more than satisfactory for the English player. Yeah, that's definitely the case, yeah. I think together with... with I, I don't know, man. I'm a little bit curious about Mongols on this map. I mean, it, I, I get it. It's just that when it comes to trade like this, it, it, it genuinely feels like, yeah, I just shut down the bottom trade, and if you trade to the top, I don't care. I, mean, I think just in general, though, Marine Lord's just played this matchup very well. I find it interesting that he's just going mass longbows now at this stage. Like, what do you, what do you even do in this situation? He's even mixing in some spears, just aware that, hey, you know, maybe Ke maybe Keshik's are going to be a problem. All right, well, Keshik's not going to be too much of a problem uh, as the, the longbows are able to two-shot them out. Look at the number advantage he's got here. This is going to be a really, really difficult defense here for Puppy Paw. He is outnumbered. He is outgunned. He is outranged. He is outdamaged. There is absolutely nothing he can do in this situation other than just hope that Keshix somehow find their way onto this field. He's got three in queue, and he's going to need a lot more than that if he wants to be able to take these down. I think it might be a good idea to actually get some villagers onto gold. At the moment, he's got 34 vills on wood. Let's maybe just chuck a couple of vills over onto gold and just help out a little bit there. What do you reckon, Litter? Uh, yeah, he kind of needs it. I think he needs to build a critical mass to fight this. If, if he's got a decent amount of Keshik, he can take a good fight. But one thing I want to touch on real quickly while we have a bit of a down moment is the hunt to the south. A pack of deer and a boar available there, but it is outside the vision range of Puppy Paul. Vodka actually has shown that to us some time ago. Um, he's just now found this. You see he's moving in this direction. But before that, the only reasonable food source that he could have taken was on the front. That's why he's so desperate fighting for this position. Yeah, you can see he's really committing to it. And 
it almost feels like it might be the case that he, he's stayed too long here. He's lost too much. Because look at the number difference now. You got 49 longbows coming out, 25 for Puppy Paw. I think this might be it. He is just well and truly over his head. Now, keep in mind, this is match point right now. His Puppy Paw throws in the towel. That's it. There's no more games. There's no more playing around. Marine Lord will be crowned your champion. But it's only a matter of time until these archer numbers continue to fall. He's down to eight archers here, holding on for dear life. The catcher comes out, but that is going to be it. Ladies and gentlemen, Marine Lord does it in game number eight, taking the EGC Elite Classic number two grand final, five points to three. It looked grim at times for Marine Lord. It looked surprising at times when you looked at the scoreline. But after all, Marine Lord, one of the most accomplished AoE4 players ever, secures another championship. He won four games in a row here as Papi Paw started to run out of juice. This one, a fairly decisive game here, English against the Mongols. But, you know, Ozzy, you look back at this um, whole series, even with this defeat, Papi Paw needs to look back and say, yeah, I've taken the next step. He has gotten into the grand finals and he wasn't swept by Marine Lord. He was actually more than competitive and delivered one of the most entertaining grand finals that we've seen in recent memory. Yeah, this was an incredibly entertaining grand finals. We we got to witness some really solid games here. Games that I don't think we expected to go the way that they did. Like here, here is an example. We got to witness Marine Lord just take complete control there was a, a real distinct difference in the amount of longbows versus archers, and that's not something that we often see. So, I mean, just really miraculously played. And I think at the end of the day, this probably could have gone either way. Uh, so it, it was a lot closer than many people expected, my, myself included. But, you know, what a better way to finish a series than uh, hearing from the champion himself. So Killer Pigeon is standing by to give us a winner's interview well, with champion Marine Lord. Cal calm down, Lytical. You're getting ahead of yourselves here. I, I, I'm not going to relieve you of duties yet, boys. We've got we've to gotta dissect this series because you know a lot of crazy things actually happened here. Um, we have to draw this back to the redraft. I think if we had to choose one thing, and you know what, like Drongo, Drongo is so like off. He already went to look after the kid. You baited him, Lytical. Um, but no, let's, let's talk about this bit because it's quite interesting, actually. That redraft... Up to that point, Puppy Paw looked like he was actually going to turn this into a humongous upset. But something seemed to happen in that break, in that reset. It's almost like the, the downtime hurt Puppy Paw. We've seen this before in tournaments, right? Where like there's a, there's a calming moment when you're gaining momentum. The best thing that can happen when you've got your back up against the wall is just a few extra minutes to breathe. And I think what we saw here was Marine Lord just taking a, a different approach. Because I'd say something that consistently kept happening throughout all these games, Puppy Paw, is that all in you talked about that Puppy Paw needed to calm down from, he continued to double down on after that double landmark victory game. Yeah, I, I feel like looking back into the series, we shouldn't forget the fact that Marine Lord opted to play Puppy's home maps first. So mm. he took out the maps that he was a little less comfortable with. And I think one thing that we also need to highlight is the length of this series. Uh, Marine Lord is used to playing all these long best of nines. Puppy Paw, maybe not so much. And, uh, you know, you definitely felt like um, there was a lot of lost momentum for Puppy Paw. I think some of that was just Marine Lord um, figuring out the style that Puppy Paw is playing in this series and finding the proper answers. But I think some of that was also Puppy Paw maybe being a little less sharp than usual and ultimately that fatigue might have actually contributed to this uh, comeback from Marine Lord. And it almost felt like Drongo, Marine Lord, after that, that redraft, he'd ID'd what he was up against, right? We mentioned it in that game five, that Byzantine versus HRE game. It almost just looked trivial. It's like Marine Lord was being bothered by, by a fly at that point. It's like, oh no, an outpost rush. I'm not going to let this throw me off. Then we go into game six and it kind of felt like we had Puppy Paw dialing it back to the extreme, right? He went from absolute aggressor to absolute turtle lord and from there on out it almost seemed like marine lord just took this kind of dictatorial control of the flow of the games yeah that was very much the case and i, I think that's another game where it really could have gone either way it, you know it, just a, a slight little decision here or there you know it, as an example if the the uh, great wall gatehouse was just on the farms instead of over on the gold it could have been completely different there but um yeah he, he controlled the tempo throughout the games and it felt like we had Puppy Paw playing a little bit more defensive after those games. Definitely not as, as aggressive as what he demonstrated on, as an example, that Coastal Cliffs game. 
Um, but uh, yeah, o- overall, Marine Lord just comes out of it. I think a, a couple of factors, obviously, he's been around this in the scene for such a long time, not just AOE4, but competitively. So when it comes to these longer drawn out series, you're talking about hours that these guys are playing for. So it takes a lot of resilience to get through it. So he's got that when it comes to an advantage of a puppy paw. Uh, but I guess also the fact that he's just been here before. So it's probably going to be an element of nerves that are in play here. And I'm sure we'll talk to him a bit later and find out. But I reckon uh, he was probably cool, calm and collected even when he's getting outpost rushed by the HRE. Well, it looks like Lytical has already chosen his allegiance now that we've got a one true king. Um, Drongo, you go find, I don't know, either a baguette or uh, maybe a, a beret. And I am going to get ready to hop into an interview uh, with our new champion of the League Classic, the one only Marine Lord. Are you there? Hello, hello. Yeah. You see me? Yep. I, I think we're about to see you. Here we go. Look, look at this, guys. Upgraded production. We've got our champ. Congrats, yeah. Milad. He's a new I'm... team. <laughs> hey, the, you wear the pink well, all right? And you know what? I love that you still got that flag in the background. Mine's hidden behind the giant Surfshark advertising. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, but you know what? You were looking pretty in this series. Let, let, let's first of all dive into this series a little bit. I think it's, it's good to kind of get the, the feel for the early games because I think... We'll get to the later games where you were looking out of control, but we have to start off at the beginning of the series where it was a little bit close at first, but then Puppy Paw in game three and game four started to edge ahead, right? Like he started to build this kind of lead with the landmark snipes, you know. At, at that point, what was your thought process getting ready for the redraft? I mean, I was trying to gather some energy mm-hmm. and I didn't like my first draft that much, but the second one, it will be a, a normal one because there was no weird map left. So I was pretty confident. But still, like, even if I lose this game, let's say, then I have Malians against Otomo or Abbasid this game. That's going to be pretty hard. So, second draft was okay. I think my first draft was not good. But of all, the... I just tried to gather energy and uh, eat some stuff and try to keep playing well. Because I, I was feeling like I didn't play my best, like the third and fourth game. Mm-hmm. And I think his level will go down this time. And I... I believe that I will be fine, like I will just uh, keep playing the same level or a little bit better. And if I fix a few mistakes, uh, it will be fine. Especially because like I tried to draft some uh, easier sieve for the second part. So I will make less mistakes. And uh, obviously I had some harder, harder sieve in the second draft. So when you are exhausted, this kind of stuff matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like it almost felt like you found the rhythm, right, in that second draft yeah. and also the play style. Because I think the, the, it would be fair to say the, the first four games, I'd say Puppy Paw was very aggressive, but it's almost like you took that away from him in the, the second draft. Do you, do you kind of attribute that to just the draft or you just being a little bit quicker than him in those early mid-game engagements? I mean, we had Byzantine against HRE, so I should have the back control, so I should be aggressive. Then we had... Uh, Jean versus China. Yeah, Jean China. So I should be aggressive too. But this one was weird, right? Like, it was crazy weird. <laughs> yeah. And when I saw the wall, part, I was like, hmm, sorry? I, I was just saying, my favorite part is when he walled you off. And it's like, oh, great. Now I get to trade longer. Yeah. When I saw second TC plus this wall off, I was like, maybe I can just make units and hold it. And then it's even better, right? Mm-hmm. But obviously on the, on the long run, uh, it will die. But my plan was not to keep it alive. It was just pretty much a, a bait. I just wanted him to force uh, in, him into me. And okay. that kind of worked. Now, we go into game seven, and it's caused all you forcing it there. The Delhi Japanese matchup. I, yeah. I don't know how you feel about this. I've been feeling <laughs> like this is more of a, a 50-50. I've seen it go either way. Do you think it's more of a skill-based matchup, or do you still quite like the Delhi? No, I think it's a civ win for Delhi. I think it's too hard. Like, if he plays normally, like 1TT Fast Castle, mm-hmm. if he pl- play decently, I should uh, kill him. Actually, he had a very good uh, gold spawn, so maybe in this case he could have done it, but it's still pretty hard, I think, because like no matter what, what he makes, as Delhi, I can just counter it as uh, H2, so I don't really have to age up, and then I just have to deny his, uh, his food, and I'm good to go. So now I think it's a save win for like the top, top uh, level. Now, that, that final game, English versus Mongols, in a lot of people's eyes, it's kind yeah. of the, the trash bag right now, right? Mongols just got nerfed, looking terrible <laughs> in playoffs. English overall in the tournament, the worst performing Civ, lowest win rate. I feel like every time I ask you this question about the English, you just say skill diff. Do you still rate the English highly or do you no. think that this is pretty weak? I think it's just based off the drafts. So he had Ottoman, Abbasid, and Mongol left. And on gauche, 
Mongol is not a great pick because trade is not good there. So I was like, okay, English and Mongol is fine. Abbasid is obviously always bad for... Uh, I mean, English always win against Abbasid. It's one of the hardest matchups in the game, I think. And Ottoman, it's the same. Like, uh, it's a fine one. So I was like, before in the series, I was a little bit worried between uh, French and English, having it as a last sieve, because I, I felt like they could both be a very bad matchup. But the more we played, the more I was like, okay, English now is going to be good. So I had English left and then Malians. And uh, yeah, that was good matchups. I liked it. Was there any kind of big surprises for you in terms of, of sieves um, in this tournament? Like, for example, Malians, they didn't win a single time uh, in the playoffs here? I think Malians, the problem is that they have too many bad matchups. So they are like very strong, but they have a few bad ones. Ottoman is still pretty hard for Malians. Mongol is hard. What else? Um, Jeanne d'Arc is fine, actually. I like Malians against Jeanne d'Arc. Russ is hard. China is hard. Byzantine is pretty hard. All the best sieve, right? Ayubids is actually not... I think it's Malian favorite, which is like, in my opinion, the only bad matchup for Ayubid. But yeah, I feel like Malians have too much, like, very good matchup or very bad. And that's kind of a big gamble. Was there uh, any big surprises in this tournament from a player perspective for you? I think a lot of people were kind of highlighting Louis, someone we've seen on the rise, doing phenomenal, making it the top four. Was there any other, like, big upsets or big um, surprises for you going deeper in this tournament? Mm, not really. Like, I was practicing a lot with Puppy and Lou for this tournament. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling like they were both pretty good, so I was not so surprised. And the same for yesterday, like, when I saw, like, um, Beastie and Lou practice this week, I was truly feeling like they, they had uh, a lower level than us. And I think the way we played the meta with Puppy, it was better on our side. Like we had a better read on it. I think they valued uh, Ottoman very high. And I don't think that's correct. Um, and yeah, overall, they had some weird picks, I think. I didn't really like uh, BC's draft most of the time. Especially like he, he values Delhi very highly. But I think Delhi have uh, a lot of bad matchups like Malians. So I don't think that's a very good pick first. I, I think we commented on this uh, yesterday as well like it kind of felt like one player was drafting for before the patch happened others mm. for afterwards right like your, yeah. yours and louis series had that kind of feeling to it same as um the beastie puppy pool one um it's kind of interesting i, I want to get your thought on that is you know we had a patch that seems quite insignificant to some people like at a glance mm. but it's quite significant to have this type of thing dropped on you literally before grand finals yeah it um, is how, how did you feel about this? Like, you know, did that knock your confidence? Did you think that this was going to be quite a unpredictable finals? I mean, I felt like I would win if there was no patch. And after the patch came, I was just worried about Ottoman because obviously they are nerfed enough that they are not banned. And since you don't ban Ottoman, you change pretty much the whole draft, right? Because you don't have a sieve that you had before. So, and then you have obviously a new Ottoman in the game. So they have like, let's say before the patch, against Mongol, I think it was a sieve win. And no, I don't really see, like, I think Ottoman is just too slow. So against Seeds like Mongol, I don't think you can really win. So stuff like that, you know, it's, it was just pretty hard to predict uh, where they will land. And actually, I'm just good with them on water, and I would expect them to be played on water. So I was not too worried about this one. Okay. And then the other one, I guess, would be Byzantines, right? Biz yeah. Yeah, Biz was already pretty good. And now it's, uh, I mean, they pretty much added a new cheese to it, right? Like, you have the Fast Castle, and then you can... Uh, upgrade your unit very fast. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit too strong. I wish they would have buffed something else, but this one is pretty bad, I think. Yeah, it, it's definitely kind of wild. I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. seeing like maybe um, what we'll get a little bit further down the line, a little bit of Bream Room. But you know what? Uh, let, let's talk about a little bit why in the tournament. I think the big news coming in, of course, is your new team, Gentlemen, yeah. it's picking you up. Um, how did that come about? Like, talk talk me through. You know how someone, how a champ like you gets signed to such a big org. I mean, I was not expecting it. Like it's a uh happened like one month ago so Gotaga is my friend since a while like I know him since like uh, 2013 I think and he was in the same team as me Millennium back in the day and he is like one of the CEO of the org obviously so he knows I'm winning a lot and they just want to pick up players that wins so even if I'm not in the biggest esports I think they are pretty happy about the result and honestly like uh, I don't think he was expecting that many viewers for this game so even for that I think they are pretty happy and I think they are picking me in a, in a good time. Like last year, it was a pretty bad year for me. I mean, it was not bad, right? It was not bad, but it was not perfect. But by, by your standards, Marine Lord, it yeah. was bad. By most yeah. players' standards, it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but 2022, obviously, I won pretty much everything. Yep. So losing twice in 2023 was pretty bad. So yeah, obviously, like the goal this year will be like to win pretty much everything. That's a dream. But 
I'm realistic, right? It's eSport and I know like one bad day and you are just losing the tournament. So the goal is pretty much to win like my real goal, I think, is to win every event except one. I'm like, yeah, let's put one where I can uh, allow myself for some mistakes, you know, I can't be the best all the time. But overall, like my, my, uh, my goal is to win pretty much everything this year. I mean, that, that, that's the pro player mentality, right? You've got to believe mm. that you can always win everything. Um, yeah. Be fair to say, maybe the playing field's getting a little bit tougher, right? We've got some new faces coming yeah. in. I, I feel like the tournament play we saw here is probably the best Age of Empires 4 we've seen out of a lot of these players yeah. since the game's release. Yeah, Puppy, Worm, and Lou, they're all getting better. Um, they're all practicing a lot, especially Lou, right? This guy practices so much. Uh, I feel like Vortex and Lucifron didn't play as best as they usually do because of uh, maybe Stormgate, I guess. So maybe like in the next tournament, they will be even better, you know, and then they will be on the same level as everyone else. But uh, yeah, I, I agree, like, Wham, Puppy and Lou played better than usually. I, I think it's promising uh, to see. And, and mm -hmm. how do you feel about like this drafting format? Like, you know, I, I saw a lot of positive perception with this whole idea of the redraft yeah. midway through, um, the target bans. Do you think like this is maybe the best format we've had? Yeah, I think that's the best format we've had. I think you can do some so small change here and there, like just to make it different for every tournament. But uh, overall, it was yeah, a very good, good and skilled format, I think. Only like the first game, when you redraft or when you draft, yeah. the first game is a bit random because you really don't know what your opponent is going to pick. So then it's a bit, uh, a little bit of RNG. Like for example, the first game, Mongol Automa, I was like, yeah. I, I played this matchup in practice and I was like, yeah, it's just super hard nowadays with the nerf. So this one, I was pretty, feeling pretty bad about it. But then it was okay. I just uh, played well, eventually. So, um... With you saying general mates, you know, the numbers are pretty good. There yeah. seems to be a lot of support. Um, is the plan for them to watch your tournament games quite often moving forward? Yeah, they want to watch all the majors. So not like the small one, but yeah, when it's a major, they want to watch. Are we uh, going to see you in those small tournaments in the upcoming weeks? Or are you now yeah. going to take a break and relax? I mean, I'm not going to play as well. I'm not going to practice as much like the next two weeks. I'm going to take a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. But I'm still going to play like four hours a day at least, so... It's not like, I'm just going to keep my level. And then uh, in two weeks, I'm going to get back on the grind for the next tournament. All right, right. Marine Lord, I think, uh, I think you're needed on a certain gentleman's stream. I'm sure they want to talk to you. They want to yeah. cheer you on and congratulate you. Um, before we let you go, any words you want to say to all the fans, everyone watching? I mean, thanks for the support, right? Merci tout le monde pour le, le soutien. And thanks to my team, obviously, for picking me up. It's a, a very good opportunity for me, obviously. So I'm, I will make sure like, I represent them well. Yeah, no, I thank you for the entertaining games. Congratulations on the win. You are Elite Classic yeah. 2 champion, and I look forward to seeing you in the upcoming One events. and two. <laughs> One and two. Yeah. <laughs> oh, congrats, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. We're going to hop back across now with my, uh, my fellow casters to kind of dissect the end of the show. Um, boys... You know, confident as ever, smile on his face. I, I don't know. I, I felt like there was that that chipperness to Marine Lord. Like you know, sometimes we just see him win. It's kind of like yeah, part of the process. I don't know if it's the new team. I don't know if it's the um, the momentum of this win. But the boy seems rejuvenated. He definitely did seem uh, pretty pretty happy, pretty chipper right there. Uh, I suspect that you know, coming into it, he he thought it'd be it'd be okay, but uh, I reckon he got a pretty pretty. Support. Pretty big surprise right there. That, uh, yeah, I think he's happy that he managed to pull this one out. Mm -hmm. and, and you saw him being very honest, Lydical, about that opening phase draft and how things just completely changed in his favor. I mean, it, it seemed like, you know, I, I don't want to say we should have mid-series interviews, but I'm wondering how different the mindset would be if you could talk to Marine Lord after game four and then at the end of the series. Oh, yeah, I, I feel like that's always the case, right? Um, you ask a player in the middle of the series when they're losing, they're going to tell you very different things from what they will tell you when they end up winning the whole thing. But that's just the way it is in pro gaming. And, uh, you know, I think one thing is sure. Poppy Paul definitely made Marine Lord run for his money. And this is impressive when you consider how dominant Marine Lord was in this tournament. Uh, people often forget that... Uh, Marine Lord barely lost any games in the group stage. He went 17 and 4 in the group stage, went directly into the semifinals as a consequence, won 4 0 against Louis Empty there. It's difficult to take away even a single game from Marine Lord, let alone three. So 
as much as Marine Lord is the champion of the tournament, I think uh, we really have to give a big shout out to Puppy Paw as well, because uh, this set was a lot more competitive than what many would have expected. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, Puppy Paw, he'll take on his chin, right, Drongo? We've seen the way he's willing to uh, learn, the way he's willing to evolve. I mean, this, this to me, I, I said at the start of the series, to me, Puppy Paw is the best he's been, and I think he'll only get better and better from this. Yeah, we're really seeing the rise of a whole new breed of gamers in Age of Empires 4 at the moment. Like, Puppy Paw is obviously leading the way, leading the charge, but we've seen Louis getting really good recently, Wham, in, in as well. I mean, both of the Canadians are just smashing it, so... It's uh, it, it's kind of wild how how good these guys are getting and how quickly they're getting. So it's it's great to see the progress, and I'm really excited to see where Puppy Paw goes for the rest of this year. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we had him back in the hot seat again in the grand finals because uh, that was an impressive performance, managing to take that many games off Marine Lord. Well done. Yeah, I think so. I think maybe Marine Lord needs to step over and let someone else just start winning uh, consistently. Lytical, if it gets us more big orgs like General Mates in the scene, I'm all for it. I mean, you know, I think that's what hot on people's mind right now is like Marine Lord, absolute Chad, gets signed to one of the biggest French orgs that exists. Question is, is this the beginning, right? Is it going to happen? Because I feel like we we had this before when Team Liquid stepped in with Dumu, and then we kind of had a big question mark, no one entering. You know, do, do you think this could maybe be the the rise of esports orgs in AOE four? I hope so. I don't have a yes or no to this. I just have an I hope so. And I think one of the cool things to look out for in the future would be team game events. Because right now you look at these two players, uh, Dimu with Team Liquid, uh, Marine Lord with Gentle Mates. These are individual players being picked up by teams. But I think one of the cool things in the future, especially if we indeed see um, such an expansion of esports teams into AOE 4, would be picking up multiple players. Like, talk about the Spanish brothers, the Canadian brothers, potentially. And having these uh, teams compete in team game tournaments, I think that's actually a very intriguing potential future. And I'm definitely hoping that we're going to see something like that in the foreseeable future. Um, creative different formats. I mean, we love our 1v1s, but you know how I felt for a long time. I love the idea of, of team events. Um, Drongo, I'm just going to, you know, th there might be a different form of event that maybe you should be organizing sometime about now. Uh... Soon. <laughs> Soon. Ooh, it, it's not a no, and that makes me happy. No, I, I think that the beautiful thing, actually, is, is the idea that also, just in the 1v1 format, with this change, with the redraft, it's genuinely changed the feeling of the game so much, right, Drongo? It used to feel like we get halfway through a grand finals, and we just talk about how it was an outdraft, and there was no coming back. This is so much more refreshing to witness. Yeah, I, I yeah, think diversity was, uh... of civilizations is also a big thing here, KP. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when a game launched, we had eight civilizations. Uh, the amount of matchups were somewhat limited. Yeah. Uh, now, every single game you go into has an identity simply because of the diversity of all these civilization matchups. Well, most definitely. I, I, it's interesting as well that we're at a point now where we don't actually have to think, oh, if you if you limit the, uh, the situation that you can't have any mirrors, you have copious amounts of redraft we get some creative approach um if you're wondering like why we're hanging around here like i've just got confirmation we're working on getting an interview with puppy paw um so it'll be interesting to get his perspective as well um i think that interview is in fact ready so you know what we're going to go ahead and we are going to hop on in for an interview uh with puppy paw our second place elite classic two player Hey, man. Uh, first of all, commiserations. You put up a phenomenal fight. Um, I know you will want to have that first place. I know every player just yearns for it. But second place and actually have a Marine Lord on the ropes at points must be feeling pretty good. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm not 100% happy with how I played, but I think overall it was a relatively good performance, even if I would have wanted to win. No, of course. Um, how how did you feel about this series? Like, you know, if you don't mind kind of breaking it down from maybe first draft to second draft, because I think first draft, that must have been the, the morale high, right? Game three, game four especially. Um, you were running Marine Lord through. Uh, what, what was your mentality at that stage in the series? So, yeah, after the first draft, I obviously I was feeling pretty good being ahead. Um, and yeah, my second draft was just not so good. I, I don't know exactly what happens, um, but it's it's difficult sometimes because if you don't account for one sieve, you're in a situation where um, 
you don't really have like a good sieve and that kind of happened to me a few times though and especially in rocky canyon i i probably should have picked mongos mongos can do okay against delhi but uh i had some success with japan against some delhi players so i i thought i'd give it a shot and yeah there's a few games there that just didn't go very well even if i had like an idea behind it not, to your credit, I mean, that, that Japanese deli game, I, I was tuning your horn for it because I think you've been um, the most impressive player with Yumi Japanese, hands down. So, you know, like, obviously, it doesn't get you the win there, but, you know, I think looking away from just a game-to-game -game perspective, I've been tuning the horn that I think that this is the best puppy pool we've seen so far. You know, loss, wins aside, are you feeling that as well? Do you feel like you're at your best you've been so far? Yeah, I think so. I think I am at the best I've been. Like, there's there's been other times where I would practice a lot, um, and I obviously I practice for this a lot as well. But I think I actually was able to perform to the to the point I wanted to. Sometimes that you can practice a ton, but you can't actually play to the level you want to. And, and from a practicing perspective, you know, we heard from Rain Lord that you were practicing with him a lot, um, and he was practicing with Louis a lot. People that he's going to go up against, you know, did did you feel like that was an advantage or a disadvantage? Because we usually hear this idea of like secret strategies all the time. Did, did that matter against, to you? Against in the finals? Lord? Yeah, uh, in no, scrims. I would say, yeah. yeah, I would say it was probably a disadvantage. Okay. But, you know, like, I think he has a better idea of like how I'm going to play. And obviously, like, I think on average, he is pro like, you know, Let's be honest, he's probably the better player, so it's kind of easier for him to predict like what I'm going to be doing in these series, so it's kind of fair, obviously difficult to catch him off guard. It, it's a tough one, right? Like, you know, we, we've seen Marine Lord, he's been on these kind of dominant streaks. Um, I, I, I genuinely just like, I want to give you absolute praise, because I think the fact that you took that many games from him, when we see Marine Lord just kind of on a dominant streak time and time again, it, it does speak credence to you as a player and how you've been improving. Um, you know, what, what's on the horizon for you now? Obviously, you know, big tournament, League Classic 2, a lot of games have been played over the last few weeks. Is this, you know, relax a little bit, kind of reset, or is it grind, grind, grind? Uh, actually, I watched the Moon World interview a bit, and I, I would have to just kind of say I'm probably going to do what he's going to do. I'm going to play just a bit. Um, and there's a few events coming up, so that'll be fun to just kind of play those and not play as much, but still, you know, enjoy uh, competing. I think that's healthy, man. Uh, I, th I think we we've we heard that from Beastie last year as well, right? In one of his interviews, he was like, "Actually, playing the game less kind of helped me more because it just it it didn't feel like a chore and it kind of gave a refreshing outlook." Um, one thing that I think you know, I don't know if you noticed it yet, it should be refreshing to hear. I feel like I've seen a lot more people hyping you up in the chat. I feel like you know, regardless of the outcome, you've made a lot more fans um, after this performance today. Is there anything you want to say to them now? Uh, well, obviously, like, I, I'm glad to have anyone that supports me and cheers me on. Um, I hope I can keep doing well uh, to the level that I want to be doing. Because uh, I, I do think going into this tournament, I would have been probably disappointed if I lost to Vortex. Or, I mean, even if I lost to Beastie, I mean, I, I think I, I have a good chance against pretty much anyone outside maybe Marine Vortex. Even then, I can win. But, yeah. So, um, it's great to see people, um you know, see that and, and cheer me on. Hey, man, I, I'm, I'm glad we get to see some new faces up on the podium. Obviously, you've always been the running, but like getting this deep, I, you know, I've got a feeling it's the beginning of big things for you, puppy boy. So chin up, you know, like a future champion, you're taking your stride and you keep on marching. Um, commiserations once again. Enjoy the reset. And I look forward to seeing you, as many people do, in the next EGC tournament. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, buddy. Oh, you know, like, Dongo, no, dude, I was on the verge of tears interviewing Poppy Paw, and now that adorableness is going to bring tears to my eyes. Come on. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I think so, that's his sorry. analysis of that series. <laughs> oh. I'm going to try and speak, but it, I don't think he likes it, so you're, gonna, you're not going to hear many words from me. That makes this all the more wholesome, to be honest with you. Um, you know, a, a heartwarming moment there. Um, another kind of additional thing we've added in is the, um, well, we call them loser interviews. I don't, I don't like that term. We need to come up with a better one. Because, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that we, we could see he was feeling a bit deflated there, Lidacore. But honestly, I, I know that as a player why he feels deflated. 
I think everyone is in agreement that he doesn't have a reason to truly feel deflated, though. You know, like he, he even said it low key. He feels like even against Marine Lord on the right day, he could take the series. I, I think it's, it's a matter of uh, what your heart tells you and what your mind tells you. Everybody in their right mind knows that he has nothing to be disappointed about. This is by a mile his best tournament accomplishment, and he is definitely on an upwards trend. So, really, he's got nothing to be disappointed about. At the same time, especially after leading three to one, you look back at that set and you you understand why he's a little heartbroken potentially. Um, so you can understand it uh, both ways. At the end of the day, um, that's just the way it is. You lose something, you're going to be upset no matter who you are. And uh, we often forget that many of these, pro well, all of these pro players are very much human beings, and they do go through a lot of uh, challenging moments as well. I think this is going to be still. At the end of the day, a great experience for Puppy Paul. Um, definitely an impressive tournament from him. And I think he's also going to learn a lot from this defeat over here. Really, um, he matched up against one of the greats of AoE4 on the biggest stage. He was competitive. Uh, he fell a little short. He's going to come back stronger. I think that, you know, with a little bit of time to think about it as well, Drongo, he'll probably think, oh, the, the fact that it deflated me this much is in a way a good thing. It sounds weird to say, but right, like, you, you know when you get in a series and you get stomped, Complete 5-0, and you're like, after it's like, yeah, I just wasn't there on the day. I feel like, you know, as a player, if you get hit that deep, you realize, wait, I, th I think, I believe I can win this, right? And I, I think that shows that we're only seeing the beginning of a puppy pool emerging. I, I got to agree. And I, I think 100% we could have seen him be victorious today. Just a couple of small little things. Uh, and I reckon it could have been completely different. Hey, mate. Hi. <laughs> it could have been uh, yeah com completely different but yeah uh, look I i'm incredibly excited for the future of puppy paw we've obviously seen him be pretty successful here today hopefully he can convert next time hopefully <laughs> guys this is why we seek sponsors like surfshark so we can eventually afford to pay drongo enough so he can go get shark <laughs> for moments like this <laughs> oh but you know what boys um uh, absolute credit to you guys. You you done that series so much justice. I mean, I, I agree. I think Puppy Paw, you know, the pu stories of Puppy Paw, Louis MT as well. What I love, we mentioned at the start of the day, all around the world, I feel like people getting people to cheer for. And that's exactly what we want to see. Um, that plus Drongo's baby just completely ruining his day. <laughs> but you know what, guys? I, I think I, I want to get your final thoughts. One very big surprise for you in this tournament. I'm going to shoot across to Lydical first. Uh, I would say, I don't want to say this phrase because it's not really applicative anymore, but it's the quote-unquote good, not great players. We've seen a lot of players who've been there at the bottom of top eight, uh, middle, lower parts of top 16. Talk about the Canadian brothers who had their moments. Um, Louis MT as well. They didn't just show up. They didn't play that usual level that they did. They actually advanced a lot. So we had a lot of these players who were always competing, never really getting to the very end and uh, pushing the strongest opponents to their limits. Now you look at Louis MT, he makes it into the semifinals. You look at Puppy Paw, Grand Finals. Um, Wham himself, he actually lost to Louis MT, but he went into the top six over there. Um, so a lot of these players uh, that haven't really found a lot of success in the later stages of tournaments have actually made it all the way to the end. And I think... Uh, this just makes this whole scene a lot more competitive. To me, that's the big takeaway of Elite Classic. And it's actually in a very nice synergy with the actual format of this event. Everybody playing everyone within their respective groups. It's uh, all about showing what you can do on a large sample size. And we've seen that from a lot of players. Um, we've seen a lot of these players being able to push Elite players to their limits as well. And I think... Um, the scene is more competitive than it has ever been. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, Drongo kind of, it shows, right? Like someone's making a comment like Group A, top Group A, like Group A Grand Final. Seems like Group A may have been a, a little bit overstacked. But overall, we have seen a, a bunch of fresh faces, some people taking some games from some unexpected um, all-time greats. Uh, is there a big surprise outside of what Lytical highlighted there for you? Not really, no. I think that was the big one. Yeah. It was just, for me... <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, the big, the big one for me is Louis MT, right? Like, in my in my mind, Louis MT has gone from being, uh, you know, just just as Ludacore has said, like the good player, 
to the great player. We, we are seeing that now with a whole bunch of, of players. I think Puppy Paw is almost cementing. <laughs> All right, you go play, man. Uh, Careful, that yeah. Red Bull fridge will be coming down in a sec. I can already predict Yeah, this. oh, mate. Tell you what, as long as it doesn't spin, we'll be okay. Uh, if it's spinning, <laughs> that's when we've got trouble. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that's 100% it, right? Like we have seen the good players really begin to improve. And we, we've seen this almost this distance between the two starting to thin out, right? Like you, I came into this expecting Beastie to be here today in the grand final. He wasn't. And that was because Puppy Paw was able to get there. Uh, I didn't expect to see Louis uh, in, in the third place match, but we saw him there. Uh, and that that's the that's the big thing for me. The skill difference between why do I have this? The skill difference between these two things, uh, the, these two levels is uh, is really starting to get get this toy out of here, man. I'm so tired. Look at this guy. Can you see him? I don't know if you can see him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can see him. <laughs> He's getting close to that rebel fridge. I think. What we'll do, <laughs> mate, is, is we'll let you uh, we'll get, let, get, let you have go uh, go and have some some child dad time. Um, boys, absolutely phenomenal cast. I, I relieve you of your duties. Uh, Drongo now gets to go on to the daddy duties that never end. Never, never do they end. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for being our host today, KP. It was uh, it, it was lovely, and I tell you what, it's so nice having a host. Uh, for for these events because back in the good old days it always just to be it always used to be just yourself and one other person and it was difficult right but having the host just gives you that extra little bit of breathing room and uh, and having someone professional like yourself makes it uh, very easy for both Litter and I so huge shout out to you and of course Litter thank you for the 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 uh, what is it our, our biannual cast uh, I'll see you in six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the one cast we do every half a year or so. It has been a pleasure as always. Of course, thank you so much, KP, for uh, leading the way through this show. It has been an absolutely impressive experience. We've, I think, witnessed one of the greatest grand finals of AOE4 history. And I'm sure there is a lot more to come. But it is time for us to say goodbye and leave you with KP for a bit of an outro. Thank you, thank you. That's right. Yeah, you just heard it correctly there. Possibly the greatest AOE 4 we've seen played so far. And I mentioned so far for good reason. Let's be totally real. We know that EGC TV will be back at an undisclosed time. Sorry, they won't give me that info. They don't trust me with it. Um, but it's why you need to make sure you're following this channel. It's why you need to make sure you follow them across on the Twitter. In fact, you can see them all below my name right there. You need to be following all these locations because you know that EGC is going to be back with one, two, three. I don't even know how many tournaments. Um, but before we close out the show, I need to thank all of you guys for tuning in. I need to thank the players for turning up and delivering some of the best AOE4 I think we might even see all year. That's how intensely competitive it's been. Shout out to all the people that have been subbing the channel. If you haven't got those primes in, for goodness sake, why have you not got those primes in? Get that money through so we can fund more tournaments. And make sure, for the love of God, you know I'm going to say it one more time. I've given you all the reasons in the world why you should be dropping $60 or $75 using the EGC TV code at checkout on Surfshark to make sure that you are protected online. And to also let... The sponsor, no. You know what? I see this sponsor. I like this sponsor here. I like this level of production coming out and the fact that Surfshark is willing to throw some money at EGC TV so they can get all these things included. Also, behind the scenes, big shout out to everyone. There's going to be too many people to name. Pesty, Tume come to mind. Uh, Cow, obviously, in there alongside Vodka, doing phenomenal work as a team behind the scenes. Big shout out to all the casters that were a part of this. They're what makes these tournaments so special. But you know what? What makes this channel... Even more special is the fact that they aren't just focused on them. I'm not just sitting here telling you about all the EGC action coming up next. I'm here to tell you about other AOE4 action on the horizon. We've got the War Chief Club on the 30th. We've then also got Beast of the Hill. That's Beastie's tournament. I believe it's going to be casting with Corin across on his channel on the 31st of March. So be sure to check those out. And then in early April, we're going to be getting into the Slapfest. Slapfest actually had its qualifier games going on today. So be sure to check out the VODs on Matisse's channel if you want some midweek entertainment. But... You know, that, that leaves us a little bit bare. You're like, whoa, KP, okay, what do I do for the second week, the third week, the fourth week, April? I haven't got answers to that right now. But how about this for a start? Make sure you're opening that directory. Make sure you're supporting all those streamers you see. Make sure you're watching those YouTube channels. I, I think, you know, with the arrival of games of this caliber in Elite Classic 2, the introduction of new orgs like Gentlemates into the ecosystem, 2024 is looking good. I know a lot of people had their doubts, their skepticism. There's more they want, but mark my words, folks. There's plenty more to come, but for now, it is time to bid farewell. It has been my absolute pleasure to guide you through the show. 
but now we come to a close. Marine Lord, for those just tuning in, is our Elite Classic 2. And as he reminded me, one champion. He doesn't want us to forget that. The question mark is, will we get an Elite Classic 3? Will he do it for the hat trick? All that to come, but you have to stay tuned in. Hopefully not too long, and I'll see you all soon. But for now, I must bid farewell.